two decades, Dr. Kumar has led integrated management planning for several wetlands in the South Asian region and coordinated multidisciplinary projects on wetland assessment, ecosystem services evaluation, water management, sustainable livelihoods, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. He is also a nominated member of the scientific and technical review panel of the Ramsar Convention, a coordinating lead author at the Intergovernmental Society for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services for Value Assessment and Asia Pacific Regional Assessment. He has been with the Wetlands International South Asia for nearly two decades. And since uh, almost a decade now, he is a conservation program manager. He is an economic a natural resource economist by training and has more than two decades of work experience on wetlands, especially on the aspect of integrated management, planning, ecosystem services, mainstreaming wetlands into development, etc. He is also a nominate, uh, nominated member of scientific and technical review panel of the Ramsar Convention, which we were discussing, uh, touched upon, just touched upon yesterday. So with this brief uh, introduction of the resource person today, uh, who is a well-known expert on the wetlands. Uh, uh, Dr. Ritesh, they are the participants of the two days online course uh, uh, on uh, conservation issues in India. And they are the esteemed faculty of uh, uh, universities and colleges and all the other higher education institutions in our country. And they are primarily dealing with uh, science related subjects uh, uh, in their uh, uh, field of expertise. Um, so with this brief introduction, you know that wetlands are very, very important, but they are one of the neglected ecosystems in uh, most of the countries. So to dwell upon the nuances of wetland management, uh, now I request Dr. Ritesh Kumar to kindly uh, deliver his session. Thank you. Over to you, Ritesh. Over to you, Ritesh. Over to you, Ritesh. Thank you, Dr. Agla. I'm trying to manage two devices, so I will need a bit of help whenever things start going out of my hand. But is my voice audible? Uh, your voice is too low. Is it is it clearer now? Ah, yeah, now it's clear. Okay. So, uh, good morning, all. Uh, thank you for uh, joining me in this uh, uh, pleasant winter morning in Delhi. It's pretty foggy outside, but the sun is coming out. So uh, the topic today, which uh, Dr. Abhilash has uh, asked me to discuss, is uh, about uh, wetlands management best practices. Uh, I'll try to give you an overview of uh, the as different aspects of wetlands management. But I've also tried to uh, give you a reflection on how management has shaped over the years and uh, uh, i am a social scientist by training but have also been working on ecological issues for the last two decades uh, my hope is that uh, after the end of this presentation i'll have some of you as uh, you know fellow um, uh, fellow scientists in uh, in taking up wetland issues from different dimensions uh, wetlands at end of the day are as much an ecological problem, ecological, you know, uh, ecological interface as much as a social uh, interface. So I'll try to give you a broad brush view of the challenges that we face. And, uh, uh, you know, and I'll invite you to join us uh, in, in this journey of uh, securing future of uh, wetlands. So let's begin by... Uh, seeing what wetlands are and this is a photograph uh, taken from uh, the borders of uh, Punjab and Himachal Pradesh which will give you an idea of what wetlands are and why they're different. Uh, in the backdrop you see beautiful mountains, in the middle you see uh, water but you also see you know standing plants. Now this is what uh, makes uh, wetlands unique. Uh, they're different from a plant which is dry and uh, here in the life is uh, controlled by water. So yet it is, uh, you know, it is not truly aquatic, unlike oceans, unlike groundwater. Uh, this is a living, uh, you know, ecotone at the interface of land and water. Wherever water and land meet, they will create a wetland. And uh, the key defining feature of these ecosystems is the ability of water 
to shape uh, you know the plant and animal life that survives in these ecosystems you can see them in diverse uh, you know forms in a landscape in the mountains there are lakes fed by glaciers there are reservoirs which are created by humans the rivers create their flood plains which are inundated only once in a while there are marshes which are dominated by plants there are swamps which are dominated by trees uh, estuaries uh, on the coast uh, there are oxbows so they are known in diverse forms and uh, as uh, you know you will also appreciate that wetlands need not always be wet uh, these are uh, certain uh, you know wetland types uh, such as lakes ha- are are predominantly water but river flood plains for example might be wet for not more than like 15 days in a year yet there are distinct uh, environment the water the presence of water for at least some time in a year is the defining feature and that water creates an ecosystem by itself uh, it uh, you know shapes the plant life uh, which is you know uh, indicated by the presence of plants which can withstand inundation which are typically called uh, hydrophytes so this is what gives us a very uh, diverse uh, ecosystem to handle and uh, much of our knowledge of uh, ecosystem management has shaped from either truly aquatic ecosystems or truly terrestrial ecosystems so this science uh, despite uh, you know being in existence for uh, more than 40 50 years i would say is still evolving we are still discovering how wetlands are how do they function how much of the country area is under wetlands so efforts are being made since 1970s it is also dependent on what do we consider as wetlands typically if we include um irrigated agriculture irrigated rice paddies under uh, you know wetlands definition which essentially they have characteristics uh, in uh, 1989 about 50 million hectares were uh, under wetlands in 2011 which is the most recent uh, estimate of wetlands and which excludes uh, you know rice paddies it indicates that uh, nearly 15.26 million hectares uh, of the country which is roughly 5% of the wetland area is under wetlands now we consider this to be an underestimate uh, yet this is a reasonable bottom uh, bottom line to consider yeah. uh, nearly 5% of the country's geographic area is is under wetlands and the science of wetland delineation is still evolving uh, their role uh, this is uh, you know uh, i can hardly over emphasize uh, you know several cities they draw their water from wetlands if you are in madhya pradesh or if you are living in delhi if you are living in chennai uh, the water that you are receiving in your taps is highly likely to be connected Uh, to to the wetlands uh, wetlands are also capable of filtering wastewater in fact uh, the city of kolkata uh, till very recently did not have a sewage treatment plant uh, the whole uh, of the sewage was initially dumped into river hogli and then uh, it went through a series of play it was diverted to a large wetland regime um, on its uh, east uh, when you just uh, land in calcutta uh, near salt lake and uh, when the water passes out the sewage passes out uh, through through these uh, wetlands um, it uh, helps uh, generate uh, uh, you know fish through aquaculture practices it supports uh, agriculture and by the time water moves out it is uh, pretty clean uh, by standards the dissolved oxygen levels improve uh, the microbes uh, microbial contamination reduces sedimentation is fairly treated nearly 600 million liters of city sewage um, per day is treated through these wetlands but these wetlands are also critical for maintaining flow regimes if you look at the rivers and uh, especially rivers which are fed by glaciers now glacial melt uh, needs to uh, settle in high altitude wetlands wherein you know like sponges the glacial flows are absorbed and gradually released and that is how you get the river base flows including ganges brahmaputra 10 largest rivers of asia originate in high altitude wetlands and their base flows are sustained by these there are also buffers when you look at floods and droughts embankments and regulators are modern you know creation but historically 
floodplains and oxbows have uh, you know uh, saved uh, settlements from uh, you know extremities of uh, uh, floods and droughts uh, wetlands also help recharge groundwater uh, it is estimated that nearly one third of utilizable water supply that we uh, that is there in groundwater is recharged from river floodplains and uh, you know uh, all your fish the rice fish ecosystem that we have in the floodplain regions these are all dependent on wetlands rice uh, and fish is so uh, you know a characteristic of uh, our our food system one cannot imagine you know these growing without wetlands especially the value of uh, wetlands as gene pools of fish and rice is is amazing this is something that we uh, do not uh, appreciate much there are also cradles for some unique uh, biodiversity uh, loktak lake in manipur is the last natural habitat for manipur swamp deer uh, chilika in odisha is one of the two lagoons in the world with resident iravati dolphin population uh the high altitude wetlands of ladakh are only known indian breeding site for black naked cranes and uh, when you look at flyway scale as we have the concept of highways when birds migrate from cold you know temperate region to warm uh, tropical regions they follow a path which is called flyway we uh, there are nearly 250 uh, migratory bird species that use the central asian flyway in which india is located and of these more than 75% use indian wetlands as the stop over site now this flyway concept actually tells you that it is not an individual wetland but the whole wetland across the ecological network that is important to help uh, you know um, uh, water birds to complete their life cycles and finally uh, you know before the coinage of sustainable development uh, the idea of sustainable development came in ramsar convention the first modern you know multilateral environment agreement uh, was signed in 1971 and uh, this photograph is an iconic photograph wherein uh, dr s a h mahdi who was then uh, inspector general forest he was signing on behalf of india i, I retrieved this photograph photograph of first meeting you can see in the front if you can recognize dr s uh, you know Uh, who is also credited with uh, you know conserving and protecting several you know high ornithological value wetlands uh, he's on the front line so this was the first meeting in 1971 so india also has a huge global footprint on uh, wetland conservation in terms of international policy but before we talk about 70s and 80s let us try to understand how were these systems managed now globally wetlands conservation has emerged as a biodiversity conservation issue because in europe uh, these wetlands uh, where uh, uh, you know where you had geese and several you know beautiful birds coming in and europeans and americans used to hunt around wetlands now suddenly as wetlands started disappearing the number of uh, you know water birds that were available in these wetlands started declining and there was a general concern so uh, overall the science developed and it was realized that unless we protect wetlands at a large scale it is not possible to maintain wetlands as gaming areas when i say gaming these are you know places where you can hunt so the idea of wetlands uh, uh, you know wetland conservation is primarily rooted in water birds conservation and that too not a conservation motive but also it was more a recreational uh, perspective wherein uh, you know uh, game hunting was given priority now uh, so the idea of wetlands came in as water as biodiversity hotspots and and when you look at uh, you know biodiversity regions all around the world the core management approach was that you close an area in in by declaring it as protected under whatever laws and regulation and then you allow nature to manage by itself so look at bharatpur uh, it was a game reserve of uh, rulers of bharatpur until you know till about 1960s uh, the the king of uh, the ruler of uh, bharatpur state in rajasthan was allowed to hunt uh, hunt in these wetlands uh, we have uh, the first uh, the oldest uh, you know wetland sanctuary of the country vedanthangal this is an irrigation tank 
and uh, it supports heronaries. Heronaries are areas wherein you get large number of birds. Now, farmers realize that when birds come in, their guano is a very rich source of natural fertilizer, which keeps um, irrigation alive. And thereby, communities went ahead and uh, uh, called for protecting these wetlands under erstwhile, you know, rules and colonial rules and regulations. This has been protected at least uh, since 1800s. But we also get diverse, uh, you know, governance approaches. For example, uh, you know, when you look at Cholas and Pandyas, uh, when they constructed cascading tank system, these were wonderful wetlands which could harvest every single drop of rainwater. And this was, uh, you know, uh, conserved uh, not only by the diktat, by the king, but also uh, by community uh, management. In Chilika, which is one of the large lagoons on the east coast, uh, coast of India, there was a governance regime that was created by the fishers. They used more than 50 different types of gears in the wetland. And they had a very unique knowledge on what kind of gear to use in a particular, you know, part of the lagoon. So where can we use nets, where we can use, you know, uh, different kinds of fishing, where we can use a line, uh, where you can use a crab, uh, you know, a crab trap and all. So they had delineated the wetland as per the seasons of fish migration. And that was a community-managed fishery systems. But over a period of time when India became independent, the predominant approach was a protected area, which is you close the wetland, don't allow humans to come in, allow species to survive. Now, this also had problems by its own because when you close an area, you can manage human interference, but wetlands by their, um, you know, by the very nature of their ecosystem are... Uh, uh, you know, uh, water driven. And that means it is not just humans, but it is the flow of water in and out of the wetland, which uh, gives life to the systems. Now, this is one example of the same, uh, you know, Manipur swamp deer. It was declared as nearly extinct in 1960s because uh, this animal was heavily poached. Now, the immediate reaction was to create a protected area around the wetland. And uh, this is uh, Kabil Namjur National Park. And immediately, you know, what happened was that poaching stopped and the number of animals increased. So wherein uh, there was no animals spotted in 1970, one individual was spotted in four and five, and the number is around 200 to 400 right now. But when you look at the habitat, now this habitat survives on water. It is thick vegetation which floats on water. And wetlands, you know, the pulsating, uh, floating and drying regime allows the vegetation to settle down, pick up nutrients and float again. Now, over a period of time, uh, the lake itself was, uh, uh, was modified to become a reservoir for hydropower production. And that means uh, the outlet was, uh, you know, a barrage was constructed at the outlet and the pulsing water regimes were changed into a very static regime. So the vegetation which uh, used to touch the ground once a year, that cycle was broken. So while the number of animals did increase, the vegetation itself started decaying. And the area of, you know, this is about, this animal is about 40 to 50 kilograms in weight, could be even higher, and needs at least one meter thick uh, vegetation to, to be able to stand, otherwise it sinks. Now that thickness of Fumdi, which used to be around 40 square kilometers, started declining and at present is nearly about 8 to 9 square kilometers. So while protected area uh, implementation has led to increase in number of animals, the habitat itself has shrunk and that, that requires a different approach of ensuring hydrological connectivity. So there are important lessons to be learned here that PA approaches can work for species and they have worked wonders, but habitat connectivity issues are not addressed by protected area management alone. How have we responded in 1983-84, Ministry of Environment and Forest was created and that is when wetlands started being recognized um, as a national issue. Uh, and thereafter, a range of interventions have uh, been taken up. So an atlas has been prepared. States are given assistance in uh, preparing their management plans. Training, uh, you know, programs are conducted, including the one that CASPOS is uh, uh, supporting now, IGNFA is supporting. So there are a lot of interventions that are taken uh, for uh, wetland conservation and are
network today we have 42 wetlands designated as uh, wetlands of international importance under different criteria of convention which is largest in uh, south asia and next only to china in in whole of asia so quite some significant achievements but when you look at the trends in wetlands uh, you find that natural wetlands are rapidly declining. This is a data that is, uh, you know, index that has been created by Wetlands International looking at different site studies. Uh, we, we find that we, in, in the last 30 years alone, uh, we have lost 40% of our natural wetlands. At the same time, the human-made wetlands, such as the reservoirs, barrages, have increased, have increased. So that means we are, on one hand, losing natural wetlands, yeah and we are creating new wetlands which are human made wetlands and which perform and which are created to serve you know different uh, you know different lands so natural wetlands are being lost rapidly human made wetlands are increasing although the rate of increasing uh, uh, rate of increase is not commensurate with the loss there are huge uncertainties there and this has been the trend globally as well. In uh, last year, we also uh, reviewed the data on wetlands worldwide, and we could identify that worldwide natural wetlands are being lost. The most rapid loss happening in Africa, followed by Asia, and uh, wherever in almost all continents, it is human-made wetlands which are dominating the landscape. And when you lose landscape, it is also about wetland-dependent species. Um, last year. For those of you uh, who watch this space of uh, you know biodiversity, the Living Planet Index uh, was was uh, released. This is the same index process, and on an average, wetland dependent species are the most stressed in the world, especially the megafauna. And uh, it is but natural that they are also increasingly becoming contested spaces. So we are watching, uh, uh, you know, even litigations that are being filed in Supreme Court and National Green Tribunal. More than uh, 33 cases have been filed in courts by civil society organizations on uh, wetland loss. And they're increasingly being, being uh, considered as contested spaces. Now, why should we bother? You know, initially when I told you our predominant approach for structuring wetland conservation was around birds and species. Today, our urban spaces are more vulnerable because loss of wetlands. They are flooding more. So as we construct more, the runoff increases. And if there is no space for water to go, you know, wetlands are topographic depressions. So if those depressions are constructed upon, the cities flood. And this is becoming rampant. In most of the urban areas, the frequency of pluvial flooding has increased. Yet, you know, cities are uh, not changing. For example, most of the cities, if you look at Calcutta, if you look at Guwahati, Chennai, um, Delhi, the dump yards of these cities are located inside wetlands. So there is a disconnect. While on one side, there is an impressive science which uh, talks about values of wetlands. When you look at the policy and planning side, you see such uh, you know casual approach uh, to to wetlands wherein you permit uh, you know the city administration permits dumping of waste so there are quite uh, you know a few disconnects when we talk of science and policy now let us come back to this science of wetland management you must have uh, you are all you know stalwarts and you are dealing with ecosystems and and environmental issues when we look at wetlands management any, when you talk of, you know, forget wetlands management, any management is about operational decision making. So uh, we, we take operational decisions and the purpose of those decisions is to achieve wise use. I'll talk about wise use um, in, in a bit. But it is uh, all about applying ecological principles to, you know, wetland management to achieve, you know, long-term sustainability. Now let's unpack this term wise use. Now, unlike forests, and different terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, wherein the predominant approach is to allow nature to regenerate on, on, on its own. Because of their high ecological productivity, wetlands need some kind of human interference to harvest the productivity. Now, uh, wetlands receive a lot of nutrients, sediments, and if there is no 
proactive interference to harvest that productivity in the form of fish fishing or uh, you know a little bit of declogging the inlets and outlets the wetlands uh, you know they uh, they move into a successional phase very soon they uh, progress towards becoming terrestrial so they need some kind of human interference and thereby human interference which does not change the basic character of the wetland is considered as wise use this entails you know species conservation approaches but it also allows for use of wetland for uh, different uh, purposes which does not change the character of the system if uh, if it is a you know i'll i'll give you an example of of what wise use is and what is unwise use now this is one wetland in andhra pradesh uh, koleru uh, uh, koleru lake uh, which is between two deltas uh, on the top on your uh, right is the, uh, the the godavari delta and on the uh, on your left is krishna delta and between these two deltas is is uh, a depression wherein flood waters from both these deltas come to the wetland and because of its uh, you know strategic location it is a flood buffer to the entire region if the deltas flood these wetlands will absorb the excess floods and the diversity of uh, landforms allows it to support a very rich uh, and diverse fisheries and you know uh, water birds so asia's largest herinary of open build stocks uh, was uh, an aquaculture system you know entrepreneurs came in and they converted this natural regime a beautiful lake into a series of small ponds today uh, roughly 40% of the freshwater fish that we eat might be coming from this wetland now when you look at the whole uh, uh, whole system we have uh, got uh, you know a lot of food production from the system by adding fertilizers and chemicals and pesticides at the same time the wetland has become a series of ponds it can no longer support you know flood reduction uh, flood buffering it can no longer support groundwater recharge and we have lost the beautiful pelican bay and since this was a sanctuary and a ram society the supreme court in 2000 and, um, you know 4 uh, ordered demolition of all fish tanks um, inside the sanctuary so this production system uh, which converted a natural flood plain into a series of aquaculture ponds is a transformation of the wetland which does not allow it to function naturally and this is what we call unwise use i hope this will give you ideas of what not to do in a wetland at the um, you know while uh, you know management designing management or uh, thinking of what can be done what are the principles that we use there are four simple principles systems thinking catchment scale management adaptive management and collaborative decision making i'll unpack them quickly systems thinking and especially for those of you who work on ecology and environmental issues uh, wetland management uh, has to be based on the premise that people and nature they are coupled systems now look at this fisherman if there is no active fishing in this wetland the wetland will become uh, the nutrient levels in this wetland will rise very you know uh, very rapidly that will further promote you know uh, growth of macrophages and it will move towards a terrestrial ecosystem so the basic activity the human engagement with this wetland in terms of subsistence level fishing becomes a part of the local ecology so the systems thinking uh, forces you to think about how the system has behaved in the long run and what gives it a resilience catchment scale management uh, this is uh, you know an example from uh, kerala lagoons uh, essentially when you look at uh, the water regimes of the lagoon it is impossible to manage it from inside unless you look at how reservoirs upstream of the estuary are behaving the idp reservoir you see a lot of reservoirs here how the land uses because the land uses what will control silt what will control nutrients so until you take a catchment view of the wetland it is impossible to generate a solution which is sitting uh, inside the wetland now third is about adaptive management now as i said 
in the initial slides, wetlands management is an evolving science. And every management still in an ideal science sense is an experiment. We are doing something, we need to learn from it and then revise. And I'll give you an example. Now, I talked about Bharatpur. Uh, this was a game reserve. And in 1970s, um, our uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi visited that gaming sanctuary. And she was appalled to see buffaloes uh, grazing in, in, the, in the national park. And she immediately said that, why don't you construct a stone wall around uh, the wetland to ensure that buffaloes from neighboring villages do not go into the wetland. It was done uh, at a huge local resistance about, uh, you know, there was a firing instance in, in Rajasthan uh, around National Park. Ten, uh, ten farmers had died. And uh, that became a huge hue and cry, uh, a, a huge political issue. But uh, we will we'll not discuss the politics uh, right now. We will look at the ecology. Now, buffaloes, uh, especially, you know, water buffaloes, did an important ecological function. They used to graze uh, the grass. When the buffaloes were taken out as a part of management prescription, the park gradually saw increased growth of paspalum and water hyacinth. Now, then it was then the park managers realized that some level of controlled grazing is a part of management and that needs to be built in. So today, a certain level of grazing is used as a part of active management. So if you look at management uh, in the 1970s and 80s, it was all about water birds. It was all about excluding humans, excluding grazing. But over a period of time, when monitoring was done, vegetation patterns were mapped, it was then management was revised. And this is the case for all wetlands. Whenever we design a management plan and we say, okay, you do this X, Y, Z interventions, we need to monitor, understand what works, what does not work, how does the ecology respond, and then keep on updating our management as we go ahead. Now, prescriptive approaches. Now, in continuation with the previous thinking, we also say that prescriptive approaches or a standard design one size fit all uh, approach does not work in wetlands. So you, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm showing you pictures from two wetlands. One is uh, Bharatpur and one is uh, Nawab in Uttar Pradesh. Both of these, you know, if you look at the design of the wetland, it is similar. Why? Because they are protected areas managed by, you know, uh, forestry people and somehow Keladev National Park has become a role model. So wherever, you know, park management is done, uh, most often than not, the effort is applied to create mounds, put in some trees there for birds to perch with an expectation that the same level of diversity can be achieved. On the left, you have nearly 200 bird species coming. In Nawab Ganj, the number of birds has declined because naturally this used to be a, an open water marsh. When we disturb the habitat or modify the habitat, there is no guarantee that species will accept, uh, you know, habitat changes at the same level or adapt to those changes. So when we become prescriptive, more often than not, those solutions become very limiting within wetlands. And finally, uh, given the basic character of uh, wetlands, we need to engage with stakeholders. Every wetland, uh, uh, you know, will have different stakeholders in terms of water resources, tourism, biodiversity, revenue, energy, fisheries. And unless we collaborate and understand how wetlands are integrated into their sectoral plans, there is highly likely that we get into a unisectoral approach. For example, if uh, you know, if you look into the mindset of revenue department, uh, wetlands are best when they are converted because they can generate more revenue. If you look at energy people, they will say, okay, why not dam this wetland and create, you know, store water for energy. If you look at fisheries people, they will always promote more fish production or cultured fisheries in a system. For water resources, natural waters are very problematic. It has to be dammed. It has to be diverted. For tourism, all wetlands are recreation spots. Now, wetland management is about balancing all those interests and creating a common ground wherein wetlands in its natural shape can support sectoral interest 
as well as ensure that biodiversity is conserved. It is about speaking the voice of nature and also at the same time trying to accommodate or trying to provide for development as far as possible without altering the system. What are the tools that we have? Uh, I'll discuss some of the tools uh, for you to appreciate and then uh, 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 you know, allow you to uh, you know, uh, introspect what, what can be your contribution. One is the inventory process. How much wetlands do we have in what form? Uh, the geospatial, the remote sensing technologies have become very prolific. Initially, we had optical sensors, uh, you know, which were essentially photographs taken from the sky. And you could map large areas. You know, you still can, you know, this uh, map that I'm showing you is about 10,000 square kilometers. Now, with remote sensing technologies, it is possible to understand wetlands in a landscape dimension. Now, more recent advancements, they allow you, uh, you know, microwave data. Microwave data is essential for, especially for tropical wetlands, because uh, much of the wetlands are also highly vegetated. So when you look at uh, an image which is taken from uh, an optical sensor, uh, it will show as vegetation. It is only when you have thermal data or uh, data which is of, uh, you know, at, uh, you know, sensors which use longer wavelengths, you can understand uh, the the wetland regime. And there has been a lot of advancements in uh, the number of satellites that India has launched, RadarSat, and data is there. You also have LOS data, which can be used to, you know, improve our understanding of wetlands distribution. And this also allows you to plan at river basin scale. When I talked about catchment management, this is Hirakud Reservoir, one of the largest reservoirs that India and possibly Asia has. And this catchment is about 10,000 square kilometers. Now look at 1975 land use and land cover change and look at 2010. Now the reservoir is receiving a lot of silt and by examining the left land use and land cover data with the right land use and land cover data, you can understand where the forests have been depleted and which tributaries are carrying more silt. And then it becomes possible to plan at a, at a you know, higher resolution and interact with forest department you know you uh, this is this this plan is now being negotiated between Urissa and Chhattisgarh to reorient their catchment programs so that we receive less filled in our aquatic systems in in the wetlands now wetlands also need water at times you know for for wetlands to perform all these diverse functions uh, uh, we need uh, water and that means uh, the language of water allocation comes in. When we say that we need water for agriculture, we need water for irrigation, we have, uh, you know, mostly when you are talking to engineers, they will say, okay, tell us how much water do you want? When you say water, quantitative estimation, and at what time, which season? So we need 20 CFT, you know, cubic feet of water, and cubic feet per second, QSEX, 40 QSEX. Now, there are now tools which can help you define the natural regime of the wetland, and you can understand different trade-offs. Now, going back to the case of Lokta Cake, once again, uh, there is a barrage now. And, uh, you know, barrage means that uh, the water levels that used to behave naturally can no longer be achieved. But herein, we can go for scenario planning. So I'll show you this is a live exercise that we did. Now, scenario three is business as usual. On the left, on your, uh, on your uh, y-axis is water levels of the wetland. And you will see that water levels are perennially high. You know, they, they, they are high throughout the year. And at that level, you know, uh, the grounding of vegetation is not possible. Only say like 10% uh, of the vegetation touches the ground. When we look into the historical scenario, we can uh, manage uh, to get all the vegetation to the ground, but we will lose all hydropower production. So we created a synthetic operation rule for the hydric structure. And say that okay, if you can allow, uh, if you can uh, allow for uh, water, uh, you know, touching, you know, uh, allow water allocation for wetland in the in the months of June and July, it is possible to achieve grounding of fumbies without, uh, you know, disturbing hydropower production. And this is where you start balancing interests. Uh, 
uh, you can still produce hydropower from water that is stored in the wetland, but at certain times, biodiversity needs specimens, and this is what gives us a tool to manage different uh, benefit systems from the wetland. The third tool, which is used by spatial planners, you know, as in you know, town and country planning, we have the idea of zones. Now, since wetlands have multiple uses. Uh, you know, zoning becomes an important uh, tool for us to understand how wetlands can behave. Now, this is an example of East Calcutta wetlands, wherein uh, you know part of the wetland. When you look at the yellow, uh, when you look at the blue part, this is what is used for aquaculture. When you look at the green part, this is what is used for vegetable horticulture, and the yellow part, this is what is used for um, agriculture. So when wastewater comes in, it passes through all these systems and by the time it goes out, it is cleared. Now this is a zoning approach to manage. Uh, in protected areas, this is not possible, but for wetlands which are outside protected area systems, we can manage multiple land uses. This is how the wetland has been naturally. Right? On the left, uh, on the right, you will see Point Calimer, which is in Tamil Nadu on the coast. Now there is a wildlife sanctuary here which is conserved for uh, black buck. You have reserved forest in terms of mangroves. And in between, there are swamps, which are used for uh, the active fisheries and salt production. So here in again, you will see the whole wetland has been zoned. You can allow for commercial activities, but there are preconditions that ecological integrity of the system is maintained and connectivity is not lost. So we can permit salt uh, production in weatherenium swamps provided they do not you know, disconnect the wetland from uh, the Muthupet Reserve or the Point Calimar Sanctuary. So this habitat continuity becomes an important uh, guiding factor for balancing multiple wetland uses uh, in, in a way. We have talked about ecosystem services, the benefits uh, that wetlands uh, give us. Uh, I'll also show you how those benefits can be converted uh, to profound economic arguments when you have to negotiate funds from uh, different agencies. And, uh, you know, at times when there are pressing issues of poverty reduction, urban development, uh, uh, pollution abatement, uh, where does wetland conservation stand? And I'll give you one example of Chilika restoration. Uh, in uh, 2001, a massive uh, restoration of uh, the lagoon was uh, done, wherein, uh, you know, through hydrological intervention, a mouth was opened in the lagoon from the sea that allowed fish to regenerate in the lagoon. And, uh, you know, that uh, whole uh, exercise uh, led to improved natural captured fish landing from 1,000 metric tons to 14,000 metric tons. The freshwater invasives came down uh, you know, the area is a tourist hub, uh, although tourism is now going overboard. Now, the biodiversity has uh, shown a lot of improvement. When you convert all of these benefits uh, into economic terms and you try to estimate what this restoration project gives back to society, wetland restoration perhaps is one of the most potent social redistribution or social welfare projects. Herein, you know, in the last 25 years since the uh, you know, constitution of Chilika Development Authority, nearly 100, uh, 154 uh, crore rupees have been spent in 25 years. You know, this may look like a huge amount. But when you look at the benefits, every rupee that has been given for this restoration has given the society seven rupees worth of benefits back in terms of improved fisheries, improved tourism, improved employment opportunities. And that is an important economic argument that uh, uh, we use uh, in planning commission and other agencies to demonstrate that wetland conservation should also be considered as a development investment. There is an important role to communicate wetlands. And I, I show you this picture from Velayani, which is a wetland in uh, Kerala, wherein you know, this, is, this is done by uh, the local college. It's uh, in the zoology department. Now, they have been actively researching on this uh, wetland. Uh, and what they did was they uh, created on the roadside, they just created uh, this uh, artwork, I Love Velayani, and created a selfie spot. Now, through this simple exercise, you know, passerbys are now standing there and saying, okay, oh, what is this Velayani? And then, you know, some students are there to explain. And then through uh, 
you know word of mouth and different communication exercises especially you know our young generation is attracted to knowing more about these ecosystems but there are also conventional techniques this is a picture from the sundarbans wherein there is now a, a model of where the wetland is this is about 4000 square kilometers and then you can discuss on these living models on how the royal bengal tiger uh, habitat behaves and where the honey comes in or simply you know taking students out to watch towers and allowing them to appreciate the habitat diversity that a wetland brings is is a, a way to bring society closer to these ecosystems but we can also use our knowledge of you know water uh, levels and quality to uh, design good restoration projects and therein i'll show you one um, excellent restoration initiative that has been tried in uh, mangrove wetlands in uh, vedaranya now mangroves are salt tolerant but if the salt level goes too high they die so you need a gradient a gradient uh, between uh, you know 8 to 9 parts per thousand of salt till about 35 so this is a fish bone technique when water flows when you look at this image this is like a fish the central bone of the fish when sea water flows into the system it is diluted and when it flows through the channels it is further diluted so you get a salinity gradient and when you see these young mangroves uh, over the over the years these have now become very dense this is how the knowledge of salinity and hydrology has allowed designing very good restoration initiative yeah. i'll also show you how the wastewater treatment functions are used this is one village in delhi rajokri just outside uh, you know the national and uh, the national capital uh, in the village and this whole uh, wastewater used to be dumped in this wetland and it used to stink there was a lot of foul smell so uh, this was the place where no no one would like to go so a constructed wetland technology was used so in the center on the on the right way if you can see my cursor on the left now this is where the sewage is collected uh, collected here and it passes through a vegetation bed so these are you know um, wetland plants which can absorb nutrients and after treatment this is all pumped back to the wetland yeah. now this has become beautiful water and uh, the villages there is quite a big north indian population they wanted to use these waters for uh, the chhat festival so the government has also uh, constructed an amphitheater like structure which can be used as a chhat ghat and this has become a promising model this place which used to be smelling like muck today is one of the most uh, you know prominent places in that village and the water is treated free of cost the cost of running an stp is all abated by the constructed wetland technically one of the biggest challenges the society faces today is floods and i'm giving an example from the netherlands this is being considered for implementation in india now netherlands incidentally also happens my organization is a dutch organization netherlands uh, the term uh, nether means below sea level so uh, in netherlands uh, 70% of that country is below sea level and if they do not manage their waters very well it is estimated that within 8 or 9 minutes the whole country would be under sea so they have to manage their embankments very well and uh, you can see you know these polders they call it polders they are constructed around rivers so that they do not flood but every year when you construct an engineering structure uh, there is always a risk of failure and this is the worst nightmare of dutch engineers what should we do with the polders if they if they collapse if there is even a small breach we it is impossible to manage the sea around around in our netherlands so they have looked into a wetland technology wherein they have allowed you know you see these green areas these are palm fields to go back to the rivers the natural flood plains have been vacated and the river is allowed to flood the flood plains and then embankments have been shifted back this is this project is called room for the river so the river is given its flood plains and then that reduces the need for depending on dikes because when the water is in the wetlands its velocity uh, its its behavior is far calmer and the embankments then are moved back you know the embankments are now lower lower in height the pressure on these embankments is much lower and these intervening areas have become wonderful wetland and waterbird habitats so this reduces flood risk 
and uh, you know if you read on the net on the room for river on the rhine river you will get some beautiful pictures on how these approaches are applying this technology in india is slightly difficult because you know farming and land title issues are uh, issues are still not settled uh, but this allows you one approach of how wetlands can become uh, you know natural defense but on the coast it is scientifically established that presence of coastal wetlands reduces coastal erosion now mangroves for example they have their deep roots and they can trap sediments and they can reduce erosion if you try to replace this function by a sea wall it has its own ecological consequences and in the in the times of tsunami you know we have seen that when tsunami comes in when there are high velocity winds this vegetation takes burnt of the maximum impact and reduces damage in the hinterland we talk a lot about carbon wetlands and carbon uh, much of the debate around carbon is in forests but what we do not realize that wetlands especially peat bogs i see sharma ji here as one of the attendees and sharma ji this might interest you professor sharma that you know in himachal this is a photograph from himachal near chandratal these are wonderful peat bogs so in himalayas um, uh, especially in cold 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 areas vegetation decays very slowly and this vegetation has a huge carbon accumulation potential these are bogs uh, which are very carbon rich we still do not know how much of this uh, you know system is spread across the himalayas but their carbon storage potential is nearly 50 times higher than tropical forest we need to map them more so wetlands can be very effective climate uh, you know um, you know carbon sinks although it is also true that in the flood plain regions wetlands can also emit greenhouse gases but over a period of time if we continue disturbing wetlands if we continue polluting wetlands the greenhouse gas release becomes more high, uh, you know uh, increases over a period of time so by conserving wetlands especially carbon rich wetlands we can effectively convert sources into sinks cities are also adopting models uh, in the climate adaptation model this is a planning uh, proposal considered for chennai wherein they are restoring the whole network of wetlands to absorb the extremities of floods and droughts uh, in uh, in in the city planning now wetland monitoring is an important area and uh, most of you would be you know Uh, doing limnological investigations water quality investigations around wetlands uh, a new approach uh, is that of translating that information into health cards so we have talked about soil health cards we use health cards for you know our own internal checkups you get certain indicators so government of india minister of environment and forest has uh, started a very novel program of using some basic indicators which can ocularly be seen through naked eyes or some basic uh, you know exercise and then determine your health so we use a set of indicators uh, this is a list i'll share this presentation for you so some very basic indicators so how much wetland area has been converted into non wetland use since 2000 what is the number of natural in inlets and how many of them are choked what is the number of outlets what is the area of wetland that is considered by mac uh, that is covered by macrophytes does is the wetland map available does it have a management plan is it notified and for each of these you can grade the wetland as a b c d or e now these thresholds can be decided based on local context but you know an exercise was done throughout india and you can see uh, how wetlands have behaved so urban wetlands for example are more or less under c and d category and you can you can then align all this ecological information with management practices and see what an intervention needs to be done to improve wetland condition wetlands are also hot spots of livelihood in in chilika you have an excellent example where in uh, poachers you know these are uh, you know the boatmen that you see in this uh, photograph were essentially poachers who used to hunt birds and uh, often they were on the other side of the law they were caught and booked under wildlife protection act but these people were trained in bird watching and today not only their income has increased and uh, they they have uh, come out of entirely out of poaching business 
they have become active conservationists their livelihood has improved so wetland conservation can also give new dimensions to livelihoods most of the wetlands have uh, water hyacinth uh, this is one example where uh, you know an ngo in kerala has converted water hyacinth into beautiful handicraft products and this is an area of active interest because water hyacinth is one of the most nuisance weeds uh, that an ecosystem you know has now I'll quickly reflect on to governance uh, in uh, uh, wetlands uh, conservation rules in 2017 this has been issued under environment protection act every state now has a state wetland authority and uh, including union territories now these authorities are uh, the nodal institutions for all policy making regulation bodies you can also check uh, websites for concerned wetland authority in your state and this is where the governance the formal governance uh, is structured but there is a lot of scope for augmenting formal governance with informal governance now i'll give you one example of chilika again now here in the governing body of chilika development authority is headed by navin patnaik ji who is the chief minister you have the minister you have members of parliament you have secretaries of key departments this is the formal structure now why this structure because it allows different departments to discuss the prognosis of their sectoral plans if there is any sectoral plan for tourism and, and if it does not bode well for uh, chilika that can be discussed at the authority and with the chief minister being there you can do a yes or no for this project in chilika but what the authority does it has informal collaborations with more than 50 different types of institutions which contribute to management for example if you look at uh, you know uh, research agencies you will find international universities collaborating with chilika if you look at cbos there are active ngo networks which work with chilika so this formal and informal structure together they give a very excellent blend of wetlands conservation and this is one model in uttar pradesh the state of uttar pradesh where in this uh, gentleman an is officer mr sanjay kumar so normally when we see conservation projects we look at uh, ministry of environment to give funds so when he was deputed in sitapur he realized that you know wetlands needed very basic intervention for example lot of sewage was coming in so toilets needed to be constructed some desilitation needed to be done so what he did was an innovative approach he uses fund under the manrega scheme indira avas yojana total sanitation campaign to bring people back to wetlands to engage wetlands and today those wetlands are one of the active breeding grounds for saras spring so conservation need not always be funded through conservation funds there are also innovative convergence models for uh, you know attracting uh, you know using funds from development sector to conserve wetlands there are several models like this i have just picked up one to show you how this work but it is also about sharing power you know uh, this is uh, in under wildlife protection act we had this idea of protected areas but as of today declaring more protected areas is not possible one that human density has increased but also you know contesting claims there are political considerations but wildlife protection act also allows for community reserves where in the land titles the ownership of communities is allowed in the protected area and they are actively engaged in wetland management this is keshopur miami in punjab where in uh, the committee which manages the area has sarpanches from all the neighboring villages now they together with forest department determine the management plan but on extreme end is also you know a wetland close to national capital region where um, you know farmers are waiting for compensation and they want the land to be declared as a wetland so that so they could be given you know huge uh, you know compensation as is in the national capital region so there are different ends to it but at end of the day unless power is shared across different levels wetland conservation remains an arduous task so at end of the day when i talk about management of wetlands management does not always mean doing something when i look at very pristine wetlands in the himalayas possibly all we need to do is monitor but when i look at highly degraded ecosystems here in you need a full pledge restoration project so i'll close by saying that management does not always mean intervening not intervening monitoring the system is also an important management decision now we are actively talking about climate change now climate change has introduced new dimensions to wetlands now if i look at gangetic wetlands alone 
if you look at the models which predict increasing water temperatures and nutrient conditions, that means our wetlands are going to be more vegetated. Warming and prolonged drying may adversely impact ectothermic species. The gender might change. Uh, you know, increase increasing rainfall could also be positive for water birds, but you know, uh, fish breeding seasons might shift. So wetland conservation and wetland ecosystems are going to be highly dynamic. What does it mean? It means that you know, if we are designing management based on the past data, that might be very limited. You know, stationarity-based approaches, that, uh, that is what ecosystem management tells us. We cannot manage wetlands for using stationarity approaches. So in 1970s, my wetland looked like this, so let me manage as per that information. We have to be continually monitoring the system and adapting as you know, climate change unfolds. We'll, we should try to actively mitigate the impacts of climate change, but at the end of the day, these ecosystems are going to be under change. And only management that is informed by good monitoring and good science is, uh, you know, is the is the best, uh, you know, approach. What are the barriers? Now, one simple barrier is use of diverse terms. When you talk to an engineer, they will talk to, they will tell you, oh, is this a water body? Now, not all wetlands store water. When I look at where, uh, mangroves, for example, they don't store water. So water bodies are all water bodies are wetlands, but all wetlands are not water bodies. These are living ecosystems. So we use, there are at least 40 English terms that I have seen being used for wetlands, and they all give a different notion to wetlands. So unless we start using the term wetlands holistically, single sector management uh, will continue to prevail. There is still a tendency to keep people out from these ecosystems, which in most cases, perhaps, only increases social tension and does not give us good ecological outcomes. When we manage based on you know top-down approaches, uh, you know these are going to be difficult. As I gave you some examples in the previous slides, and at the end of the day, it is all about capacities. You know you don't get a formal degree in wetlands conservation today. You can study zoology, you can study botany, you can study landscape management. Uh, you can study natural resource management, but wetlands is still to find a place in uh, formal education curriculum. And this is an area where I think I'll need your help to create a curriculum and create an education hub wherein people can get formally trained in what wetlands are, how to manage them, and uh, you know, build a cadre of trained professionals. When you look at Sectoral approaches, uh, I showed you the wetland map of India. I'm now showing you the wasteland map of India. Again, this is by Ministry of Rural Development and a lot of uh, you know uh, wetland types are now covered under wasteland categories. Now, this is where different, even different arms of uh, government are not unified in their vision of wetlands. We are trying to sort this out. And uh, there are historical issues, you know, Normally, environment conservation has been strongly linked with tree plantation. This is one example in Kashmir, wherein even tree plantation can go wrong. Wherein, uh, you know, this is Wooler Lake, one of the largest freshwater lakes of Kashmir Valley. Now, this was uh, used for willow plantation. Willow is the, uh, we use the wood for burning and also we make beautiful cricket mats from there. Now, willow plantation in a wetland means that it will get silted up. Wetland, the tree will garner more silt and then it uh, creates a terrestrial environment. The water holding capacity is reduced. So when Kashmir faced repeated floods, the only way to resort to you know reduce flooding was to remove trees from here and uh, you know uh, ensure that uh, this vegetation is not burned but an active intervention here was removing trees from the wetland to reclaim hydrological buffering capacity so sometimes what looks good in one age uh, in 1960s and 70s can actually be an ecological disaster and there are more challenges you know uh, for those of you from assam we had the Bagjan blowout. The Magari bill was completely burnt. Now these uh, instances are becoming, um, you know, all the more they tell us that the wetland management is increasingly going to be very, very complex and challenging. Who would imagine that there is an oil pipeline below the wetland which would burn one day, uh, one day? But this incident has shown us that we have to take a more cautious view when we permit, you know, oil exploration 
um, in, in wetlands. Last year, and although we are facing bird flu right now, for those of you who watch this space, in summer we had nearly you know one lakh birds dying within four to five days because of uh, a, avian bottleism, uh, a, a virus that lives in water. So wetlands are going to be very dynamic, active research areas, active management areas, and thereby increasingly challenging and and uh, you know giving us a reason to exist and stay in food. So in conclusion, what I would say that uh, when India envisions sustainable development, wetland management itself will form a crucial place and wetland managers would be one of the important stakeholders. Wise use philosophy uh, gives us a good scope for, uh, you know, managing multiple diverse, uh, you know, development pathways. Yet there is an important role of close monitoring of the systems and improving governance. And at the end of the day, all management that we do remains a, a scientific exploration. It needs to be monitored closely. We need to understand how management is performing and then use that information to modify management as we go ahead. Abhilashi, that was all that I wanted to share. Uh, I think I have reached uh, you know, my time allocation. Over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Riteshji. Now I would request the participants to kindly interact. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, sir. Yes, please go on. Yeah, sir. My name is Arvind Singh Rathod and I'm, I'm a participant from Rajasthan. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, Rathod, you are audible. We've all been told what uh, success looks like. Our but what does it look like for you? Uh, led us to make many dams on rivers for hydropower. But uh, uh, building of dams and diversion of rivers is seen as biggest threat to wetlands. And my question is that uh, while giving green signal to small uh, big or big uh, dam projects, uh, does the environment impact assessment report takes into account the threats to, to small wetlands in the catchment area or the natural flow of river, uh, which are not recognized by the Ransar Convention or the Wetland Conservation Authority of India? Uh, thank you, sir. This is... Uh... A very insightful question. Unfortunately, our environment uh, impact assessment procedures uh, are not geared to take into account such uh, ecosystem intricacies. They're very run-of-the-mill application of uh, environment clearance approaches. And at the end of the day, uh, the focus largely remains on ensuring that the project goes ahead without understanding these long-term consequences. So a very quick answer is our env environment impact procedures are not yet geared to handle these interactions. We had written, we have uh, written a proposal for the ministry to uh, design uh, separate guidelines for environmental impact assessment, and especially uh, take into account cumulative impacts. It is not about, you know, as you have seen in a catchment, it is not about one project uh, and and uh, impact on one stretch of the ecosystem. A small, you know, project can create a cascading effect across all across the wetland catchment. Uh, so we are still struggling to create a good basis for environment impact assessment, and it remains an active advocacy area. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. May I ask a question? May I ask yes, a please, question? Yes, please, ma'am. Yeah. Um, it was a wonderful talk, and I think it was very, very highly relevant for all the oh, teacher okay. participants. Because uh, this is what is directly going to go into our teaching. Uh, before we discuss on this, and maybe we'll have a longer discussion on this in the panel discussion. But right now, the question I want to ask uh, Dr. Kumar is, uh, what uh, these two major water bodies, or, uh, which have disappeared from the uh, NCR, and that is uh, uh, the Batkal Lake, which has become a total desert now, and 
also the peacock lake very close to the uh, suraj kund area what what has the what is the reason and what, why has they never they never been checked i just want to answer this that i used to take my students to vatkal lake where they used to have a picnic and also see all the aquatic plants which we cannot show them anywhere else in delhi ma'am uh, this is a very uh, interesting question when you look at bhatkal lake uh, you know i was uh, i think couple of years back uh, the district collector had uh, called us and they wanted to understand why are these lakes disappearing and one thing that i that struck me there is a lot of groundwater mining happening in that area and it is all illegal but there are not many you know groundwater shallow uh, deep bore wells that are operating in and around those wetlands and my uh, you know initial impression is that the whole hydrology uh, of uh, that area has been disturbed and uh, excessive groundwater mining has led to you know the surface water regime uh, being completely dry now uh, there are people who are working on this and i'm happy to you know share my initial findings with you uh, offline and discuss how we can engage in uh, you know restoring and rejuvenating these ecosystems thank you sir i would want that this uh, issue especially for all the students mm. of uh, delhi the you know, particularly the undergraduates who need to be made aware of these things and the issues which are of direct relevance instead of just making our environmental science and um, ecology classes and uh, and and all other uh, such yeah. classes totally theoretical this is something they need to experience to actually churn them into doing these th things in future so please uh, help the teaching community from your side as well thank you sir sure ma'am uh, my commitment whenever uh, just give us a, a notice whenever you want us to speak to your students the best classes happen uh, in a field setting and i'm happy yes. to take your students and uh, anyone else into the wetland to explain these dynamics what are the real time uh, challenges that we face in wetland management and we also have lot of educational materials that we have developed over a period of time uh oh, which great. will be more than happy to share with you please do please do at least with all the teachers who are attending this please send us the links to whatever is available and maybe the catalogs or something it will be very nice for you Excuse thank you sir yeah it was a good uh, uh, observation uh, dr geeta mathur i would like to add that uh, whenever there is a review of syllabus in your university uh, basically i think the syllabus is approved by your academic council so uh -huh. if, uh, uh, if some sort of committees are formed to uh, review the syllabus and propose changes in the syllabus uh, the universities also may consider including some of the field officials and some of the uh, managers like Rit dr ritesh and uh, there are several others who work in various areas of ecology so that uh -huh. uh, you know the subjects can be that are taught in the colleges can be linked with field related uh, management aspects Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Uh, uh, can I hang out? Can I hang out? Hello. Hello. Is it audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentations and uh, thank you for organizing, sir. I have one doubt and I need some clarifications from your end. As of now, in wetland conservations, we are um, mainly focusing about in Ramsar as well as in wherever it is possible in our adjoining coastal and uh, areas. Is it possible yeah. any specific guidelines is there for protecting inland wetlands, sir? My question is, we need to know about uh, what are the guidelines you have. in wetland conservations especially in inland wetland so uh, you know while uh, my presentation slides did show some of the large wetlands there are now uh, established guidelines for wetlands restoration these have been issued by the ministry the essence of those guidelines whether you are looking at a large or a small ecosystem is to follow a diagnostic approach uh, let's not be prescriptive but let's describe the wetland 
with whatever information that we have including you know different types of information that might exist including you know knowledge of uh, the villagers that are living in and around the village or you know citizen groups and then use that uh, you know knowledge to identify and pinpoint the reasons of adverse change in the wetland and design management intervention accordingly now these guidelines are available on the ministry if you uh, log on to their website and look into national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystems uh, those guidelines are downloadable i will also share those links uh, with uh, dr abhilash so that these may be made available to uh, everyone in the workshop thank you sir thank you sir we are expecting you to receive the, your links all those things sir. thank you so much sir hello uh, am i audible yes 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 uh, thank you so much uh, sir it was uh, really a pleasant lecture and rich in so much of the content uh, sir i am ojit from ramjus college basically from manipur I was so much was stunned so by your observation that uh, the Loktak Lake is having a shrinking habitat and increasing Sakai. Uh, one thing that I want to share is nowadays we are having a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, hydroelectric power project coming up as one of the important alternative source of energy. So creates creation of hydroelectric power projects and the creation and construction of dams. and increasing the water bodies uh, can i uh, say that it may lead into the increase of what to say uh, the birds migrating from other areas and when i look at this particular point uh, say for example the bird flu and other zoonotic diseases so can 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 we believe can we say that creation of the artificial wetlands may also result in bringing some of this kind of a or to yeah. say uh, issues so please uh, 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 i i really need a clarification from you thank you thank you dr rojit and so let us say uh, the, this aspect of zoonotic diseases and wetlands is one uh, you know where we have to be very careful in uh, the way we understand interpret and communicate science all wild species including migratory water birds are reservoirs for all sorts of pathogens including the current covid outbreak which came into okay, through through the bats now wild birds have lot of low pathogenic you know strains which at times they keep on mutating the problem is when our food production system for example when our domesticated birds they interact with wild birds it is when we create an environment for uh, the virus to move from these migratory species to which they are inert to domesticated birds and domesticated animals which have inherently low immunity because of their low diversity and you know a lot of problems with our biosecurity measures so wild species migration is a phenomenon that has been happening since millennia since civilizations the food production system has not been able to rise to the occasion and create sufficient biosecurity measures to isolate our wild birds from domestic yeah. birds prevent the mixing of these so it is not the reservoir that needs to be blamed or needs to be concerned you know wetlands you know uh, uh, are beautiful areas where you know species equally need to survive but if we go too close if we uh, get into the territory of migratory species Uh, aquatic life we also run the risk of viruses affecting uh, humans and animals alike so there needs to be a caution you know uh, these beautiful landscapes cannot just be looked from the lens of zoonotic diseases we need to work a lot on our uh, you know ecological sensitivity of the food production systems and on the your question of hydropower you know today we are living into an era of grid so why should we destroy our wetlands just for the sake of production of power there is lot of surplus power in the grid that can be taken for meeting the power needs so why should we destroy a wetland which has multiple functions just in this um, in the name of generating you know more energy uh, uh, from uh, from hydropower projects i think the whole energy and for that matter different sectoral policies 
should be evaluated from the lens of ecology, whether we actually need to destroy our pristine ecosystems to achieve, uh, you know, uh, food and water security, and uh, uh, whether there are options for, uh, you know, buying energy from the grid and making the state, uh, you know, uh, uh, water or energy secure. Thank you so much. I would just take some uh, comments and questions that are there in the chat box. Uh, Dr. D. Monica Ram uh, says that uh, scientists know lots of things. So therefore, there should be more scientists than the politicians while making policies. So uh, I don't know. I reserve my comments on this. And uh, uh, visit to wetlands. She also further says that visit to wetlands should be compulsory for all students in schools and colleges. And this should be funded by the government. Yeah, well, there is no reason to disagree with it. Absolutely, Dr. Abhilash. And she is also bothered that uh, wetland topic is still missing in ecology syllabus at UG level. And it needs to be incorporated. So the next time you revise your syllabus, just remember us. Absolutely right, Dr. Abhilash. This is a wonderful point. Actually, one of the reasons why I wanted to join this uh, discussion was that I was speaking to teachers and people who deal with, uh, you know, education. So my hope is that you will join forces, create space for wetlands in your uh, uh, academic programs. We are more than willing to work with you and creating the syllabi and uh, all necessary resources that you might need for delivering the course. And Dr. Swarnalata says uh, very interesting presentation. Require request an insight on wetlands in the Nilgiris of Tamil Nadu. Uh, Nilgiri wetlands. Uh, there is an active uh, research group led by Dr. Aparna but, um, uh, Batwe, if I'm not mistaken. I'll be more than happy to share those uh, accounts. These are wonderful wetlands, headwater wetlands. Um, which are uh, so crucial for the hydrology of the region. And Dr. Batwe and her team has uh, done wonderful, you know, exercise of mapping those ephemeral wetlands. Sir, can we uh, have any contacts with them for the Nilgiri uh, wetlands, sir? Sir, this is Swarnalata. More than happy to share contacts. I'll, I'll, I'll share those links with you. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, kindly share it with me. I will just uh, transmit it to all of the participants here. Sure, sure, Doctor. There is uh, Mr. Ashish Prabhu Gaukar asking eutrophication in wetlands due to agricultural activity is a problem. And so, what is the solution? Okay, uh, the whole science of eutrophication needs to be readjusted. Uh, most of the times, with diffuse runoff. Uh, uh, this will continue being a challenge. Uh, there are uh, constructed wetland technologies uh, that are available, but at the end of the day, we will also have to deal with sources of uh, those nutrients, which is the food production system, and then also talk about uh, the sinks, which are the wetlands. So from the wetland end, there are a number of uh, measures that can be taken, uh, uh, including the option of using some wetlands as nutrient sinks and transformers. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the quantity of nutrients that are being used in agriculture, uh, unless, uh, you know, nutrient management, integrated pest management actions are done at the catchment level, I do not see much headway or progress in addressing the issue of eutrophication in wetlands. That's a manager's perspective. From science side... We have definitely n number of options which can promise that eutrophication can be handled. But at the end of the day, 25 years, I can promise you unless something happens at the source, the sink is too much stressed. Uh, Dr. Tara uh, S.S. Nair uh, wants to know whether wetland and watershed management are one and the same and are these responsibilities for all people alike? So, watershed management is uh, gives us a catchment dimension. Wetland management also evolves an active uh, proportion of uh, 
you know uh, ecological understanding of the system managing aquatic habitats managing wetlands so watershed management is aligned in the sense yeah. in the geographical sense yes but uh, there are aspects of ecology and uh, sociology anthropology which also comes in when we deal with wetlands uh, dr ritesh i think your uh, screen is being shared okay i'll i'll switch it off Uh, Dr. Sukanya Lal wants to share that many water bodies have completely dried in many areas in most of the cities and in rural areas. Is there any mechanism from government side to activate those areas or protect those areas on urgent basis? We are losing so many migratory birds and local birds of that specific area. So the most ambitious program which the government has is uh, Har Ghar Jal Mission. now har ghar jal mission one component of it is source water protection and there is 25% of funds which have been earmarked by ministry of jal shakti are essentially for protecting the sources of water which are essentially these systems uh, these wetland systems so there are investments in place there are funds with ministry of environment the jal shakti ministry the you know our uh, smart cities mission uh, funding is not an issue the issue more uh, in my in understanding is creating enabling governance mechanisms and capacities to design and implement good restoration initiatives that is what is uh, you know a biggest challenge i'll get you on sorry i'll, I'll get you on. Uh, so uh, i think there are uh, no more uh, queries queries so i must uh, thank dr ritesh uh, uh, for you know having accepted our invitation and uh, delivering this lecture we have had a very good uh, association with dr ritesh and his organization as far as training in the field of wetlands is concerned so thank you dr ritesh uh, uh, very much uh, for uh, delivering this enlightening uh, uh, session and i'm sure that more all the participants have immensely benefited from your uh session so we do look forward to have a wonderful tie up with you in the future also and i'm also looking forward to a copy of your presentation and also uh the links and other uh, information that you have promised to share with us so thank you thank you very much uh, we do look forward to have a, a wonderful association with you in the future thank you thank you dr ashish now i request the participants that our next speaker is uh, already here uh so so we will uh, curtail our break today uh, and uh, let us listen to our next speaker we'll take a break of 2 to 3 minutes and uh, in the meanwhile the next speaker will be online भारत के जंगल सदियों से अपने अंदर न जाने कितने रहस्य छिपाए हुए हैं हमारे जंगलों की पूरी दुनिया में हमेशा से एक खास पहचान रही है इसीलिए तो हर साल विदेशों से भी न जाने कितने लोग हमारे जंगलों की ओर खींचे चले आते हैं एक अलग ही जादू है यहां के जंगलों में जादू इतना अनूठा कि कभी किसी इंसान को लालची शिकारी बना दे तो कभी किसी इंसान में इतना जज्बा पैदा कर दे कि वह अपने परिवार और जान की परवाह किए बगैर इस जंगल और उसके जीवों की सुरक्षा में दिन रात एक कर दे भारत में जंगलों और उसके वन्य प्राणियों की सुरक्षा हमेशा से ही एक बड़ी चुनौती रही है और इतने बड़े क्षेत्र में फैले जंगलों को संभालना ना कोई आसान काम है ना ही थोड़े लोगों के बस की बात है इसीलिए इन वनों की सुरक्षा 
समर्पित कर्मचारियों का एक प्रबंधकीय तंत्र करता है जिसमें अनुभवी वरिष्ठ अधिकारियों से लेकर जंगलों में गश्ती करने वाले सैकड़ों लोग हैं दिन भर निरंतर काम करने वाले इन अनगिनत ग्रीन सोल्जर्स की कोई पहचान भी नहीं है बिना किसी शोहरत की तमन्ना या सुविधाओं की अपेक्षा के अपने मकसद जंगलों और वन्य प्राणियों की सुरक्षा के लिए सब एकजुट होकर काम में लगे रहते हैं भोर होने से पहले अंधेरे में शुरू होने वाली जंगल की गश्ती कब दोपहर और रात में बदल जाती है यह पता ही नहीं चलता बाघों की लोकेशन पर हर वक्त नजर रखना जल स्रोतों की चेकिंग विद्युत लाइन गश्ती कॉम्बिंग गश्ती प्रपत्रों को भरना कैमरा ट्रैप चेक करना और न जाने कितने ही रोजमर्रा के काम हैं। हमारे ग्रीन सोल्जर्स को जंगलों की रक्षा में सहयोग देते हैं उनके कुछ खास दोस्त गश्ती के दौरान ऐसी जगहें, जहां इंसानों का जाना मुश्किल होता है वहां हाथियों की गश्ती करने वाले महावत बहुत उपयोगी सिद्ध होते हैं इसीलिए तो महावत अपने हाथी का ख्याल अपने परिवार अपने बच्चों से भी ज्यादा रखते हैं हाथियों को नहलाने से लेकर उनका खाना बनाना और उनकी सेहत का ध्यान रखना ये सारे काम महावत और चारा कटर ही करते हैं तभी तो एक अलग ही प्रेम होता है एक हाथी और उसके महावत के बीच जो शायद ही कोई और समझ पाए अगर किसी जानवर द्वारा किसी स्थानीय ग्रामीणों की फसल का नुकसान हो जाए तो जवाबदारियां और भी बढ़ जाती हैं। अंधेरा होते ही शिकारी गतिविधियों में बढ़ने की संभावना भी बढ़ जाती है इसीलिए रात्रि गश्ती के दौरान शिकारियों की गतिविधियों पर खास नजर रखी जाती है सारी रात गश्त करके अपने कैंप लौटते लौटते हमेशा ही भोर होने लगती है 24 घंटे जंगलों में परिवार के बिना रहना और लगातार काम करना अच्छे अच्छों के मनोबल तोड़ने के लिए काफी है पर हमारे ग्रीन सोल्जर्स को हराना आसान काम नहीं है जो दिन रात जंगल में अपनी जान हथेली पर लिए पैदल घूम घूम कर काम करते रहते हैं जगह कैसी भी हो मौसम कैसा भी हो परिस्थितियां कैसी भी हों, ना खाना खाने का कोई वक्त ना पानी पीने की फुर्सत जंगल के पहरेदार अपनी जवाबदारी निभाने से कभी पीछे नहीं हटते और अपने साथियों के साथ जंगल की सुरक्षा में हर वक्त मुस्तैद रहते हैं हमारे ग्रीन सोल्जर्स का वन्य प्राणियों के प्रति प्रेम और बलिदान ही है जो आज ये बेजुबान वन्य जीव अपने घर में स्वतंत्र रूप से फल फूल रहे हैं बदलते मौसमों के साथ जंगल की परिस्थितियां भी बदलती हैं और नई परिस्थितियों में नई नई परेशानियां तो आना इनके लिए आम बात है फिर चाहे बारिश में गिरे पेड़ों को हटाकर गश्ती के लिए रास्ता चालू रखना या भीषण गर्मी के बीच जंगल में लगी आग को बुझाकर जंगल और उसके जीवों की रक्षा करना कभी बाढ़ के पानी में बहकर तो कभी जंगलों की आग को बुझाते हुए जाने कितने जवानों ने जीवन अपना कुर्बान कर दिया है पैदल चलते हुए वन्य प्राणियों का सामना होना और उससे जुड़े हुए खतरे भी कम थोड़े ही हैं। ऐसे जाबाजों की भी कमी नहीं है जो जंगली जानवरों से जानलेवा सामना होने के बावजूद भी आज फिर से उसी जगह पर उन्हीं वन्य प्राणियों की सुरक्षा के लिए फिर से तत्पर हैं। मगर दुर्भाग्य है कि अपने देश की धरोहर जंगल और वन्य प्राणियों को सुरक्षित रखते हुए जिन ग्रीन सोल्जर्स ने अपनी जान गंवा दी उन्हें ना तो शहीदों का दर्जा मिला ना ही उनके परिवार को हम सम्मान दे पाए फिर भी हमारे ग्रीन सोल्जर्स और उनके परिवार एक बहुत ही साधारण सा जीवन जीते हुए हंसते हंसते हमारे जंगलों की सुरक्षा के लिए अपना सर्वस्व दांव पर लगा रहे हैं। इतनी कम सुविधाओं के बावजूद हमेशा ये चेहरे पर एक हल्की सी मुस्कान के साथ हर वक्त अपने जंगल और उसके जीवों के लिए खड़े रहते हैं हमारा सलाम है ऐसे जवानों को जो अपना घर बार छोड़ सारी सुख सुविधाएं छोड़ जंगलों में रहते हुए पूरी निष्ठा और लगन से वन्य प्राणियों की सुरक्षा हेतु सदैव मुस्तैद हैं। हमारी पृथ्वी हमारे जंगल और हमारे लिए प्राण वायु ऑक्सीजन उपलब्ध कराने वाले इन स्वर्ग के प्रहरी वन रक्षकों के हम हमेशा कृतज्ञ रहेंगे
Need a professional website? So thank you, Samir, for that video. Uh, Samir, Abhijit Das, aapko upar lo. सौरभ अभिजीत दास आपको ऊपर लो प्रेजेंटर बनो थैंक यू सो लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन दैट वाज अ स्मॉल वीडियो ऑन हाउ आवर फील्ड ऑफिशियल्स वर्क अंडर डिफिकल्ट कंडीशंस इन द फील्ड बिकॉज यू नो मोस्ट ऑफ यू माइट नॉट बी नोइंग द ड्यूटीज एंड रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज एंड हाउ द फॉरेस्ट डिपार्टमेंट फंक्शन सो वी थॉट दैट वी विल जस्ट शो यू दैट डॉक्यूमेंट्री आई एल बी शेयरिंग द लिंक ऑफ द डॉक्यूमेंट्री ऑल्सो ऑन बोथ हेयर इन द chat box as well as in the uh, whatsapp group uh, so for the next session next session we have a very interesting topic amphibians and reptiles and their conservation status in india and this session is being uh, uh, taken by dr abhijit das scientist c uh, wildlife institute of india dehradun so his academic qualification includes a phd in zoology from utkal university odisha and his masters from uh, guwahati university assam uh he got very much interested in the study of reptiles and amphibians while pursuing his bachelor's degree in zoology so now his primary research interest includes morphological and molecular systematics biogeography and conservation he also wished to initiate herpetofaunal inventory and monitoring program for the protected areas of india to generate information on diversity and endemism his long time research interest lies in understanding evolutionary origin and diversification of the himalayan herpetofauna his area of interest are systematics cladistic biogeography and uh, macro ecology he has several papers uh, published to his uh, credit in national and international peer reviewed journals has attended several seminars at both national and international levels and has also presented papers he is also credited to the rediscovery of several uh, herpetofauna in the country uh, uh, herpetofauna in the country Uh, from various parts of the country and uh, his key publications include a report of a new species of uh, data frynes which is a frog species from the northeast india uh, or it's a toad species from northeast india and uh, um, he has also uh, published papers related to the arunachal macaque its biogeography biology and taxonomy uh, he has also published uh, uh, papers on Uh, several other like the taxonomy and biogeography of kalola species from the eastern india uh, herpetofaunal inventory of barail wildlife sanctuary in assam and uh, uh, spe species of distribution history natural history and distribution of boiga forsteni which is a uh, snake species from odisha and uh, rediscovery of uh, mictopholis austeniana and uh, many several other papers to his credit so with this uh, brief introduction apart from uh, being a very good friend of mine and caspas dehradun as such uh, uh, dr abhijit das they are the participants of the two day online course uh, on conservation issues in india and they are all the uh, highly illuminated and uh, esteemed professors and assistant professors and associate professors from across the country dealing with uh, science subjects so with this brief introduction of the group now uh, over to you dr abhijit das to speak on a topic that very few people speak about so over to you dr abhijit thank you uh, thank you very much sir and uh, am i audible yes yes you are audible and your slides are also visible okay thank you so much and thank you so much for this opportunity and um, yeah i think uh, we are talking to a very uh, uh, like uh, a group of people who are really really important for our uh, con like um, issues related to conservation science science in our country because they uh, teach and they uh, like you know give the first light of um, um, uh, ray of light for the students so i think teachers are very important and that's where um it's like a very special day for me so today i am here to talk about uh, conservation issues related to reptiles and amphibians right 
Uh, now, if you see, um, uh, you have just heard of a topic uh, that is on um, uh, wetlands, right? Now, wetland is a system, but then we are now going to talk about animals that are actually dependent on systems like wetland. And they thus, they are really, really important in the context of uh, system which we talk about like wetland or forest ecosystem or any other ecosystem we talk about. So they are kind of an indicator group of animal that we find them in a particular ecosystem. And when we talk about reptiles and amphibians, they are really, really special because we get some of the very interesting information. One is that they are really old. So we get an information which is really, really old that relates to our biogeographic history and evolution. And second is that because they are ectothermic or cold blooded, what we call them, they are completely related to the temperature and the environmental parameters. So they directly, if you study them, you know about the uh, ecosystem much more better way than in any other animals or uh, any other system. So they are a very good research system and they are also very good uh, in terms of uh, conservation uh, as you see through them. Now, uh, you see when uh, the outline of my talk deals with these few topics, we will see the diversity. That means how many species are there um, in our country, as well as what is their functional diversity per se. Uh, we will also talk about distribution because unless and until we know distribution of a species, we hardly know uh, what are the uh, what are the challenges that a species face in a, in a in a particular area. We will also talk about population, and we need to know about ecology of a species and also the threats. So I feel that these five points are really, really important to uh, to what is called conserve a species. Like if we do not know all those particular information, then we are probably unable to save a species from extinction. For example, if you see this large tortoise, also called Asian giant tortoise, which is found in northeastern hills, uh, although it's a very large species of tortoise and it lives a very long life, almost like uh, human life, as long as a human live, but we hardly know that this, what is the population size of this particular species? What is the ecological condition it fulfills in the northeastern hills? What are the threat, threat? Although it is overexploited, we know, but we do not have quantified the threat of the species. We hardly know distribution of the species, current distribution of the species in northeastern hills. So even if this is the case with a large giant soft shell, uh, giant tortoise, what would be the condition of those tiny, small, little creatures that are come that also comes or uh, that makes almost 80 percent of the reptiles and amphibians diversity? So we are in a very, very difficult phase to actually talk about conservation of reptiles and amphibians. Just now, uh, last year, we have discovered another species of um, uh, the sister species of this tortoise from Arunachal Hills. So it seems that even we do not even understand the diversity within this group also. So we there is a lack and we will talk about those uh, lacuna in our conservation uh, science. So when we talk about amphibians and reptiles, right? So they are two very distinct group of animals. In amphibians, you probably know that they include frogs, toads, salamanders, and Sicilians, right? Now salamanders are a group of animal which just looks like a uh, lizard. Um, and they are only found in the Himalayas, particularly in Eastern Himalaya. In Darjeeling Hills, if you go, you can see a salamander. Or in Manipur, you have salamander. And we have some Sicilians, which just looks like an earthworm. Okay, so they are limbless amphibians. And we have a huge diversity of frogs and toads. 
Now, what is special about amphibians is that amphibians are the biological barometers. They indicate the, uh, you know, the moist uh, condition of the forest, right? So when a frog call, we know that the rain is coming. So they are kind of a very nice indicator species for the ecology, for the environment around us. And the other thing is that they have a semi-permeable skin. So amphibians, if they are get contaminated, they will definitely die because their skin is permeable to a uh, lot of um, um, like a lot of uh, um, uh, harmful chemicals. So they cannot survive in a polluted environment. So they have to be in a different state. So these are certain special thing about amphibians and are the, to make the matter worse, amphibians are anamniotic vertebrates, right? That means their eggs are not within a shell. So their eggs are just open or right like a gelatinous mass. So if there is any pollution in our aquatic system, the amphibian population will be the first of its kind that will go extinct. And the other thing is that half of their life is dependent on water, half of their life on land. So they need both the ecological condition that is land and water to fulfill uh, their life cycle, right? So they are dependent on two different ecosystems. So you have to, if you have a healthy population of amphibians, that means your land and aquatic systems are working very well. Now we have crocodiles. We have a huge diversity of turtles and tortoises, almost 36 species in our country. We have almost 260 species and more counting of uh, lizards that lizards include a diverse group of animals um, like right from our agamid lizards, kings and geckos, so much of diversity in their shape and size. The smallest gecko may be a tiny uh, wall or house lizard to largest varanus monitor lizard, which is uh, we generally see. And uh, we have a huge group of most evolved reptile that is snakes uh, so snakes are something like 320 plus species and we are discovering more species and again we see a very very large diversity in shape and size right from a 10 centimeter uh, long worm snake or the blind snake to a huge um, 20 feet long python or 18 feet long king cobra so these are uh, the shape uh, diversity of uh, this particular group they are very very important ecologically because they are both predator and prey in an ecosystem and um, they are very much related to their habitat where they live so these are few things that i want to just uh, flag here they are ectotherms that means their blood is not cold but their body temperature is dependent on external source okay so they need to bask in the morning sun to get uh, their uh, body heat or the energy and uh, that's why their life is in a very low energy demand okay so it seems like uh, when there is a harsh winter say for example now uh, all the animals say birds and mammals they have to migrate from higher elevation to lower elevation right but for reptiles and amphibians they will shut their system and they just go for what is called what we call as uh, hibernation right so i mean in that six month or four month of period they will not eat anything they will just be at one place they will not move so their maintenance cost is very very less but what is important for them, for them is temperature and moisture which is which is a very very crucial ecological factor for them which govern their diversity and distribution and they are also very, very important for ecosystem functioning and how that we will know later. Right. Um, so when we talk about diversity, that means uh, how many species are there in a particular area or particular ecosystem or a particular landscape. That's we, when we are talking about diversity and we know that herpetofaunal that is reptiles and amphibians diversity is really, really high in places like Western Ghats or in places like, like 
uh, northeastern India, but then there are also say central Indian landscape, which is which is not so much diverse in terms of their species, but then there are some very unique species like those species who learn to live in a very, very harsh summer condition. And there some of the species like geckos, snakes, they got diversified more in drier areas rather than in wet areas, right? So every area has their endemic species. So when we talk about this diversity, we are actually trying to uh, address what is called as linear shortfall. So linear shortfall is nothing but if you have species that are going extinct without being documented. So that is called a tragedy of nameless extinction. That's where what is called a linear shortfall after Carolus Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy. So that's, I mean, so our mandate or our aim should be that we should know our species at least before, at least we should know those species before they at least go extinct. And that is where is a big, big question. Still, we have not completed the complete inventory of our biodiversity in many areas, particularly in places like Northeastern India, where there are hundreds and thousands of uh, area, forested landscape are being cleared, dammed, developed, polluted, and you know, um, uh, forests are being uh, cleared. So all these area are also losing the biodiversity, which is not known. So as a responsible citizen or as a biologist or as 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 a part as a as a responsible person who is who care about biodiversity, our first roles now become is that go to those area and conduct biological survey or inventory so that we can document the species which um, otherwise will never been documented before their destruction, right? So this is what we is why I call as conservation goal number one. That is knowing the species to stop nameless extinction. Now, this is really, really poor. If we talk about our protected areas, although we have a very good uh, system for protecting our larger mammals, birds, but then when it comes to smaller animals, particularly reptiles, amphibians, insects, there is hardly this detailed inventories are available. So even if tiger is doing very well and you know there is a pollution in a particular environment parameter happening or a water aquatic system is being uh, some kind of perturbed, so the frog population may go extinct and we will not know even in the best protected area because we do not know them because we do not have inventory those area and we do not know what kind of species are occurring there. So that's a very, very serious issue even in our best protected areas also. And that is where we, we need interventions, right? But then it's not only about species that we are talking about. We, there are so many different aspects of diversity and we just see a little bit of it, right? So for example, every night during monsoon season, when you go in the forest, you will see that frogs are calling, right? And this looks really, really beautiful. All the 400 species of frogs and toads will have a different kind of distinct and different kind of call. And that's why they attract their female. Egg-bound females will approach to the best male and they will make what is called amplexus, okay? So amplexus means male and female. There may be, because females are precious, so there may be some amplexus where multiple male will come with one female, or maybe uh, some males are really, really tiny, like this one. Some may be equal size, and there are multiple ways that they make this amplexus. We call them reproductive modes, right? So here it's full of satellite males and this frog, they make a foam nest, right? So the eggs are within a foam nest. And here, if you see the amplexus, the male is grabbing the female on the neck region, okay? Or axilla region. Here, the male is grabbing the frog on the, the hip region, right? So these are all very, very different within the species and they have evolved for a particular cause. So the egg laying place, the amplexus type or 
they are all different and that's where we need to document them. For example, if a particular frog only gives eggs in a tree hole and then that particular microhabitat is not available or getting destroyed, then that species will also go extinct, right? Some species give eggs only in the stream. Some species give uh, eggs in the pools or pond. Some species hang their eggs on the leaf above water. So all this microhabitat we need to know to protect those biodiversity. And that's what is our challenge. So we have to know about reproductive diversity also. And then where they lay their eggs. As I told, amphibians, eggs are always uh, uh, like they do not have an egg shell like reptiles. So their eggs are open. So if there is a difference in humidity or temperature, so the eggs will dry off and they will all die, right? So they need particular microclimatic condition to, to hatch or to grow. So those are, we need to know to protect them, that beautiful diversity of frogs and toads. So that's we call as reproductive diversity that we need to know. But then it's not only about adult frogs like 400 species of frogs and toads and salamander sicilians, all of them have a larval life. So if you need to know about amphibians, it's not only we need to know about adults because half of their life is in water, right? So we have different kind of um, frogs, tadpoles. They may be in po pools, ponds, they may be in fast flowing streams, they may be in shallow water. There may be some tadpoles that feed during where their larval stage, some will not feed, okay? So some will be in the tree holes, some may be in, in, in the rocky crevices. So very, very different lifestyle. And according to their lifestyle, their morphology is, is being uh, evolved. <clears throat> For example, if you see this tadpole, it's a very elaborate mouth part, and there is a sucker in the belly region. So what is the prediction? So that this is a tadpole that lives in the very fast flowing water. So with that sucker, it cling or stuck itself on the rocks of the stream. Okay, and so the water current will not take it away. Similarly, this tadpole with a, without any ventral sucker or on without any elaborate mouth arrangement, this particular tadpole can only live in the pool section of the stream. It cannot go anywhere else. So if we modify the ecosystem of the stream, a small stream, so all these morphotypes will also get destroyed, right? So we have to maintain the diversity within the habitat to, to see the diversity within the animal group. And that's how we study them. And there is an enormous amount of opportunity to do conduct research on these kind of areas and, and you know, make students small, small projects so that students also get an interested in all these things. And they are easy, just that you need to go to field to observe them. Now, we uh, almost covered the diversity in nutshell, but then we need to talk about distribution, the number two in our agenda. Now, we need to know distribution of a species to save a species or conserve a species. So how common or how rare they are, okay? Now, there is this concept of EOO or extent of occurrence. And there is also a concept called AOO or area of occurrence. So what is that EOO? So if a species are distributed across a landscape like those rounds ones, these are distribution of the species recorded. Now, if you draw a outline polygon across all these dots, then you got a UEOO, that is extent of occurrence of a particular species. But within that extent of occurrence, the species actual occurrence may be really, really small. There may be really, really small dots available. For example, here species is distributed, here a species is distributed, all this, and there these are separated by a huge city growth, or they are separated by a road network. They are separated by a railway track. So they are all fragmented, right? So the species from here cannot move here, here individual cannot move. So actually the, the 
this is a source and the others are if they are sink the slowly slowly species will go extinct from all those smaller patches and it will only remain in a larger one single patch so area of occurrence is also very important and that's where we are lagging behind we do not know area of occurrence of particular species and that's why we call it as wallacy and shortfall when we do not know distribution of a species in a better way we actually uh, face what is called a wallacy and shortfall and that's what i call it as a conservation goal number two okay so Conservation goal one is diversity. Conservation goal two is knowing distribution of a particular species. Now I give you an example here. Now you see this is a little very small, uh, almost like um, yeah, two centimeter to three centimeter big little tiny frog. OK, so there is an IUCN on which we decide we depend on most for most for most of our conservation action right now. This frog is found everywhere in, in India, everywhere. Like if you see this whole yellow thing, that's the distribution or EOO of the species. But then we asked a question that, is it actually microhyla ornata everywhere in our in country? So let's do a DNA based study. So we collected DNA samples from almost everywhere in our country. And when we looked into the phylogeny or the uh, the barcoding of the species, then we found a very, very different story. And what we found is this, that actually the microhyla ornata is the red dots are only distributed in the southern part of our country. OK, so in IUCN, if you see it's everywhere, so it is least concerned. But when we saw microhyla ornata is only in the southern part, so the range has almost restricted to, I mean, almost 70%, 75% of the range, total range has been restrict, uh, gone now and is now only restricted to a little smaller portion of southern India, which makes the species as a much, much threater, threatened category than just uh, least concerned species, right? So these are called cryptic species and there are so many species are like this that we morphologically identify them and which is not correct. So there, there may be actually the species range is very, very less, but because they are just look similar, we say them they are found everywhere, but that may not be the case. So now if uh, in conservation case, if even if the southern India population go extinct, we will not care because we otherwise know that it is distributed everywhere in India. We don't bother about this population, but then this is the actual population. If this population go extinct, the species yeah. go extinct because in other part of India, these are all different other species. So that's why conserving cryptic species is a challenge for us, and that's where yeah. we need integrated taxonomic approach to know the diversity, right? So only the morphology based traditional way of identifying species is not enough now. So we need to define distribution of the species based on molecular evidence. Right, but that's about a small species and you may say that, OK, small species is too difficult to deal with. So let's deal with a little larger species or even a very, very threatened species. This is a yellow tortoise, which is also called Sal forest tortoise found in uh, Tarai region as well as in northeastern hills. Now this species is very, very special, although it has a very, very large range right from Southeast Asia all the way through Northeast India comes up to Uttarakhand, right? It's a very large range for a species. But the problem is that this tortoise is a very long generation time, so it needs very long time to mature or to breed. OK, and the second problem is that it lays a very small clutch size, only two to three eggs. So one is long generation time. Second is that very small clutch size and a species that is exploited across its range. Whenever people see them, they just kill them, right? So even if the species is distributed everywhere in Orissa, Northeast India, Uttarakhand, and even Bihar, UP, everywhere, 
but actually if you see the AOO of the species, it's actually very, very highly fragmented. The population is severely fragmented, only surviving in some of the protected area because outside protected area, the species is gone and we have modeled its distribution with a very important threat that they face across their range that is called forest fire. So when we saw when we overlapped the forest fire with the distribution range of the species, we have found that almost 30% of the area of the species is actually having high intensity fire. And because fire, they are tortoises, they're slow moving and fire can actually kill them or they destroy their habitat. So in that way, this species may go extinct from even of our protected area also. And the other point is that the, the, the species is only found in 8% uh, protected areas across its range. So it's a very, very less chance that you know, the species is protected within a protected area, but the most majority of the distribution of the species is outside protected area. So a species which is critically endangered in IUCN criteria is neither protected within our protected area because of fire and the population within protected area is really, really small. Uh, so it's mostly outside protected area. So, in case of reptiles and amphibians, we need to know have a really different approach uh, to, you know, uh, conserve them, right? Because our protected areas are largely mammal centric or important bird centric, right? Uh, we have always given over emphasis to those animals, but then there are animals they are equally threatened prone to extinction and even larger threat they are facing. So we have to also take into consideration of these animals when we design our protected areas, right? But the third point is uh, after distribution, we need to know about population. Unless and until we know population, we can't have a managerial intervention because the managers always ask you a question that do you have the numbers to save the species. What is the number of this species? Because we know number of tiger exactly. We know the number of leopard. We know the number of GIB. We know number of many, many species. But when it comes to python, king cobra, or a very critically endangered yellow tortoise, or, or many other species, we do not have the number with us, right? That, that's a very big problem. Now, for population, knowing population, which is a crucial for the species, uh, for conserving a species. But then for reptiles and amphibia, we need to take a little different approach. We have to go to the habitat centric approach to know the number uh, within a habitat. For example, these reptiles and amphibians, they mostly live in the forest floor, in a tropical forest. They are, they are innovated in the forest floor. Right. So they will be there in the buttresses of the tree. That's a very, very favorable micro habitat. Now I have used a term called micro habitat. Now to know reptiles and amphibia population, you have to now concentrate in the micro habitat of the species. You cannot go with a habitat centric approach. So you have to come down to smaller scale. So you for you buttress is a microhabitat. So what is the population of reptiles or amphibians species or kind of group as a community within the buttress microhabitat in a rainforest? Then the second question may be, what is the population of amphibians in the forest floor? Okay, because forest floor again as a one habitat parameter. And then in the right side, if you see one stream for, for us, it's just a stream, but for amphibians, or reptiles, it's not just a stream. It this stream is consist of many, many microhabitats. For example, within this stream, you have the water which is trickling down from more than one meter height, so that these regions are called cascade region. Now, within the stream, there is a region which water is not fast flowing. It makes a very deep pool after a cascade. So we call it pool within a stream. So that's a different microhabitat. Then on the side of the stream, there is a very large rock 
which we can't move. It's a very large rock we call it bedrock. Now this bedrock provide hiding space, breeding space, egg laying space for fish, for frogs, for many aquatic animals. So bedrocks are very, very special microhabitat, right? And then on the two side, you have riparian vegetation. So they are also habitat for microhabitat for other species. So within one stream ecosystem, we have multiple microhabitats where multiple species, which are only specific to those particular microhabitat, they survive. So cascade region, different frogs, pool region, different frog, riparian region, different frog. So you need to see and go there and count their numbers in different habitat microhabitat in that way so that's our challenge it's not about only one habitat you have to go to microhabitat to know their population so how do you do that now that's really challenging but then that's also possible if we just have a little out of box thinking for example some frogs have unique body pattern like this one particularly found in our Uttarakhand has a unique body markings all over so what we have done we have just gone in the streams in the night time and we just photographed the frogs from a distance we did not disturb them at all we just photographed that at any angle where they are they are just on the rocks we just click the photograph and this frog is very special because this leaves only in the cascade section of the stream so that's why this frog has very large disc right so very large disc on the finger and well, very heavy webbing on the hind limb. So that makes that this frog can stay against the first flowing water current, right? So those discs give them support. So this frog, we just photographed them. And then we came out with all this hun many hundred photographs, almost 800 photographs. Then it's a really, really large number. And our question is, can we identify individual frogs based on those spots? So then we used a software called Hotspotter software. There are multiple software available. For tigers, we use one, right? So those softwares are there. They use algorithm to say that which frog is different and which frog is not. So those softwares can be used and then those softwares can be verified by your own observation to make sure that what software has identified for you can actually is is true based on your own human intelligence. So it's very, very easy, very, very non-invasive, and you can actually come up with the number or population of this particular cascade frog in 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 particular stream so that's it's even citizen science or common public can do this just need to go in the night and photograph them come back and analyze and you just count how many frogs you got right so that's the number you have created so that's very important because this frog is a direct indicator of cascade microhabitat of the stream now if this number is declining over the years then we know that the cascade section of the stream is being hampered for something. If we make a small check dam, the, the whole stream ecosystem, the cascade will convert to pools and the, the, this frog, particular frog will go extinct from there because this has evolved to the cascade section of the stream. So that's where you need the number, right? So we have published the paper and you can just get this paper from any online media. So uh, it's called a reliable field method for individual identification of this frog. And you can, there are multiple species with this kind of pattern, which is possible like pythons. Pythons have unique body marking, Russell's viper, saw scale viper, many, many snakes, but snake is difficult because yeah, it needs to have a different statistical approach to get their density and number. So, we come to the fourth point that is ecology. So we have now discussed about diversity, distribution. Then we have also talked about their population. And the fourth is ecology. How much we know about the ecology of the species. Now, um, I think we our knowledge is very, very poor. And in case of knowing ecology of reptiles and amphibians is challenging, but 
I tell you that if somebody can, uh, you know, uh, somebody want to study ecology is really interesting and somebody can get really, really good information about the 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 species and its association with the intricate association with the habitat or microhabitat it occupies. So in I call it as a conservation goal number three to know ecology of the species. Now there are multiple aspects of ecology. We may need to know about species ecology. We need to know about movement ecology and we also need to know about thermal ecology. That's uh, it's my priority list of ecology. For example, because amphibians and reptiles are thermally constrained all the time because they are ectothermic vertebrate. So we need to know about their thermal ecology too. And without knowing movement ecology, that means how much a animal move. It's a very, very important category to save a species. For example, we know the home range of tiger. We know exactly how much a tiger move daily, seasonally, or what is the home range size of a female, male. We know everything. So that's why we are able to save a tiger. And that's why we can design our protected area. Tiger is a, we can design that if, uh, if this protected area with the 500 square kilometer can hold this many male tigers. So that only this decision only depends on movement ecology, right? So similar thing is in case of frogs and toads when are making dams, when are making check dams. So we need to know how much these frogs move so that we can stop or arrest the destruction of those microhabitat which they need for their daily movement, right? So for example, I give you this example of a little small skink lizard from northeastern India. Again, a very, very special lizard. I mean, this is one lizard that lives in water. It's like a crocodile, very small, tiny. It's almost like a full, uh, it's like size of uh, 20 centimeter. And that whenever you disturb, it just jumps in, in the mountain streams of northeast, right? So very special we do and our although it's special and the only species known from India, we do not even know whether this lizard lay eggs or give live birth. OK, so the basic information is not, no, not known. What it eats, we have no idea. And these are thousands of species in North in our India. We do not even basic knowledge about what they eat, what they do or even do they lay eggs or give live birth, right? So these are some questions to ponder. And I think there are enormous scope for researchers, students to take up this studies of ecology of species and, and their habitat, right? I give you an example of this movement ecology, what I want to say, and that's why they are so special. That's a very large frog called Nenorana vicina. Uh, and it's found in the Himalayan waters, particularly in Western Himalaya. If you just go to Masori, you will find this frog in the streams. Very large frog, right? Um, it's 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 very very large, almost like 200 grams of weight of one frog. So we wanted to know the, uh, how much this frog move, because that's very important. Because this frog, we have always seen it. It's in the stream ecosystem. So for that, we put transmitter on this frog, a little small transmitter on the hip region, and we let the frog go. Then we have come up with a very, very interesting result. After tracking them for more than some individual for more than 90 days, someone for 100 days, we have found that this particular frog actually does not move anything away from the stream. See this graph here. That is the distance away from the stream. So you see if at a zero distance that is within the stream. The most of the movement of the frog is within the stream. And as the as we are going away from the stream, the movement of the frog is diminishes. That means the frog is restricted only to the stream. Now, if we are making a small check dam, on the stream, that means the frog will not take a land route to go from one place to another. So it has to always use the stream water. 
but then there is a barrier now. So the two population of a frog within a small stream will get separated. They will never meet. And that's why the inbreeding depression or uh, the phenomenon of destruction happens and the population will die off. So that's what is happening. This, that's where ecological information is going to help us a lot in saving those very, very important indicator species. Another experimental study that we have done. I mean, our question was that, is there any climate change? Everybody shouts about climate change, but then is there, can it impact the frogs? For that, we have gone to Western Himalaya as well as in Eastern Himalaya in Sikkim area. And this is a small instrument. It's a infrared gun it has. So it's a thermal gun. So if you press this button, it, there is a ray goes, infrared goes, and it uh, hit the surface of your body or anything and gives the temperature here. Okay, so you can get the body temperature basically. So what we have done is that every night we went in the forest and we have walked along the stream. And whenever we saw a frog, we just made that gun on the body. And then we have found a very, very interesting pattern. OK, so we have found that the frogs of Sikkim Himalayan region has a very, very narrow temperature uh, range, uh, body temperature range, which is within 15 to 20 degrees centigrade, right? So within that centigrade, these frogs operate during their breeding season. Like there is a frog here, Scutiger sikkimensis, which is always found beyond 3000 meter elevation. This frog always has a very low temperature, but the frogs, mostly the stream frogs of Himalaya, they operate at a very, very narrow temperature range. So if there is a change, climate change or temperature change happening, so this is a guild of frog, that is the stream frog that may go extinct very, very fast because their temperature tolerance limit is very, very less. So this kind of hard data we need to actually conclusively say that, yes, climate change may impact the species which are really tiny and they are indicator of ecosystem. So last point, and that's where we probably, um, you know, the conservation challenge uh, is the fifth uh, number five is threats. The problem is that we know threats. We know that all species are threatened from blah, 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 habitat loss, population decline, or deforestation, but they are hardly quantified. That's the problem. We do not exactly know how these threats are operating within a population. So there are two aspects of these threats in conservation biology. That's called, one is declining population paradigm. That means there is an impact happening and the population is declining. So these are what are the factors that leads to declining population that are habitat loss, over exploitation, maybe climate change, pollution. There are invasive species coming up these days. So all this will make one species decline. But once a population decline to a very, very bad state, then that population goes into what is called small population paradigm. So small population paradigm we have already, which uh, actually face this threat of inbreeding and metapopulation dynamics, the problem of inbreeding. Now, if uh, this would have been a one-to-one -one class, then I would have asked some species which are declining population or small population paradigm. But I can give you some example, like declining population paradigm examples are plenty. For example, we have tigers, we have elephants, we have so many other species where habitats are being lost. There, there may be some over exploitation, some may be poached, and there are so many other things. So most of the species we encounter are declining population. But then there are already some population which has reached to a small population paradigm. And for to save small population paradigm, we do not have any time left. We need to just go directly for captive breeding program or maintaining their genetic stock or maintaining their genetic vigor. For example, great Indian bustard, for example, gharial, for example, some species of turtles and tortoises, which are only few are in numbers. So these are small population. We need not to go for their habitat protection now because now we have to just know that, you know, the, the 
the genetic heterozygosity to be maintained. So small population paradigm, we have very limited chance to experiment, but declining population paradigm, we have a lot of chance for research. We have to know what kind of habitat, what kind of exploitation these animals are facing. So these two always remember and try to place your species in these two parameters or paradigm to see what kind of intervention you will need, right? So I just give you some example. For example, those large bodied soft shell turtles, they again live a very long life. They can weigh up to 70 or 80 kilogram weight. They are they, they lay more than 100 eggs. They are really, really large animal, but we have no idea about their ecology, biology, breeding place, or where they lay their nest. Um, they may lay eggs in the sandy area, then dogs and dogs in our streets, they go and they eat their eggs, the Finnish population of those turtles. So most of the soft shell turtles are threatened with extinction now and they are overexploited by people also. And then there are a lot of hard shell species, almost 16 in our country. They are also eaten. The females are much larger in size. The so females are eaten. So the important breeding stock goes off from a population. And there are small tiny ones, the juveniles ones, that we use them for pet trade. So they are, one way they are covered, that means we do not know about them, and then they are exploited. So that's a very fantastic recipe for extinction. One is not knowing them and one is exploiting them. So we are actually, uh, you know, species may go extinct from our rivers and streams without actually any of our idea. So there is a challenge to save them. And that's where more and more and more information is what we need to save the species. Then I give you this example. We have four monitor lizard species in our country. And one problem with this monitor lizard is that they are highly traded. They are traded for their skin. Their skins are used for, to make bags, for vanity bags, for shoes. Recently, we got a huge consignment from Goa um, about all this uh, reptile articles from shoes to belts to jackets to caps. Everything is from monitor lizard and python skin. So they are overexploited, right? But the problem is that majority of the population of those monitor lizard, although they are in schedule one species, but they live outside protected area. So that's the problem. So we need to have, uh, you know, strong implementation of our awareness activities as as well as our legal activities actions, not only within protected, but also outside protected area. And that's where it's the need of the hour. And that's where uh, teachers come say, plays a very important role to aware people, aware students, so that they go everywhere and teach people about the adversities of such such exploitation. We also uh, there are new threats coming up and they are flooded now. Nowadays there are a lot of people rescuing snakes, which is a very very good idea to help snake which are coming inside our uh, houses. It's a novel cause. Thousands and thousands of snakes are being rescued and released. But the problem is that the way people rescue snake, because uh, some in some case, they are rescued in a very bad way, like in this, if you see with the bottle, unprofessional. So there is a chance that either the snake will get injured or the person may get beaten, which is a dangerous case. And then the problem will be with snake then. Uh, yeah, then we have proper rescue. Like uh, in this case, if you see, um, we try to rescue animals. But then the problem is they are rescued in a way that uh, if you see they are using tongs and snake being a very long bodied animal, all the internal organ of the snake is inside very long so they almost cover the whole length of the body so if you use tongs like this and hold a snake very tight like this there will be definitely an internal injury so the snake will look fine because we do not understand them and the snake will do not make a noise or they they generally do not cry which which gets our attention so we, we will find that the snake is okay we'll release in the forest 
the snake will go but after 2 3 days it will die because it has it is a predator it must hunt to get its prey so thousands and thousands of snakes may be dying in this way through internal injury so what we need to do is that we need a lot of training particularly from forest department side so that you know we can use proper techniques tools and we handle snake without catching them right we use we handle snake with proper equipment and release them at a at a designated particular place with the help of forest department definitely so these are certain things are need of the hour to take uh, gather our attention and obviously the last and the foremost uh, problem now we are facing is roads there are linear infrastructures are being developed thousands many many thousands uh, or kilometers of road and networks are coming up and they are becoming real real killer for us right that's a really really big problem now the pr one thing is that one question we can ask scientifically that why reptiles die so much on the road the answer is that reptiles are thigmotherms thigmotherms means the animal that take heat by the body surface so if you see snakes in the night time most of the snakes that comes out in the night time like pythons like crates like cat snakes so all these nocturnal snake they find this road going through forest uh, black tar road as a very hot surface so they come on the road to get the heat of the surface so that's why snakes die mostly on the road or on the railway track similarly in case of frogs or for any other reptiles there is different phase of their movement like after the rainy season during when they lay their eggs and just after the uh, when the rainy season starts so the little babies will come out or juveniles will come out from those eggs uh, in frogs it is in thousands so this juveniles has to move move or disperse from their natal site so they have to disperse as far as possible so the more they disperse the more they successfully disperse their gene right but that is not happening because of road because road creates barrier for those dispersal and in adults they have to migrate for example in case of snakes just after the onset uh, onset of rainy season the male we have to move a lot to find a female then after mating female had to move a lot to lay her eggs in a very good place and the third is that when the eggs has the juvenile has to move a lot to feed and grow so there is a different phase in their movement pattern right and they are all different so all this movement ends up having more and more road kills in our area and they are very very heartening to say that during rainy season you may see hundreds of snakes are dead on our roads which are passing through our protected area and scenes like this are very very common the largest snake a python which takes so much of time to grow to a large size they are just smashed at one go so we are losing our species uh, in a much faster rate than actually we can think of so what is the way ahead for us uh, in a very very nutshell i want to just in for uh, flag this issues of few things like we have to identify critical habitat like critical habitat by which i mean the breeding habitat where those amphibians or reptiles are occurring for example they may be um, uh, uh, they may be a stream right a forest stream where they breed or they may be a place where king cobra make a nest okay so like those nesting place or those critical habitats may be just like a basking spot for turtles so where every day turtles come in the morning they bask and they go down in the water so even basking place is a critical habitat for them and this kind of small micro habitats are never mapped in our management plan so there is a time now that we have to map those important critical habitat within our management plan so that managers know about them and help managers go and save those critical habitats for betterment of life of the whole biodiversity as a whole then we have to have a conservation action which is informed with that means if we are rescuing animal we need to have a scientific backup to know that how 
in what way we need to do this and where to again release them what will be the best habitat for these animals so we need to have scientific information within conservation act to to have a conservation action and with the last this thing i i uh, stop here is that we always hear that landscape approach is the best for conservation nowadays in our country we have to take landscape approach as a whole but i say that to save the smaller animals or those species which are largely indicator to mic microhabitat in ecosystem we have to come back to ecosystem approach rather than landscape approach because that's where ecosystems are the evolutionary unit and eco ecosystems actually made our species because species evolved within an ecosystem so we have to if we want to save those species we have to save those ecosystem and how we save those ecosystem by knowing them better right so that is my message and thank you very much for listening to me if there is any question then i can take thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Thank Abhijit. Uh, as usual, your presentation is, uh, you know, uh, just outstanding. The topic itself is such uh, interesting and lots of mysteries are, you know, cleared by your presentation every time. So I request the participants to kindly interact and uh, clarify any doubts that you might be having or share your experiences also. Well, uh, there is a question in the chat box. A good and interesting uh, talk by Dr. Abhijit. My question is, is there any possibility of documentation of flora and fauna from all private and small scale construction as we have already EIA and EMP for all mega and minor government controlled developmental constructions? I think uh, this question we will take separately. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Vikas Pal Singh. Uh, uh, Dr. Abhijit, you would have you have some uh, comments to take you to take this question. Um, well, I sh um, I should say this. Yes, um, it's also important to have a overall inventory. As I said, that uh, Herpetofauna is one group of animal, which uh, uh, their important species are also distributed outside our protected areas. So even small estate or small private firms also holds an important population of some species. For example, I give um, in uh, Munar region in Kerala and in many of the South, South Indian uh, states, a large proportion yeah. of those endemic species, uh, Western Ghat endemic species lives in the T states also. So uh, if there is a uh, ecological study or biological studies need to be conducted, we need to actually have a, we can have a comparison between the ecology of the tea state species and ecology of the Shola grassland species. So that's what we can do. And that's where uh, we can also make a lot of uh, interesting interventions. Uh, so I, I should, I say yeah. that, yes, we should go about inventory or biodiversity estimation, even in private areas outside protected area. Uh, Hello. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good afternoon. First of all, uh, uh, congratulations and thank you, Dr. Das, for a wonderful session. Thank you. It has been very informative. I just wanted to know, uh, you have shown us the data from IUCN and yes. you mentioned about the uh, frog species, Microhyla omata. Yeah. So I just wanted to know, uh, do you go further and get the data rectified in IUCN? or that yes. will be at later stage yeah so this because this paper is published already so um, in the next assessment of iucn uh, this will be considered and this species will be removed from the least uh, uh, what is that least concern species to at least one of the threat category which may be either vulnerable all the way up so that depends i mean definitely this will be done in iucn next time Okay, thank you.
Thank you, sir. Janet Sony ne never have learned so much about snakes, about these frogs. I have suddenly developed not only an interest in them, but also ensuring that as much as protection which can be given to them, looking after them, helping them to live is a responsibility which all human must. Thank you very much. Very educative, very informative. Thank you, sir. Uh, P. Vg, Assistant Professor of Zoology, uh, says that the real assessment of both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem quality depends on amphibians and reptiles. Is there any conservation project practiced like the one for the higher animals? Um, thank you so much for your uh, concern and the question also. Um, yes, we do not have a nationwide conservation plan like Project Tiger or Project Elephant as of now going in our country. But then um, that's where this opportunity lies because then the in because we do not have a national program or national pro uh, project, that the opportunity lies with these young yeah. students and researcher to generate information from their respective area. And that's where, you know, actual contribution may come with from a much diverse crowd. So I feel that uh, frogs and toads and snakes, they are just in our backyard. And if we really want, we can generate very important biological information uh, by just having a different way of looking at them. Uh, one study I can just recommend, which is very, uh, very easy, particularly in in, main, in all the areas in India, in the nighttime frogs call. So you just need to go with a call recorder equipment and go and sit without disturbing the frog and just record the call of the frog. And you come back and you analyze the call and you find out the difference of call between multiple animals, the size of the animal and how the call varies. So that again helps you create a biodiversity acoustics library at one point of time if you do it with uh, multiple year. So opportunities are huge with this group of animal. And that's where uh, I think we uh, we um, we have a lot of scopes for youngsters. Can I speak, sir? Yeah. Uh, this idea is absolutely great that you can just sit with a recorder and uh, record that and it can be analyzed. And I'm sure that uh, being so deeply involved in these studies, you have n number of such ideas. So yeah. is it possible for yeah. you that on your website or somewhere on your institute website, you list out these ideas so yes. that everyone has access to them and we can encourage our students to do these. They can actually do it as a combined joint project and have fun in learning. Yes. So yes. It can be of great help. So please don't keep these ideas with you. <laughs> Disseminate them. Yeah, I will definitely try to disseminate as much as possible. But if you really want to know some, have some literature, like uh, recently we have published a book on amphibians of India, uh, and it, it covers all the research work that has been conducted in amphibians in our country. So I can definitely, I'll be happy to share those files and uh, books, uh, PDF at least with you. And, please do. Uh, please do. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll be very interested. Please do yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, please, Dr. Abhijit, please kindly share that so that yes. uh, you know, it reaches the maximum in our country. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid uh, says that it's a nice and wonderful presentation. What about the extent of pollution and niche shifting among amphibians? Well, uh, yes, that's uh, one very interesting thing, very important question. So you asked about uh, niche shifting, right? So uh, we do not have conclusive evidence uh, for this kind of movement across the elevational gradient, if you say. But it seems that amphibians or reptiles in, in, in per se, they are so much associated with their habitat conditions or microhabitat condition, as I tried to explain, 
is that it is very highly unlikely that species that are endemic or are microhabitat specialist they will go for a niche shifting the only problem only thing happened would be probably is that only species which are widespread or common uh, for example species like common cobra or russell's viper or saw scale viper or even rat snakes or few other snakes which are very widespread or some frogs such as common toad or um, bullfrog so those species which are widespread they are likely to shift and occupy more and more niches but when it comes to endemic and range restricted species it is highly unlikely that they will shift the niche rather they will prefer to die with a change in the ecosystem so that's the challenge so we need to understand which are the species which are restricted and which are the species which are widespread and then we accordingly uh, go on our um, conservation action for example in andaman and nicobar island the hoplobetrachus or the bullfrog has become a serious invasive species so it is eating all our native frogs of andaman which are endemic so these are the issues um, that we have to address now with uh, changing ecological conditions ns srinidhi asks uh, sir can any first aid be given for the injured reptiles by the time rescuers come um actually that's uh, um that's a little tricky because if we do not know uh, and i should say that yes we know very little about the reptile uh, veterinary care in our country so far but then we should not uh, go for treating those animals by our own but uh, even rescuers also cannot treat uh, a reptile so the reptile has to be taken care of by a trained veterinarians and that our forest department or our government system they have uh, veterinary officers which can deal with those problems but what uh, is important is that uh, if there is a snake in a, in a, in a, in yeah. our house or something so we just need to uh, have some restraint and you know just let the snake there for some time so that it it doesn't move much it doesn't create or doesn't go in a very difficult place where when a rescue comes he pulls on the snake gets an injury so we need to take care of that thing like you know prevention is better than cure so we have to take care of those smaller issues uh, so that the reptiles should not get an injury or does not get an injury so that the second option does not even come so i feel that a proper rescue practice is a very very important uh, tool to safeguard or um, uh, to have our healthy reptiles back to the wild yeah thank you thank you and uh... Dr. Richa Sharma asks, how much climate shifting is responsible in habitat destruction? How to rebuild habitat that is lost? Uh, that's a very tricky question. But yes, uh, as I told, uh, in Himalaya, there are um, uh, there are papers, there are research outputs already being uh, um, uh, seen that there is a major change in vegetations. For uh, uh, for the climate change phenomenon, but for um, Himalaya, we are just important. Uh, we are now just creating the database for the elevational gradient of the reptiles and amphibians. So we cannot uh, recreate the destroyed habitat as of now. But now we are just populating our data set with the species richness curve across the elevation range, so that after we create those graphs, we actually can know that. Uh, these are the species at this elevation so that you know uh, if there is a decline in species number or population then we can report and we can accordingly take care of it so as of now we we have i think in our country we have not gone for any recreating uh, habitat but it has been done in some other area like in yellowstone national park the best protected area of uh, of the world uh, as people say 
uh, although it's the best protected area, but almost 50% of their amphibians have gone extinct from Yellowstone National Park. And they have attributed this to climate change because there is a data set of almost 30 years was available for them. So they were monitoring amphibians for almost 30 years there. And then they found that the population of 50% frog has gone extinct. So then they have uh, recreated wetlands, recreated ponds, for their breeding, as well as they have uh, tried to identify or artificially, uh, they have um, captive bred amphibians and released them back in the forest. So those are certain issues that we now need to deal with. Thank you. Uh, Sri Kiran Thomas from uh, asks, uh, you were mentioning about population estimation yes, is pertinent for herpetofauna. According to you, which methodology fits well? Well, uh, population estimation uh, is um, is crucial, I should say, but it's at the same time challenging also for reptiles and amphibians. But if you say um, amphibians, still it is uh, slightly better because amphibians are uh, gives you many clues to you know they're easier to find in the forest because you can follow their call and you can find a frog and you can record that frog. So sometimes it depends on the question you ask. One is that you, if you are interested in relative abundance, then one, uh, one method called visual encounter survey, that is one hour, uh, one hour dedicated survey for frogs or whatever animal, target animal you have. So that is called visual encounter survey. So that you do for one hour. And if that one hour, two person is taking part in, in this one hour survey, so it becomes two man hour. So two men, man hour, how many frogs you are getting. So that's the relative abundance you get. But if you are interested in absolute abundance, then you have to go for a mark recapture study. So for mark recapture study, what we do is that if a frog has a pattern, then it is good. Uh, you can photograph then an ID. If a frog does not have it, then there is a challenge and that's where you need to put artificial tags. For example, there is a there is a elastomer tag which is available, which is called visual implant elastomer tags. So with that tags, you can spot the frog and get their number in the forest. So that tag is again, it's a biodegradable. So after a few months, the tag will disappear. But during your study, it will help you ID the individual. So there are multiple methods. I should say the mark recapture technique will be the best for uh, population estimation. Yes. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, can I have a question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, sir, actually, uh, snakes are such a scary and poisonous creature, although we uh, know very well that 90% of the snakes, they are non-poisonous. Yeah. Uh, but they are so scary that at once, uh, on seeing it, the first thing comes to our mind that uh, just to uh, kill it. So yeah. are there any morphological features by which we can say that it's poisonous or yeah. not so that we can retard our uh, fearness? Um, well, I should say this because this is an innate question and that's called ophidiophobia. And uh, being as one primate, human has an innate uh, negative interaction with snakes and it, it is from evolutionary tree that we got it. But uh, actually, as you said, almost uh, most of the majority of the snakes are, uh, uh, you know, have this dangerous uh, venom delivery system. And generally we for snakes, we call them as uh, venomous, not poisonous, because, you know, many in many parts of the world, snakes were eaten, so they are not poisonous. So but mm -hmm. They have, they have a fang and the fang is attached to is a gland, which is equal to salivary gland. And with that, they deliver the venom. So that is dangerous. So in India, there are, uh, you know, if you are from locality specific and there are some very easy keys can be developed. Uh, for example, if you are from Eastern India and from Northeastern India and or, or Northern India, then most of the snakes, which is a long line, on the body, on the top of the body, very long line from head to tail. So all the snakes, these are called stripes. So all the snakes with a long stripe on the body, they are all non-venomous species 
okay now if you are coming uh, if you are going in the western uh, western ghats or southern india then you have those few species like cobra crate and few vipers so vipers is a very wide triangular shape head and a very short body so if you train yourself like uh, you know it's it's not a difficult task to just identify few cobras and few vipers uh, so i think it's easier but then it depends on whether we want to learn or not because as a human being we can learn many things and very quickly also so i think it's just a matter of our decision which uh, makes so much of difference yeah okay sir so uh, i'm from himachal actually the place where i where i reside there are a lot of snakes especially yes. during the rainy season yes. so it become very scary even to sleep at the night so <laughs> the things become very yeah thank you sir thank you sir thank you well if there are no more questions are there any more questions or uh, any experiences or something that you would like to share if there are no more uh, doubts then i think uh, uh, i would enter into the formality of uh, thanking our resource person today uh, dr abhijit das uh so thank you very much for uh, delivering this uh, lecture and uh, uh, there are very few people who uh, profess for the reptiles and amphibians in our country so thank you very much for giving a very crisp and lucid uh, uh, view of the world of the amphibians and reptiles and uh, what uh, how to estimate their populations and you also took the uh, queries of uh, the participants so thank you very much uh, and you had a problem of internet in your institute but you made it a point to deliver this lecture by coming to our institute and uh, uh, logging in so thank you thank you very much for all your kind cooperation and we do look forward to have a wonderful association with you so thank you on behalf of principal caspos uh, uh, and all the participants sitting here thank you thank you very much thank you so much Uh, common wall lizard is not poisonous <laughs> is common wall lizard poisonous well thank you so uh, we break for lunch today afternoon uh, we have uh, a session on ecosystem services and after that we will be having our uh, panel discussion and uh, valedictory so uh, uh, I, I, to kindly have your lunch and let us start by 2 pm exactly uh, and uh, Uh, i would request some of the participants uh, uh, i'll be getting in touch with them uh, two or three participants uh, for the panel afternoon panel uh, discussion uh, so with this uh, we break for lunch i am also playing a small video of maybe 3 or 4 minutes uh, you, you may just uh, see the video uh, and in the meanwhile you can also have your lunch and then we join back at uh, 2 pm uh, so thank you thank you very much
गुड आफ्टरनून मैम आफ्टरनून हाउ यू मैम द इंटरनेट इज रिस्टोर्ड यस यस थैंकफुली वी आर बैक ऑन ट्रैक नाउ इट वाज रियली बैड पूरे देहरादून में पता चल गया कि आज डब्ल्यू आई आई में इंटरनेट नहीं है <laughs> आज क्या पिछले दो दिन से हम लोग बहुत परेशान थे आई मीन नथिंग वाज वर्किंग आई वाज जस्ट स्पीकिंग द अबाउट दिस टू समबडी अरे हां यार आज डब्ल्यू आई में तो इंटरनेट नहीं है घर के ही वाज ऑल्सो यस जी मैम मैम वी स्टार्ट मैम जी जी श्योर so good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, we have a slightly different uh, topic to be discussed uh, the post lunch session it is on ecosystem services now we were basically discussing about uh, the biodiversity and various components of biodiversity and uh, very interesting species and communities and all so now ma'am will be giving the uh, an insight into the ecosystem services that our forest and other ecosystems have been offering us uh for our survival so i have the honor of introducing to you dr ruchi badola uh, madam is scientist g in the wildlife institute of uh, india and ma'am is a masters in economics from gadwal university and joined the wildlife institute of india way back in 1988 as a research scholar uh, she worked on the for work for or uh, for her phd on economic assessment of people forest interactions in elephant forest corridor linking the rajaji and corbett national parks subsequently ma'am joined as a faculty uh, in the wildlife institute in department of eco development planning and participatory management in 1993 ma'am is involved in research projects for generating information on ethnobiology the socio economics of natural ecosystems and the contribution of ecosystem services for biodiversity conservation and uh, human well being uh, i also uh, madam also has uh, uh, the roles and responsibilities of developing and implementing training programs to build the skills of state forest departments and other stakeholders in the field of planning for community participation in biodiversity conservation uh, developing sustainable livelihood options for local communities and conflict resolution over uh, natural resources and also ma'am is also involved in performing valuation of the ecosystem services ma'am specialization lies in uh, community stakeholder participation in biodiversity conservation ecological economics valuation of ecosystem services sustainable livelihood conflict management gender and gender issues in uh, conservation ma'am is also having uh, several uh, key projects uh, in the field of biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services to mention ma'am is working on the conservation ecology of the dancing deer sangai and its wetland habitat in kebul lamjao national park manipur about which we spoke in the morning today Uh, ma'am is also working on integrated approach to reduce the vulnerability of local communities to environmental degradation and climate change impacts in the western himalaya ma'am has got uh, hundreds of publication to her credit in national and international peer reviewed journals ma'am has presented her works and papers in uh, several national and international seminars and workshops and uh, uh, ma'am is also playing a very key role in the namami gange project wherein uh, the biodiversity uh, related to the river ganga is uh, uh, being conserved under a government of india uh, funding so i am sure ma'am will also be speaking about it during her session so ma'am uh, they are the participants of two days online course on uh, conservation issues in india ma'am they are all the uh, teaching faculty senior teaching faculty the professors associate professors assistant professors and lecturers from uh, colleges across the country ma'am Uh, and uh, uh, they are uh, basically dealing most of them are dealing with science subjects uh, so uh, this is with this uh, brief introduction of the uh, participants ma'am uh, the session is over to you ma'am and as usual we are looking forward to a wonderful uh, session by you ma'am thank you very much ma'am thank you so much uh, good afternoon everybody and it's a pleasure to be addressing this group particularly because i feel that uh, this topic of ecosystem services embedded within the overall uh, subject of ecological and environmental economics is an extremely important subject today and its importance keeps on increasing with the situations that we face you know the current scenarios because it is one of the subject that is very uh, clearly addressing the current and emerging scenarios particularly related to climate change the emergence of uh, pandemics and diseases etc 
or if even if we talk about the larger issues of conservation versus development so in a way it is directly linked to what we know uh, call human well being so just give me a minute i'll upload my presentation so is it visible can you see the yes, presentation yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, oh, ma kindly play it in the full mode ah, yes ma'am yeah yeah i've yeah. done that yeah yeah just to recap uh, that the global ecosystem source and sink functions they have limited capacity to support the economic subsist system that is very very clear now that it is ultimately the natural ecosystem which is the greater uh, you know the greater system within which we all exist within which economics also exists and within which conservation also exists but it is very clear that the economic subsystem has already reached and exceeded important source and sink limits so basically here we are talking about two key functions that the natural ecosystems play one is that it is a source of various goods and services that it provides for human requirements for human consumption and these could be a number of things you know but one of the most underrated function till the recent past which natural resources were performing and for which it is a challenge to account for is the sink limit sink is that you know whatever the externalities the negative externalities that emerge as a result of economic activity be it in the form of uh, green greenhouse gases be it in the form of carbon whatever the emissions which are becoming a challenge to a uh, control because for the source limit you can always have substitutes you can have a substitute for wood you can have a substitute for fuel you have substitute for several things and in fact today uh, we are also talking about a substitute where the salt sea water is being converted into potable water i think it's not very recent also it's being done since a, since quite some time so uh, every uh, all the source function humanity through its technology through its intelligence through its you know the hard work has been able to create some kind of substitute or the other but it is the sink function where science and technology have really failed to find an alternative and it involves common property where markets fail so basically there are two uh, basic reasons why the it is very difficult i mean the sink function is creating a challenge for managers policy makers everybody so one is that they are subject to market failure now i am sure all of you know what is a market even if you have not studied economics everybody knows that market is a place where things services are brought and sold uh, at a certain price you know uh, the, there is the the functions of demand and supply set up a price for a certain commodity and service to be supplied in a given quantity and that is what determines the entire market function so if the prices increase the supply in, uh, increases and you know the movement of the uh, price curve and if the uh, prices decline the demand increases and thereby adjusting the price but imagine a situation where you are going to a market and maybe you and me i am also going to that market and we have gone there to buy a shirt so the shirt has been priced at 500 rupees and both you and me have taken that money to buy that shirt from that market so as a consumer we will get a satisfaction when we pay 500 rupees and we get that shirt but when we go to that market what happens is that you pay the money for the shirt and the shirt is given to me and nobody has asked me for money in fact i got the free shirt and i am returning home very happily with my free shirt and my 500 rupees whereas you uh, have neither got the shirt nor did you get the 500 rupees so imagine what will happen to you you will become very very frustrated and you might want to redeem your uh, money in some way or the other and most importantly you may not want to go to that market with the money next time because you know that other people have got the shirt free so you will also try to get a free shirt 
A, to compensate yourself and B, to make a profit what others have made. Similarly, in my case, I will also go to that market, but I will not be motivated to pay in that market because I know that I'm capable of getting a free shirt from there. So in this scenario, what will happen? That the market will totally crash because nobody will be willing to pay a price. Those who are able to pay a price and willing to pay a price uh, do not find a mechanism where the person who pays the price gets the benefit and the person who gets the benefit pays the price. This is known as market failure. And it is the very nature of natural goods, uh, natural services, particularly ecosystem services, that they may not accrue to the people to the places who pay a cost for them. And in fact, the people who are not paying the cost may get the benefit, whereas the people who are paying the cost may not get a benefit. And that is why today we are talking about global uh, climate agreement, so on and so forth, which are more like a market correction. And one of the closest example is the, if you think the biggest emissions are occurring in the global north, the northern hemisphere, countries like US, developed countries, China, et cetera. But the first ozone hole actually appeared in the southern hemisphere. So people in the southern hemisphere without getting the benefit are actually paying the cost. Whereas people in the northern hemisphere are enjoying the sink function without paying a cost for it. So that is why it is a challenge to maintain this function. Why would I be uh, interested in making a sacrifice or retaining my forest and not developing just to provide carbon, uh, uh, carbon emissions for uh, the world? Uh, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility. So unless there is a market where I am paid for or compensated for my efforts, it does not work. And that is, and most of the natural ecosystem services have a characteristic that they will occur outside the geographical boundary because natural functions do not understand boundaries. So this is the challenge that we have to face. And we know that the uh, Nostradamus prophecies have already said that situation is going to become worse, natural disasters. I mean, this is... Uh, in a way, it is more fictional, but it has it is there. And we know that heat waves, flood, drop, fire, food security is a challenge. Infectious diseases are emerging. And they are all pointing out to the fact that something is not working properly. Our natural systems are unable to perform these services to their full capacity. And you can see how the temperature rise, how the frequent floods and droughts have created uh, a lot of uh, problems for the people and uh, challenges to handle these particular ecological functions. So basically, if you uh, think, as I told you, that ecosystem services lie within the larger subject of ecological economics or environmental economics. So ecological ref uh, economics refers to the application of economics to environmental issues. It is usually carried out within the framework of mainstream neoclassical economics, which in turn relies on capitalism and its property instruments. It assumes an inherent link between the health of the ecosystems and that of human well-being. It is commonly referred to as green economics. So basically, ecologists study natural interdependencies while economists consider interdependencies among commodity and man. But how to bring these two subjects together? Therefore, ecological economics represents a commitment among economists, ecologists, and others to learn from each other and to facilitate derivation and implementation of new economic and environmental policy. So during the 17 and 80s, it was becoming very, very clear to economists that despite the best policies, despite the best plans, despite the best economic agenda, the kind of development which they were envisaging was not taking place. And it, they were trying to find out reasons for this. And much of the reasons actually lay in the field of ecology or natural resources, the floods, the disasters, the water uh, scarcity, 
the uh, you know the scarcity of renewable resources and so on same ways in ecology the ecologist had uh, had a very good knowledge about the ecology of species and ecosystems but they were unable to create uh, sustainable conservation efforts they were unable to sustain these conservation efforts so then this thought and they realized that despite the best of science the best of ecology the conservation was not happening because conservation decisions were largely driven by economic considerations were largely driven by the livelihood uh, choices of people and of pol the policies for the nations which were also largely driven by economic agenda therefore these two fields came together and thought of deriving policies which would lead both to conservation and sustainable development so the core of ecological economics is sustainable development which has been interpreted as both intra and intergenerational equity have you heard of that quotation which says that we have not borrowed the earth we have not inherited the earth from our forefathers we have borrowed it from our children that is it is trying to put a is trying to tell us that the issue of ethics of intergenerational equity is equally important and it also relies on a methodological approach which is based on comprehensive study and understanding of the system both natural social and economic so if we think what is the difference between ecological and environmental economics so basically ecological economics basically comes from the side of supply that is the side of environmental goods and services whereas environmental economics tends to focus on human preferences so while environmental economics are concerned with the efficient allocation of natural resources ecological economists figure out the cost benefit of preserving or protecting natural resources so basically even if you've done all your good economics in trying to do a cost benefit analysis of the loss of a forest area that is environmental economics where you have used all the methods where you valued all the tangible and intangible goods and services but then environmental economics comes in and sorry then ecological economics comes in and tells you that okay the economic decisions are now made you will now have to put on your ecologist hat and look at two or three other aspects number 1 is can you bring this system back to its original state if you if in future it is required the number 2 is so that is the question of that you uh, can you recreate you cannot recreate that system you might bring out a better system but not sec not the same system the second is once you disturb a system in no system is stand alone it is linked to other systems so if a forest is destroyed or converted it is not only that area which is changed it is the wetlands in the surrounding areas it may be the linking forest it may be the pollinators which are there which would ultimately have an impact on agricultural output and on uh, further uh, conservation of uh, faunal species and so on so once you have put on your ecologist hat you have to think of all these things and then you should actually take a decision sometimes you may be required to take a decision that the system has to be changed or destroyed or the forest has to be destroyed because it is so required but you should be aware as an ecological economist you should be aware of what you are losing to gain whatever you are gaining so that awareness is extremely important because it may help you plan in the future so basically ecosystem function is the outcome or product of collective interaction between the organisms and their physical environment while ecosystem services are the processes and conditions of natural ecosystem that support human activity and sustain life so basically function ecological ecosystem function is something which the system does without uh, getting a return without being acknowledged or anything it is a process which happens anyway but those ecosystem uh, functions 
that uh, cater to human well-being they are known as ecosystem services and the type quality and quantity of service provided by an ecosystem are affected by the resource use decisions of individuals and communities how much area you want to conserve in your country is totally a decision which is made by individuals a country like bhutan may want to put 70% of its area under forest cover while india may be happy with 30% there may be other countries which may be having just 5 to 10% of area so it's totally a uh, anthropogenic decision so that natural the ecosystem functions are divided into four broad categories that is regulation function where the nature regulates the various uh, functions in terms of uh, global energy balance com chemical composition carbon cycle nitrogen cycle so on and so forth then the habitat function that is providing space and suitable substrate for human habitation settlements cultivation recreation tourism nature protection etc then comes the production function where in uh, it produces goods that are required for human uh, consumption and then the information functions that is the aesthetic value the spiritual religious cultural and artistic uh, inspirations the scientific and educational information etc so these are broadly the four categories of ecosystem functions ecosystem services are divided into three major categories that is provisioning services food wa fresh water wood fiber fuel etc regulating services and cultural services which are provided support by a fourth category of services known as supporting services so basically if if i ask you that what is the cause of loss of natural ecosystems you could actually provide me with a long list that it is huge population it is unplanned development and so on and so forth but there are only three major causes of loss of natural ecosystems and those are information failure market failure and intervention failure so information failure is the lack of awareness among people about the values of conserved ecosystems sometimes people are aware but because we do not have such values you know we are not able to tell then it becomes a zero value for policy makers because policy will work on information and values it does not work on rhetoric so if we are not able to give a figure of what is the um, uh, value of monetary value of water provided by our uh, forests or what is the monetary value of the soil conservation done by the forest ecosystems or what is the uh, value of uh, ecological protection provided by our natural ecosystems then what can policy do it will just ignore that part and that is what has happened regarding market failure i already gave you the example that is the failure of markets to reflect the full or true cost of goods and services provided by the conserved ecosystem and they are by unable to make the polluter pay as we call it then intervention failure that is absence of appropriate integrated resource management policies and intersectoral policy inconsistency so there is a lot of inconsistency between the development and the conservation sector and often it is the development sector which will get an upper hand because again short term benefits and economic tangible economic benefits are extremely important uh, in uh, planning and policy uh, in planning and politics basically so it has been uh, estimated that there is a huge cost of loss of natural ecosystem on human well being particularly for the provisioning and regulating services which are important for human security uh, in terms of uh, livelihood security and ecological security as well as to ensure a good livelihood shelter food security etc and human health you know now it is so clear after the covid 19 pandemic that what an important relationship exists between uh, healthy ecosystems and healthy people but it has also been estimated that 60% of the ecosystem services globally are degraded or used unsustainably and the degradation of ecosystem services 
often causes significant harm to human well-being and represents a loss of a natural asset or wealth of a country and this was actually estimated by the millennium ecosystem assessment uh, in 2005 the reports have come you can google this these reports and they were basically an eye opener a global assessment where about 1400 scientists from about 200 countries participated and they tried to establish empirical links between the condition of natural ecosystems and human well-being so basically i will just show you these two economic models which is the conventional view of wealth and utility so conventional economics says that there are three major factors of production capital labor and land and when they are brought together by the entrepreneur they result in economic processes some economic processes takes place production consumption etc the gdp is produced G, gn gross national product is produced in form of goods and services and depending on the country's cultural norms and policy they are consumed and they lead to individual utility and welfare some of it is reinvested into improving the quality of the factors of production this also assumes perfect substitutability among the various factors of production that is land labor capital and land are can be perfect substitutes for each other if there is paucity in one area you can use you can invest more in the uh, you can have intensive inputs of the other resource so this is the conventional model of economic development the alternate model of economic development provided by ecological economist recognizes natural capital as another form of capital and it says that there is a limited substitutability between natural capital and other forms of capital that means you cannot replace in totality natural capital either with manufactured capital or human capital or land whatever so you will have to retain it secondly it also acknowledges one of the most important functions performed by nature that is waste assimilation so you can see here economic processes takes place goods and services are produced but waste is also produced and this is another function which natural capital performs some of it is consumed and reinvested and here solar energy also directly impacting natural capital and it is also providing direct well being to human in terms of health and ecological serve goods and services so this is the so what it's trying to say is that that like we in mainstream economics we are planning to strengthen our factors of production by having better quality of human capital better factories better infrastructure modern technology so we are investing resource same kind of respect should be provided to the natural capital also and we need to spend resources and efforts in its restoration and conservation so basically if we look at the entire gamut of uh, biodiversity conservation so the global role of protected areas is extremely important because they are considered to be the main repositories where by virtue of their status the role is to conserve the biodiversity and also the critical goods and services needed by human well-being in fact now 15% of the earth's land area is under the protected area network and it is one of the most significant resource use allocations on the planet and these protected areas are regarded as places for scientific research wilderness protection maintenance of environmental services education tourism and recreation protection of specific natural and cultural features and sustainable use of biological resources so the and while the underlying goal is to maintain uh, ecosystem services in fact 33 out of 105 big cities in the world obtain their drinking water directly from protected areas and another one third actually obtain their drinking water directly from forests in their vicinity which may not have been categorized as protected area one sixth of the world's people depend on protected areas for their livelihood particularly in poor countries of south and southeast asia and tropical uh, countries of latin america and africa protected areas store 15% of terrestrial carbon 
it has been estimated that a protected area network covering 15% of land and 30% of sea would cost approximately $45 billion per annum, but it would be delivering goods and services with a net annual value of 4.5 to 5.2 trillion US dollar. So I don't know what is the mathematics between billion and trillion, but I think it is at least 100 times or even more, I'm not sure. So you can see how uh, it makes economic sense to invest in conservation and in retaining more and more areas as uh, protected areas so that they are able to perform these goods and services. Mm -hmm. However, establishment and maintenance of protected areas is difficult to justify in development because they are low priority in macroeconomic and sectoral decision making. And creation of protected areas has also engendered conflict over issues of conservation versus livelihood. Therefore, to ensure their sustainability, and for rational natural resource use policy, it is important to value the ecosystem services provided by protected areas and assess the distribution of cost and benefits of conservation. And we know in our country that conservation is often in conflict with economic development. It could be due to mining in biodiversity rich areas, highways and expressways, thermal power plants. So everywhere there is a there is a uh, conflict between conservation and development. Mineral exploration in, is again a huge challenge these days, mining in most of the protected areas, particularly in Central India and Eastern India. This is just one example, but there are several uh, mines in Jharkhand, Bihar, uh, Chota, particularly Chota Nagpur Plateau, etc. Then linear development roads, railways often run across protected area and critical conservation areas resulting in mortality and uh, human wildlife conflict. And these are the pipeline projects, some of the important ones which are uh, creating adverse impact for several species. So basically it is like the Tower of Babel where, uh, or you know the story of the elephant and five blind men who just saw one part of the elephant and thought that is what the elephant looked like. So that is how we have been approaching conservation and development in our own country. So basically, we really need to value the ben these benefits of ecosystem services. So, so valuation basically is an attempt to assign quantitative values to the goods and services provided by such natural resources where market prices are not available. What it can do is it can indicate the overall economic efficiency of various competing uses of natural resources. As I already told you that even if you are changing that resource, even if you are using it, at least you will make an informed decision that what we are losing to gain what. And this can only happen when we understand the system well and we understand what benefits that natural ecosystem is providing. And it will also help us to marginal to identify the marginal stakeholders who may threaten natural resources due to unsustainable resource use. So if you look at the benefits provided by conservation, they are divided into two broad categories, use values or non-use values. Use values are those which we can consume tangibly. Non-use values are there which can only be felt and understood. So use values also have different categories. We have direct use values like timber, wood, food, etc., which can be directly extracted and consumed either through by entering the market and sometimes without entering the market. Then indirect values like ecological services uh, provided by natural ecosystems, uh, be it in any form. And then the option values that is, we may want to retain certain ecosystems as an option for future use, that we may require these species, these pollinators in the future, and th that is why we want to conserve them. Then non-use values can again be divided into two categories, existence value, that is something which is having its intrinsic value. And many of our historical places are also like that. You know, We want to preserve them because they have some intrinsic value. And bequest value is we might want to leave something for our future generations. So these are the 
total economic benefits. Now, if you look at the costs, there are three major types of cost. Direct cost, that is management cost or cost of managing that area. Then indirect cost, that is if you conserve an area, then the uh, species population may increase and it may cause damages in the surrounding areas. So in that case, uh, the, uh, it is an indirect cost. And opportunity cost is the alternate use for gold. If that area was not a protected area, it was not a forest area, what would have been the next best use of that area? So that is the opportunity cost. So, uh, but if you look at this chart very carefully, who pays the cost? If you look at the cost, except for direct cost, the indirect and opportunity cost are largely borne by the local communities who are uh, living in and around that area. Whereas if you look at the benefits, only a small part of the direct use value actually goes to the people living in and around, where the, whereas the larger benefits go to the humanity as a whole. So this is a classic example of market failure. Now, even if you look in terms of recognizing in the national income account, only a small part of the direct use value actually is uh, acknowledged in our national income accounting, only those products which enter the market. So most of it is unaccounted for. Okay. So if you look at how to value the ecosystem services, there are three broad categories of approaches. The revealed preference approaches, where the consumers reveal their preference for buying certain things at a certain price. Then cost-based approaches means what it will cost to uh, create those services if natural ecosystems were not there. And stated preference approaches, which means where the consumers actually state their preference for buying these services at a certain price. So if you look at the revealed preference approaches, you have a market price approach, which can be you, which is very clear. You know, you can go to the market and you can buy fuel, wood and fodder, etc. And that is the market price. Then the production function approach actually looks at the change in production during due to an improvement in the environmental quality. So if there is good protection of forests in the uphill areas, the water flow and quality in downstream may increase, resulting in better agriculture output and fishery output. So that, that changed output is actually the result of the ecosystem services provided due to better conservation. So that is the production function approach. And surrogate market prices, where we try to look at uh, substitutes for natural resources and try to uh, give them a price. For example, uh, the price of fresh water from a Himalayan spring would be considered as the price of bisleri water in the market. So similarly, coming to cost-based approaches, we have the replacement approach, which means how much it will cost to replace a certain service provided by the uh, natural ecosystem. Or it could be mitigative or avertive expenditure. How much it will cost to mitigate the damage caused due to the loss of an ecosystem. For example, if the groundwater recharge uh, function is not uh, is dam uh, is uh, damaged, then what happens? You will have to install pumps, etc., which was happening naturally. Then damage cost avoided again. How much it will cost to uh, avoid the damage in case the natural resources are not there? So these are the different versions of the cost-based approaches. Then comes the stated preference approach where people, and there are two major variants of this. It is known as the contingent valuation and there are two major variations. That is willingness to pay, willingness to pay to enjoy a better level of environmental goods and services or the willingness to accept compensation for a lower level of environmental goods and services. And both these measures are asked through a series of questionnaire surveys. So I can actually share study material with you regarding all these methods where we have used these methods. 
So the global value of annual ecosystem service was first time assessed in 1997 by a group of ecological ex uh, economists led by Costanza et al. And they estimated that the value of goods and services provided was 33.3 trillion US dollar. Now, the value is not important. The fact is that at that point, the global GDP was 16.8 trillion US dollar. So what they were trying to prove is that despite all the development, despite uh, all the advancement, technology, humanity has been able to generate goods and services only worth 50% of what the natural ecosystems are provided are providing despite being destroyed and degraded. This paper came in Nature and it also came in the journal Econo Ecological Economist. Now they have revised this value to 144 trillion US dollar in a paper published in 2014. So I will just give you some examples uh, this of studies that we've done. This is the Kobe Tiger Reserve in Uttarakhand. And you can see it is, it is a very important uh, area for conservation of tigers and elephants and other subspecies but it is also surrounded by a large number of villages on all sides. This is the cost of maintenance of the Kobe Tiger Reserve, which is borne by the state, uh, by the government of India. But the indirect impacts, that is economic loss due to crop uh, damaged by wildlife, particularly deer and elephant, is huge. And this is uh, six villages in those areas. And you can see that uh, people are losing a lot of their uh, agriculture produced to wild animals. The livestock are being depredation. That is another cost which people are bearing, and human injury and uh, is another issue which is a uh, which is being borne by the people. Also, people are losing the opportunity cost because they were dependent on this forest for their fuel, wood, fodder, and grazing requirement. But after its declaration as a tiger reserve, they have lost access to this resource. And you can see this is the lifestyle of the people. So how they are going to manage if they do not have access to forest resources. But the Kobe Tiger Reserve also generates a lot of benefit. And tourism, uh, you know, it's a very popular tourist site, is providing a lot of revenue to the government. And these are the gate uh, revenue, whatever the entrance fee the people are giving. And large number of tourists are visiting here and also paying a fee to visit the area. Then because it is a very rich uh, deciduous forest, then you can see that a lot of carbon is sequestered and stored in this area which uh, has a huge value in economic terms. Then we also wanted to find out that what was the perception of the tourist, why they were visiting uh, Corbett. And we found out that there were a large number of reasons. Tiger was just one of them, but it could be just leisure. They wanted to enjoy, see the biodiversity, aesthetic value, or a package tour or whatever. And because also it's educational and it's a popular tourist destination. The interesting thing was that we did a travel cost assessment for the tourists. That is, we estimated the recreational value of Kobe Tiger Reserve. So what this recreational value actually estimates is the consumer surplus, means the amount that a tourist has paid to uh, visit Corbett and the amount that they are willing to pay. So although they might have paid 100 rupees, they might be willing to spend 200 rupees. So this extra 100 rupees is the con uh, consumer surplus or the recreational value of Corbett Tiger Reserve for them. So if the cost of visiting to Corbett in is increased up to 200, the number of visitors should not decline. This is what this theory says. It is only after it crosses uh, 200 that the number of visitors will change. The interesting thing was that while the tourists were visiting this area and they were getting a consumer surplus and they were also getting what they wanted, the local people who live in the surrounding of this area were actually suffering uh, the livestock damage, uh, crop raiding, human injuries and death, and also at the same time not getting what they wanted from here in terms of fuel and fodder, in terms of employment opportunities and uh, uh, watershed protection services, of course, were uh, happening.
by default. So basically, in such a scenario, it is very important to value these services. As I already said, that it can indicate the economic efficiency and identify the marginalized stakeholders who may threaten the natural resource use. It can lead to efficiency to address the issue of resource allocation, to address the issue of equity, and also to address the issue of sustainability. And in order to make protected areas or even conservation a viable land use option, we need to address the failures, as I told you about the three failures. Information failure by accounting of ecosystem services and understanding how and at what rates these are produced. Market failure, that is to motivate payments for these services. See, local people will not go on sacrificing unless they get something out of it in return. That, that is why we need to focus on conservation of ecosystem services by involving local communities and aligning conservation of ecosystem services with local economic activity. And intervention failure by involving multi and transdisciplinary teams and also by establishing close linkages between economic sectors and conservation agencies. Thank you. So I will finish here and I will now be open to uh, your questions, please. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I would like the participants to kindly interact with ma'am. So if any questions you have, you can ask me if you need any reading material, I can email some uh, published papers regarding the different approaches and methods to you. So it's up to the group uh, what exactly is required. Aapka mic mute hai, Bilash. Oh, I'm so sorry. There is a, a query in the chat box, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Arjun Ramachandran asks, is there a policy intervention to evaluate and account for ecosystem services in the GDP of Indian economy? Is there any locality specific model we could emulate at a national level? Ma'am, ab aapka microphone off hai, ma'am. Sorry. So, see, now, in the past few years, the government of India has started recognizing the importance and various studies have been commissioned at the national level through the Institute of Economic Growth and others to, uh, to uh, bring out, uh, you know, the values of ecosystem services produced by natural ecosystems. At the same time, uh, even if you look at the forest working plans now, there is a specific requirement which needs to be reported that what is the value of the carbon services provided and like this, the other services provided. But slowly it is getting mainstream. There are a lot of study. There are some state level studies, for example, for Himachal Pradesh, they have been uh, doing for their state uh, reporting already estimated the ecosystem services provided by natural ecosystem. Similarly, an initiative was also made in Uttarakhand, particularly keeping in view the Himalayan ecosystem. So uh, there are a lot of information models available in the country, and uh, some of these are published, some of these are uh, available as policy documents, and you can always uh, have a look at them. But there will be nothing which can be applicable. You know, if you understand the nature of this, you can only take information and integrate that information. But there is nothing like, uh, you know, uh, uh, adopting one model for the entire country. It is very difficult to do it, actually. It has to be uh, done at a country level exercise then. Ma'am, uh, there is a question. Is there any information about earning carbon credits through forest or ecosystem? Yeah, control? yeah, yeah. There are a lot of publications on that. If you want, I can share about that to you. Lot of publications are there. Global and Indian both. So we have done, uh, I have myself published some papers on carbon sequestration, but 
uh, we have not really applied it to earn any carbon credits, but I can share information on that also. Any more queries? Somebody would like to add or uh, share their experiences. Yes, sir. This is Monica Ram, Hindu College, Delhi. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture and I truly enjoyed that. It gave a good insight of how economics is so closely linked with ecology. I teach ecology to undergraduate students and uh, this is a topic very close to my heart and your lecture has given me uh, very nice insights into finer details of ecosystem functioning as such. I truly benefited from your lecture and in fact uh, this whole idea of uh, ecological economics as you said I think this should be introduced to students at the UG level so that they admire and they appreciate how uh, how relevant this whole concept of ecology is, especially ecosystem dynamics. I think they will appreciate this subject better. We should have the topic of ecosystem services included in the syllabus. We don't have it so far. So I was, I truly enjoyed your lecture, ma'am. Thank the you same so thing much. That, Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would, would be, I would shortly, be very happy to share this lecture. Yeah. I would surely get in touch with you, ma'am, yeah, for some more reading material in this field, because we don't have much and content in the books that are prescribed at UG level. So I'm sure uh, there, there is a lot to learn from you and a lot of, if you can share some more uh, reading material, we would be truly benefited. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, madam. And I will be very, very happy to share the presentation and others and material with you, because I think you are in a very critical place. I mean, all of you, have, in fact, where you can actually integrate this subject, because I always believe that this is the subject for the future of humanity. So I think it's very important to understand its nuances at an early stage. Uh, the undergrad level is very important, in fact. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, P. Viji uh, asks, uh, even though there is a huge investment for protected areas for conservation and sustainable utilization, why integrated resource management policies are not strictly followed, which results in degradation of ecosystems? I think you've, you've raised a very, very important and a very central question. But believe me, nobody has an answer to this. And we are still grappling for answers because there we are dealing with human beings, you know, who are intelligent beings, who take decisions and who are motivated by a myriad uh, things. You know, it's a very different thing. And that is why we always say that there is one language which everybody understands, be it development, People, be it politician, be it the poor, the rich people, that is economics. And one topic that I did not introduce you to in this ecosystem services is payment for ecosystem services. Now, in integrated resource management approaches, largely, we consider local people as a byproduct or, you know, you can say as add-ons to the whole process. Although every project today talks of providing alternate livelihood, pro providing development to the people, but that is not the spirit which it is approached. They are largely supposed to be the recipients of doles. And if you give out doles, you will only get beggars. And beggars cannot help you to have integrated resource management. What you need is professional resource management communities at the grassroots levels. And that can only happen when resource conservation becomes their profession. It is not something which happens because they are getting doles to do it. So that it is that that approach is reflected in what is known as payment for ecosystem services. Globally, in many places, it is being successfully employed. We also are trying to do it in our country in uh, smaller places. But the a whole thing is the philosophy behind the approach. You are not talking about a poor villager who is recipient of your byproduct of a joint forest management program or an eco development program, you will have to involve a professional who knows about conservation, who knows about your goals, what you want to achieve, and who is being adequately compensated. So unless we mainstream 
conservation within the lives and livelihoods of people i think we will not be able to achieve it and that is where people like you and me come in when we try to uh, centralize these subjects any more queries Uh, Madam, she agrees with you. She says it's true. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. More queries? Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. It was it was so interesting to listen to you, and it was very enlightening. I just want to uh, inquire: uh, when we talk about the payment of ecosystem services or the ecological economics per se, I think it will be extremely difficult. to what to say explain or identify by using some mathematical or economical formulae the kind of services like cultural services the kind of services that people are getting for example may it be religious or rituals or the languages it will be too difficult to give a, a, a number to them or or it is extremely difficult to commodify so in such cases i think uh, ecological economics uh, may 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 it may may result in marginalizing some of the community which is so strongly related to the cultural ethos of a particular place so in this regard what is your view thank you ma'am i'm ojit uh, speaking from ramdas college thank you the full question in fact uh, let me tell you that uh, there are methods available in in ecological economics but ecological economics as i said has three pillars right it is just like the pillars of we have lost ma'am uh, there is some connectivity issues i'll get ma'am back i think there is some connectivity issues definitely sir sir connectivity is a major issue here also using yeah. three three system uh, ma'am uh, uh, ma'am that there was a connectivity issue ma'am uh, um, i think you would have to repeat the answer okay. ma'am you could not now it, am i audible now am i yes, audible now yes ma'am so arji ji i think you have asked a very very important uh, yeah. question and uh, you know uh, when we talk about eco that is what is the difference between yeah. ecological and environmental economics the role of environmental economics is to commodify that they, they, they have developed the methods so that they are because the economist mind works like this that you have to place a value on things but that is what ecological economics says that after you have finished your notion of value valuation you have to move ahead move one step ahead and think again whether it is what will happen to the system if you actually disturb any component of the system although there are methods available to put a value on cultural spiritual religious services that is the stated preference approaches which have been successfully used but the purpose is not to put a value so as to do away with those services it is often used to put a price you know for example we we uh, if you go to any western country you know you have a house for example i'll just tell you one example we have shakespeare's house in uh, stratford upon avon there is a huge ticket to enter that house you know when you go to into that time uh, place whereas if you come to india you know what is the entry fee for taj mahal or premchand's house in varanasi nobody even knows the where it exist and what is the entry fee so what it is trying to say is that here where these values can be used 
right it it is not for exploitation of those services to commodify but to put an appropriate price on them to ensure their sustainability and ensure that the people who are paying a cost for that their conservation are or agency or anybody is being adequately compensated for it in a manner so that you know economics always says that if your uh, the, the the economic principle i talked about that if the price increases above 200 rupees for entry fee people will start the number of people will start declining similarly if you do not have the price up to 200 you will be at a loss so marginal utility is very important in economics and in ecological economics is the best combination of cultural sorry of conservation ethos and economic pragmatism so that is why i try to differentiate between the two environmental and ecological economics more queries ma'am uh, dr yash mangla asks is there any ecological economic assessment related to pollination services in india ah uh, there is uh, no paper that i have seen in from india but there are publications uh, global publications on pollination services and it has been a very very important component of the ibbes assessment of the global and regional ipbs you know ipbs intergovernmental platform for uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services and their reports are available online and pollination services in fact has been one of their major components so you can get a lot of information from there but from india i have not really seen uh, any publication on this but globally there are yes in fact two three days ago on google news only there was about one paper uh, from the amazon other question ma'am how biodiversity is conserved through agroforestry measures i think uh, agroforestry is one of the examples where we try to protect both the uh, you know the agro biodiversity and the natural biodiversity and in fact it is said that a decline in biodiversity the greatest threat is to food security because agro biodiversity is actually supposed to contribute to food security in fact if you see when we lose the crop varieties we are actually slowly going towards depending on fewer varieties of food grains fewer strains which means that we are really exposed to damages of climate change and global changes that are happening agroforestry because it can provide a shelter and substrate for a large number of species particularly pollinators insects pests a uh, pest control services can become a if done in the right way can become a very very important refugia for such species uh deepak uh surbi gupta Surbhi Gupta is asking: Can we make use of these ecosystem services in current Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan? And please, of course, how we can make it practically? In fact, this is the basis for the entire Earth Ganga concept, which is being promulgated by the Niti Aayog, where we are trying to make people dependent on their. surroundings their products in, in in fact it has you know elements of circular economy it has elements of earth uh, uh, earth uh, ganga concept and of course the atmanirbhar bharat into it so if we were, uh, you know uh, i am working on ganga as abhilash ji just told you and even within the ganga basin i mean there is immense scope for making people earth nirbhar in their on their own services on their own uh, you know production systems on the cultural heritage that they have on the religious values they have so i think this is one of the most important component of atmanirbhar bharat in fact if we are able to do it and as i said 
initially also to say that we can replicate it at all places may not be true we need to find these smaller models which fit into specific areas and provide uh, unique models examples and experiences for people from outside so that it truly becomes an atmanirbhar bharat मैम आशुष प्रभु गांवकर सेज दैट प्लास्टिक फॉर पैकेजिंग शुड बी टैक्सड हेविली एज कॉज लॉट ऑफ एनवायरमेंटल डैमेज you know uh, we were part of the national geographic society's expedition which they did, and they are doing it for all the rivers of the world i believe but the first expedition they did was uh, sea to source plastic expedition on the ganga river covering two countries bangladesh and india and packaging in fact you are absolutely right packaging and small packaging was a big contributor to plastic waste in the river system and particularly it was driven by the pe people's purchasing ability because people did not have the means to buy larger packaging so for the poor people to increase their uh, this thing it was uh, uh, it was you know uh, uh, done as uh, this thing uh, uh, small packages so absolutely right and you know in fact that is can be a deterrent and that can promote people to look for alternatives in fact uh, the concept of polluter pay should be applied here ma'am dr shivaputra bamanahalli says uh, he wishes you good afternoon and uh, says that himachal is getting carbon credit benefit do farmers yes. get the benefit of carbon credit in himachal i do not think so that farmers are getting it as of now but the state has adopted its uh, you know in in its state plan the uh, valuation of ecosystem services from forest but in small part in there was one study in palampur in which they tried to set up a system of paying the uh, upstream farmer for water services for palampur district but because the payment was so low and it was for a short period of time i am not sure how much successful that program was ma'am mm -hmm. just to add uh, to uh, you i being from himachal pradesh kada we had a project uh, some time back maybe around you know 10 years back we had a project uh, the himachal pradesh biocarbon project but that was under the clean development mechanism so some plantations were carried out and uh, some money was earned but that was a very low amount and it was not much lucrative and uh, as of now i don't think that uh, that particular project is a very highly successful project or something like that so it has got its own uh, weakness and uh, that weakness maybe became very prominent so that was one and uh, uh, regarding this palampur project ma'am it was uh, between the palampur municipal corporation and uh, bohal village yeah and uh, that the bohal village were carrying out grazing and lopping and firewood collection from a particular catchment forest and uh, the water yield of the palampur uh, corporation uh, got reduced the water source was there so the corporation people entered into an agreement with the uh, people of this village bohal village saying that they should not graze in that particular uh, area uh, where the recharge zone of the natural springs are situated and i think an annual payment of maybe 10000 or 20000 was fixed that the municipal corporation will pay to the panchayat but that was a very small small amount so uh, i don't know whether we can really call it as a pes mechanism ma'am your microphone is off ma'am so i don't no, know whether okay. no no it's okay right. i don't know so whether we can call it as a very successful model of pes but yeah well that is i think uh, the first uh, uh initiative something that is based on pes mechanism yes and in fact so, there is a paper published by uh, avasti and rawat on that one so if people are interested they can look it up i think it is 2017 or something there is a paper on this palampur initiative 
And ma'am, I would also like to add that Himachal Pradesh is uh, the only state government in India which has got a policy on payment for ecosystem services. So, and uh, we were the first state in the country to uh, set apart uh, five percent, ten percentage of the, I think five percentage of the uh, cost of the CAT plan, the catchment area treatment plan, uh, for the forest areas being diverted uh, for non-forestry purposes. The five percent of mm. CAT was set aside for uh, PES-based uh, uh, activities. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was very informative, Abhilashji. I'm sure people have benefited from your intervention. And probably you can look up the Himachal case study a little closely because, at, as you rightly said, at the policy level, that is the only place which has been very futuristic enough to actually implement it and uh, do it. But I'm not aware of the nuances, uh, what is really happening. So I really cannot comment on that. But yes, that is the only state which has the policy so far. Uh, and ma'am, Dr. Sudipta Mondal from West Bengal uh, wishes you good afternoon. Uh, he requests you to enlighten him regarding the topic in with respect to West Bengal. Being from West Bengal and Birbhum district more specifically, okay. we don't find such activities regarding environment conservation and services too. I think ma'am, it would be great to spread awareness throughout the country yes. rather concentrate yes. it in some specific parts of the country. Yeah, yeah, true. There are not many studies from West Bengal on uh, basically a pest per se. But remember that West Bengal has been a pioneer in uh, JFM initiatives where the people who conserve the forest, the Arabari example, comes from West Bengal. So I think that is another state which which is really uh, which should have been a very good choice for implementing this kind of measures. Regarding the studies, uh, there are studies from Sundarban from the Bangladesh side and a few studies from India side also. In fact, my, I myself have done studies in mangrove areas, but not in West Bengal, but in uh, Orissa, uh, which was in fact some of the first studies on ecosystem service valuation in the country. And you can look up these studies, otherwise I can share with you. But even from West Bengal, Jadapur University, there are some publications which have come out, particularly regarding Sundarban. Rest others, I have not seen a lot from that area. There are one or two, one paper that we have written from Kaziranga, and that's all. No, well, Kaziranga will be in Assam then. Yeah, nothing then. Ma'am, uh, thank you uh, very much, ma'am. I think. Uh... Ma'am, uh, Abhinav Sahai says, uh, can you suggest few books for studying environmental or ecological economics? So I will uh, suggest you just one book right now. That is an introduction to ecological economics by Costanza. It's a very nice basic book to begin with. And then, of course, there are a lot of books by a uh, lot of people, but Delhi, D-A-I-L-Y, Delhi et al. But the best book is this one, which I have relied on. There are different books protected on uh, cost and benefits of protected areas by Dixon and uh, et al. But this is the best book, An Introduction to Ecological Economics, Constanza et al. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Dr. Sukanya Lal asks whether, uh, first of all, she compliments for the wonderful lecture. Uh, she asks uh, whether the states are using ecosystem services in our country. I think that stands answered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, that is to answer now. Now people have really started talking about it, trying to, uh, as uh, we've talked about Himachal example, even the other state. Now in every policy forum, ecosystem services is at least being acknowledged, discussed, and wherever possible, it is also trying to be integrated. Ma'am, if I'm not wrong, ma'am, correct me, I just uh, yeah. read somewhere if I remember maybe a month back or somewhere, I read that the government of India has initiated a national level project for ecosystem valuation, um, take, being taken care of by Niti Aayog and uh, some other organizations together with it. I have also heard about it, but I really don't know the details about it. In fact, our ministry also wants to do, uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest Climate Change also wants to do a, a, you know, a countrywide program on valuing the ecosystem services from protected areas. And in fact, there was one study commissioned which was on the tiger reserves, which IFM Bhopal had done. Uh, 
and now similarly they want to do it for all the protected areas similarly niti ayog has also i have just read about it but i'm not sure what it in, involves well there are more queries if there are uh, no more queries people prefer uh, typing nowadays they don't want to ask directly so if there are no more questions uh, uh, i would like to uh, enter into the for formality of uh, uh, thanking ma'am uh, ma'am uh, so ma'am uh, uh, thank you very much ma'am for this uh, totally different uh, session and uh, i'm sure that it provided a totally new outlook participants and they would uh, be seriously thinking uh, how this new uh, concept and uh, newly evolving concept can be best utilized and they might also be thinking about how they can incorporate it into their routine uh, work functions in the colleges so uh, thank you very much ma'am on behalf of uh, principal caspar uh, dehradun uh, myself and all the participants sitting here ma'am i express my heartfelt gratitude uh, you have always been a supporting pillar for us uh, and in providing training to both the induction training as well as in service training and this the uh, new training the other stakeholders thank you thank you very much ma'am and uh, uh, we look forward to always uh, have such kind of association with you ma'am thank you very much ma'am thank you very much and it was a pleasure to interact with this group i wish it had been face to face but maybe in future sometime we will get chance to uh, interact but please carry on the message and you are the best people to do it thank you very much thank you ma'am i also would request you to kindly share your presentation on any other reference materials i will send you the presentation and a few uh, papers right ma'am thank you thank you very much ma'am uh, we can take a longer break because uh, we are in, on time and uh, samir would play some videos samir kar raha hu and this is just the first stage this incident which is a tigress um who was caught in a trap was was one of the things that inspired me to become a full-time activist i was just so shocked and disturbed by the fact that this tigress had to suffer such extreme pain I became interested in the whole issue of wildlife crime and poaching because of tigers. And I lived and I still have a, a home there in central India. And the the tigers that I knew really well and that I was photographing and so on suddenly started disappearing. They just vanished. And the tribals there told me that people were coming from outside and asking them questions about the tigers and and asking them to help kill them. I spent 6 uh, weeks touring central India and pretending to be a buyer just to see what the situation was. And I was offered the yeah, I think about 36 freshly killed tigers. The reason why wild tigers are being killed in India is because of the demand for tiger parts in China. Unfortunately, we have this long porous border with Nepal, with China and with Myanmar, and these routes are about 5 or 6 major smuggling routes. They're really very easy. We forget that wildlife crime is the fourth largest illegal occupation in the world. and it's a trade that's worth 19 to 20 billion dollars i had to prove to people and prove to the government that this really was a huge problem otherwise nobody would believe you 
but then after a few months um, of chasing these criminals and documenting all this information, I realized I had to have an organization behind me. I formed the Wildlife Protection Society of India. Any news? Yeah, the news is that uh, today morning we have got information that two tiger skins were seized in Akhorda. And any, are there tiger bones as well? Yes, skins and bones were seized. So this yeah. is a tiger trap that's been used and it was seized by the Chinooba, yeah, Forest Department, the, the buffer zone of Chinooba. Oh. It is, it is just a crude contraption. See, it's not made in any factory. But no tiger can survive this. No tiger can escape from this trap. They have brilliant knowledge of tiger behavior. The moment the tiger steps on a trap, it gets trapped. Then they would approach the tiger and uh, spear it in the throat to, to um, silence it. And they just club it to death with sticks. They'll, they'll hit the tiger on the skull and the backbone. But they don't want the, the skin to be damaged. Yeah. Mostly the organized poachers are nomadic in nature. So we really have to have very good informants who keep a track of uh, movement of poachers all over the country. And uh, the informants many times uh, generate very good leads about uh, what the poachers are up to. We have a secret information reward scheme for giving any piece of information relating to poaching. And the rewards uh, range from 5,000 rupees to 15,000 rupees, depending on the nature of the information. The Indian government has spent a phenomenal amount of money on tiger protection. I think that the figure is something like $120 million in the past five years. One thing for sure is that this you know, unrelenting pressure for, for tiger parts, has, something has to be done about it. And it's coming from one place, and that's China. Unless the world can persuade China to ban all trade in tiger parts from all sources, whether it's captive or wild, I think it'll be very, very difficult for wild tigers to, to survive for you know, generations to come. यार एक बात बताओ घर बैठे बिठाए ऑनलाइन काम करके महीने का कितना कमाया जा सकता है चलो छोड़ो मैं आपको अपनी पिछले महीने की ऑनलाइन अर्निंग दिखाता हूँ गूगल ने मुझे लास्ट मंथ पेमेंट किया है तीन हजार दो सौ छियानवे डॉलर एक डॉलर अभी पचहत्तर रुपए के ऊपर चल रहा है यानी दो लाख सैतालीस हजार रुपए और ये दूसरी अर्निंग दो लाख पंद्रह हजार नौ सौ उन्नीस रुपए और ये तीसरी अर्निंग दो लाख के अराउंड यानी महीने में टोटल सात लाख के अराउंड तरीके बहुत हैं ऑनलाइन कमाने के पर इस वीडियो में मैं बात करूंगा सबसे आसान तरीके के बारे में जिससे मैं महीने के सात लाख के ऊपर कमाता हूं पर उससे पहले मुझे आप एक बात बताओ अगर आपको महीने में एक लाख रुपए मिले और डेली बस दो से तीन घंटे काम करना हो टाइम अपने हिसाब से सिलेक्ट करके पूरे दिन में कभी भी और ना ही ऊपर से किसी बॉस का प्रेशर हो तो क्या आप ऐसा काम करना चाहोगे मतलब साल में जब मन करे छुट्टी ले सको और पिछले साल जो काम किया है उसके भी पैसे आपको हर महीने कुछ ना कुछ मिलते रहे सर्दी गर्मी बरसात का कोई टेंशन ना हो आराम से आप अपने घर बैठ कर काम करते रहो तो क्या ख्याल है ऐसा काम करना चाहोगे मतलब सुबह शाम दो से पांच की ना जॉब की टेंशन हो ना ट्रेवल भगाओ यार इसको स्किप एड प्ले द अदर वीडियो वैल्यू ऑफ फ्लावर्स समीर प्लीज प्ले द अदर वीडियो लिंक
river at Badrinath is fed by thousands of rain-swollen streams tumbling down from some of the most remote and awe-inspiring corners of the Himalayas. Dominating the scene is Nandar Devi, India's second highest peak. Regarded as a goddess in her own right, she shelters the Bayandar Valley, one of the most magical places in India. Covered in snow for much of the year, the valley is transformed during the short summer into a botanical wonderland, the Valley of Flowers. Who could not believe that this is a blessed place? clouds wash over these high meadows, coaxing new blooms from the rich glacial soils. Over 600 plant species have been found here, and by the end of July, Himalayan balsam cloaks the valley in pink. Through the short summer season, the valley is abuzz with activity. Male monal pheasants are getting a little overheated, trying to attract a mate. And in the warm air, newly emerged insects gather in mating swarms. But for others, life in the valley is more relaxed. Coral are small goat antelopes, perfectly suited to life on the rugged grassy hillsides. Small family groups must make the most of the rich grazing before the summer ends. of meadow flowers provides the local hill people with one of their most treasured harvests. In these remote valleys, virtually everything has to be homegrown. Watered by mountain streams and warmed by the late summer sun, the village terraces are bursting with new life. It feels like a high altitude garden of Eden. Sometimes people believe that just because they are
कनेक्शन छूट गया हटो यहां से छूना भी नहीं छोटे से क्यों समीर समीर काइंडली प्ले दैट मंगूस हेयर ब्रश वाला वीडियो मंगूस हेयर ब्रश फॉर पेंटिंग हाँ आप मंगूस हेयर ब्रश यूज करते हैं बहुत लंबा वीडियो है बीस मिनट का वीडियो है डो नॉट बाई ट्रबल ठीक है अरे का वीडियो मिल जाएगा आपको ट्रैफिक इंटरनेशनल का है हम्म अभी करता हूँ वो वीडियो सुन के मेरे को नोट बना रहे ना उसका इसीलिए नहीं तो रिपोर्ट बना भी देता लेकिन वो वो क्या बोला वो बंदे ने वो मेरे को सुनना पड़ेगा टाइम नहीं मिल रहा है दो घंटा से ज्यादा कौन मांग रहे Incredible India, a land of immense natural diversity, home to a large variety of flora and fauna. But today, many of these species are endangered, threatened by the growing illegal trade in wild animals, plants, and their derivatives. India's Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 provides protection to over 1800 species. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora (CITES) bans the trade in over 830 species and restricts the trade in over 33,000 species. India has been a member of CITES since 1976. Yet, despite strict laws, illegal wildlife trade continues because, unknowingly, we all participate in it. Tigers, India's national animal, have been reduced to critical numbers. Yet, the skins, bones, derivatives of all Asian big cats command a high value and lead to their illegal killing. Many endangered and rare corals and shells are sold as souvenirs in our coastal regions. Sharks are illegally butchered because their fins are exported for exotic food like shark fin soup. Elephants are brutally killed for their tusks. 
Ivory figurines, carvings and jewelry command a high price in illegal markets. Trade in wild Indian bird species is prohibited, but they are part of the illegal live bird pet trade. For every bird that reaches its final destination, many die on the way. Trade in reptile skin products of scheduled species is banned, but handbags, belts, wallets and other products are still offered for sale. Shatu shawls are tainted with the blood of Chiru, a highly endangered antelope. It is illegal to buy or sell Shatu shawls. International trade in 29 species of medicinal plants, orchids, timber, etc. in the raw form is prohibited, but it continues unabated. Rare butterflies are reduced to curios and souvenirs. Bear bile from endangered bear species and musk pods from the Himalayan musk deer can still be offered illegally for sale. The list is long and ever increasing as we push more and more species to critical numbers. Don't buy trouble. When you buy or acquire an illegal wildlife product or souvenir, you may actually be buying trouble for yourselves. Hunting of protected species of wildlife or possession of and trade in them or their derivatives is illegal and severely punishable under the law. As a concerned citizen, you can help. If you come across any information on wildlife trade, you may contact the local forest or police officials, customs at airports, seaports and other international transit points, regional offices of the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, Traffic India. Remember, unnatural treasures are a common heritage for each of us to enjoy, cherish and protect. Act now before it is too late. Stop the wildlife trade. The eyes of the world are watching.
हमारे में बाबा जी पक्की इन्फॉर्मेशन है इसके बारे में दुकान की भी है ये कहाँ का है सब की हमारे पास इन्फॉर्मेशन आप अभी निकाल के बाद में तो वो भी मैं ऐसे निकाल के रोक सब आप बेटे कहाँ पे लिखो कहाँ से ले जाते हो अरे किस नो को लेके आओगे फिर इसमें कहीं लिखा हुआ है ये मार्का अरे पहला सेट के नाम से पहला सेट तो आती पर ये बड़ा किसी चीज का वो नहीं है ये लिखा हुआ नहीं है तो ये लिखा हुआ है क्या पहला सेट ये बिल 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 भी रखना पड़ेगा जी अभी ये बस तो ये सारे बुरुसी हैं क्या बुरुसी तो हैं आज का बुरुसी तो दौरान कोच कोच ने की पूछने ये बैनर से कलम का तो ये ये बेटा और कितनी वो निकालो आप भी बबलू हाँ ये रिकॉर्डिंग होगी हमारे पास काम में ये लगाई जा कहाँ कौन सी जगह भाई है � आ जाए या फिर ये फिर फारी कर दे ये सब So, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to show a small video about uh, mongoose hair brush. Uh, most of us, you know, the artist people, they like to use mongoose hair brush, but uh, this video was a longer version. There was a shorter version. I'm sorry, they by mistake, they played the longer version. So, there was a shorter version also. Uh, so mongoose hairbrush is available, uh, it's illegal, it is banned uh, because it is obtained from uh, illegally poached mongoose and uh, thousands of thousands of mongoose are killed every day for uh, making this hairbrush. So it was just a small awareness video about mongoose, hair, mongoose hairbrush. Uh, shortly we will be beginning our uh, panel discussion and uh, validatory session. We have combined both together. So I'm just waiting for our uh, uh, chief panelist and the chief guest for the validatory session to join us. I have already joined Avilash. I am already there, dear. Sir, I am Achha, already sir. there. Ah, sir. Main, sir, R, list mein R tha, sir. Saurabh. <laughs> 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 ऊपर लो सौरभ सर को हाँ So good afternoon uh, all, uh, uh, good afternoon sir, uh, today we are going to have our uh, panel discussion and uh, validatory session combined together and I have the honor of uh, welcoming our chief guest uh, and the uh, lead panelist, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rakesh Kumar Sharma, sir mm -hmm. is the Vice Chancellor of the Graphic Era DMTB University, Dehradun. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar uh, Sharma did his PhD in biochemistry 
and received the university's gold medal for best PhD research work in the year 1984. He has also served as an assistant professor in uh, Haryana Agriculture University, Hisar, for the period of 1982 to 1984, before joining the Indian Forest Service in 1984. Sir has over more 16 years of field experience in forest and environment, and more than 20 years of experience in the area of education administration, as Joint Commissioner Navodaya Vidyalaya Samiti, Director Central Tibetan School Administration, Advisor All India Council for Technical Education, Registrar IIT Delhi. Sir has also been the Chief Vigilance Officer in all of these organizations. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Sharma has been on the Board of Governors and other decision-making bodies of the National Institute of Technologies and other universities. Sir sought voluntary retirement at the level of Principal Chief Conservator of Forests while holding the assignment of Education Secretary, Government of Himachal Pradesh to join uh, Graphic Era Deemed University as Vice Chancellor. Sir is a widely traveled person and has uh, uh, lots of expertise besides educational administration. He has expertise in participatory management also. He has attended a number of programs on participatory management, school administration and policy planning in various institute at the United Kingdom, Germany, Japan and USA. Dr. Sharma is also associated with the Dakshina Foundation, an organization which has helped thousands of bright and impoverished students predominantly from rural India to find success in IIT and medical entrance examination as advisor. So th thank you, sir, for accepting our request and invitation to attend this uh, uh, panel discussion and the valedictory function, sir. You have always been uh, supporting us in our training activities and guiding us uh, as an organization and as person also. So thank you very much, sir. And I welcome you to this uh, valedictory session, sir. So just to brief you about the trainings. Um, so this two days online course was uh, online course for the teaching faculty of universities and colleges started yesterday, sir. And uh, we have around uh, 100 participants, sir. And the inaugural session, uh, the chief guest for the inaugural session was Dr. Padam Prakash Bhojwe, sir, the retired IFS officer who is currently serving as uh, uh, jo uh, joint advisor to the National Highway Authority of India. And uh, he was also the vice chancellor of FRI deemed university and director of uh, Forest Research Institute, sir. Uh, sir, thereafter we had a session by uh, Kunal Satyarthi, sir. Uh, he took a session on forest and wildlife management, uh, his, uh, past and present. So starting from the historical perspective, sir, covered topics related to the uh, current scenario of uh, forestry and wildlife in our country, sir. So thereafter, uh, post lunch, I took a session on uh, uh, biodiversity profile of India and uh, uh, the conservation efforts. Sir, uh, after this, uh, there was a session by uh, Mr. Heman Kamdi, Deputy Director uh, uh, of uh, National Tiger Conservation Authority, Nagpur, on uh, status of tiger conservation in India. Sir, today morning, we began with uh, Status and importance of wetlands being handled by Dr. Ritesh Kumar, who is the director of the Wetlands International South Asia. Sir, sir after that, we had a different kind of session, amphibians and reptiles of India and their conservation status. It was taken by Dr. Abhijit Das, sir, scientist D of Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, sir. Sir, and uh, just a few moments ago, sir, the post lunch session was uh, dealt by Dr. Ruchi Badola, scientist G of uh, Wildlife Institute of India. Uh, she talked about ecosystem services. So it was a new kind of uh, uh, information that most of our participants had, sir. And right now, sir, we are in the uh, closing with the panel discussion and uh, validatory function, sir. So the training has been received very well, sir. Uh, it is evident from the day one feedback, sir. Uh, the day two feedbacks are not yet in. Uh, we have uh, collect received and collected and compiled the day one uh, uh, feedback form, sir. Uh, the session taken by Kunal Satyarthi, sir, has been rated uh, with a score of 94.19 uh, percentage, sir. Uh, and the session taken by me on biodiversity profile has been rated as 95.46, sir. And uh, the session uh, taken by Mr. Heman Kamdi has been uh, uh, rated as 93.81, sir. So today's uh, feedback forms are not yet uh, in, sir. So once we get that, sir, we will be compiling that all. So uh, this is in short about the uh, training uh, module, sir, and we have uh, participants as uh, the professors, uh, associate professors, assistant professors, lecturers, scientists, uh, headmasters, and uh, 
a couple of uh, deans of certain colleges and other teaching faculty and there are some other uh, uh, participants also from a different kind of background but there are very few in number uh, so, so the two days long journey uh, the two days uh, short journey was uh, well received sir and we tried to incorporate uh, topics that will be of uh, uh, interest to the participants who come from diversified backgrounds from botany, zoology, physics, mathematics, uh, law. Some of them are even from uh, uh, economics and uh, some of them are having engineering background in uh, uh, technology. So, sir, with this brief, sir, uh, now uh, I would like to open the uh, panel discussion, sir. So, before I request our uh, lead panelist uh, to uh, uh, give his view, uh, may I request uh, some of the uh, participants to kindly just uh, speak a couple of uh, words about their thoughts on uh, role of conservation in uh, uh, role of educational institutions in conservation. Uh, may, I, may I request uh, 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 Mr. Sunil Pathak, Assistant Professor Botany of Maharaja Bhoj Government uh, PG College, uh, Bhopal. Dar, sir, it's Dar. <coughs> Hello, I'm yeah, audible, uh, sir. Civil uh, yes. Uh, sir, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Central Academy for State Forest Services for conducting such a nice program for second time for us. First time we are, we are associated with the IPCO Bhopal. Presently, we are directly associated with you. In these uh, seminars, uh, workshop and seminars, we got uh, very, very informative and new concept about the environmental conservation, especially from the Madam Ruchi Badola in the ecosystem services. It's a unique one. Second thing um, I got about the wetland conservation. What are the wetlands and where? We have to conserve them and in which manner we have to conserve them because they are the many things. Sir, can I discuss uh, some things what we are doing here first and then what we are getting from the above? Can I talk in Hindi, sir? Uh, it would be, uh, Doctor, it would be better if you stick on to English. Maybe you can use Hindi and okay. English mix because we have participants okay. from the southern Indian states as well as from the North India, northeast Indian states. No. So, sir, we are here conducting two types of activities in the Eco Club. One is uh, action activities and other are the awareness activities. In action activities, we are conducting many new fields as uh, biodiversity areas, their conservations, solar and uh, wind energy uses, cleaning of the wa water sources and plantation, then uh, sound pollution, their effects. We are con conducting this. Besides this, we are trying to conduct this year uh, biodiversity register for by students, our students, for their villages and their local areas. Second, we are conducting awareness activities as environmental competitions in different ways, environmental day celebration like Haryali Mahotsav, Vishwa Jalashya Divas, Antarashya Ozone Divas, Vannip Jeev Prani Saptaha, Vishwa Mruda Divas, Vaniki Divas, Vishwa Jal Divas, and these many so the days are observing by us. Then we are conducting some lectures. Then uh, audio visual are also providing to the students for awareness. Sir, what we are uh, getting from this, is one as the biodiversity map of as we are doing it in the school and colleges. Then and value of conserved ecosystem is a new concept we are going to introduce in our program for environmental conservation, a new topic for us. Then we are conducting here based off from the waste material as we are using uh, disposable water bottles for conserving the some orchids and some plants which are 
some uh, plants which are hydrophobic in nature and orchids we are providing their the moisture from these bottles then we are introducing a new concept about the seed bank to the students this all things are we are doing here thank you sir thank you uh, dr pathak thank you sir now may i request uh, dr uh, geeta mathur from uh, delhi university you need to be little bit more loud ma'am am i audible now ha uh, yes ma'am uh, i uh, i'm very happy that uh, uh, avilash ji has selected me to uh, represent the participants here and uh, on behalf of particularly all the teachers who are present here the university teachers college teachers associate professors and professors and uh, assistant professors and uh, i just want to say a big thank you for to the organizers for making this interesting and very important workshop uh, for us uh, and we are all also university teachers are honored to be participants because Uh, most of the scientists who are doing the work in the field especially those on environmental uh, environment related issues they never think of teachers having any role and uh, it was a big surprise when i saw the poster of this uh, workshop because uh, in my more than 35 years of teaching ecology this is the first time i have found that an institution like yours is actually giving so much time and effort to make us get recharged into our teaching can i have the next slide so when the abhilash ji contacted me i was making a long list of things that i would like to say in this present uh, in this uh, panel discussion and since he asked me that that he he, he wants me to be a, a speaker i just quickly penned them down or literally put them on a ppt and sent it to him and uh, these are my follow up suggestions for the organizers as a response to this particular workshop please maintain a mailing list of all organizers speakers experts and participants of this workshop a series of webinars may be organized one in every month or as suitable so that we have some kind of a continuity of what we have learned now share publications of experts many experts have suggested that they will uh, they are willing to share their publications and these will be of uh, direct relevance when you are teaching add an educational section to your website and keep updating it it will be really very very useful for us because the uh, concepts expressed by the scientists may not really go to the students the way they understand and i know most of you who are teachers understand this that teachers can charge up the students faster than the biggest of scientists uh, next make a list of contacts who may be willing to give invited lectures or webinars for students hold internship programs for undergraduates during summer break of universities as if to say catch them young because uh, i feel that nowadays the students who come in for doing uh, graduation in particularly in science they think either engineering or uh, maybe uh, something related to biotechnology something related to molecular biology these are the fields which they should be going in and most of the intelligent or so to say the cream of students generally land up going to uh, these uh, institutions who are doing that and then environment takes a back seat while now as as we have gone through this workshop we realize and everybody here seems to be like minded and uh, believing that this is actually what is very important can i have the next slide please the Uh, you can also start a postgraduate course in whichever institute it may be possible 
on conservation, which may be of direct linkage to established institutions, because this will attract a lot of good students to go into it because when they go to study anything on our environment, they always have a question mark as to what will be their future. And then they go in for places or options which are very easily showing the, them that they will get a job. Then install scholarships for college students if possible, it, from whichever institute it is possible. Those I, I, I'm only targeting the institutions which are related to doing studies and research related to wildlife. Publications or PPT may be put up on social media to make students aware of their role in conservation and management. And of course, emphasize on the difference between conservation and management as far as environment is concerned. Invite students as trainees on your current projects. If they get some hands-on feel, then they realize how much of pleasure there is, how much of happiness and how much of uh, uh, meaning is there in get into this kind of activity. Students, um, student groups should be encouraged to visit institutions and project sites. Can I have the next slide? Here is something I have thought of uh, for discussing with my fellow teachers. Add the readings of publications to current environmental studies papers. In Delhi University and in many other universities, when we have the syllabus at the end, we give readings. And if we include some of these, which are far more updated and relevant as reading materials, they'll go a long way. Then use materials from these experts for teaching in your classes. Because we have some books which are very, very old, and I don't see why should we keep on talking of some Minnesota ecosystem in times when everything has changed. You should know what is right around us. And through these uh, lectures, we have realized that there is so much of wonderful work done by our own people about the ecosystems which are right around us. And the teacher should arrange field trips wherever possible. Take an expert guide on such trips. Don't think that you can manage it. Please take an expert guide so that it becomes more educative and meaningful. Invite experts for lectures and webinars. Assign field-based student projects to small groups of students so that they can spend some time on their own and work out a problem. Students should be encouraged to make presentations on conservation based on the current issues and keep in touch with the experts for advice on current developments in environment. And next slide, please. And that I would like to thank uh, everyone for listening to me. And I have put my email ID. I write a blog on uh, ecology, environmental issues, and covering a lot about plants because I'm basically a botanist. And I also have a website. So if you can, uh, you visit this. And I can, I would love to keep in touch with all the participants of this workshop. Thank you, uh, Abhilashji, for giving me this chance. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, you have uh, not only uh, given us suggestions, but you have also given us some leads as to how uh, the education institutions can tie up with the agencies that are responsible for con conservation in our country. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, may I request Mr. Ojit Singh, uh, Ojit Singh to uh, kindly express his thoughts? Oh, yeah, right. Teacher, right. Teacher, right. Teacher, right. Teacher, right. Teacher, Yeah. Ah. Uh, uh, except the connectivity has been playing hide and seek today a lot. Uh, uh, I hope I'm audible, sir. Yes, yes, you are audible. You are audible. Uh, Avila, sir, thank you. It's an honor to respond to your uh, uh, to your advice, and uh, I'm so happy. Uh, yes, uh, on my personal uh, uh, 
uh, viewpoint, I just want to say that I have been, always been wishing to attend this kind of a program for a long time uh, because the climate crisis and biodiversity loss is one of the most important issues today. So when we were the student, the major that uh, we as a regular student felt was about the global peace and the nuclear warfare. But when I asked the students today, uh, they all are aware that biodiversity loss climate change is an issue. And I'm so happy that I'm a part of this particular subject, which really mainstream these particular two issues. That's why I'm so happy about being a part of this subject and a part of the discussion and the attending webinars and getting knowledge from the highly honorable people who are in this particular field like you. Uh, the, the second, uh, what I have learned from this particular because you have already given dignitaries from the person who is academic and who is an active uh, participant in the maneuvering the whole uh, spectrum of the conservation issues in India. And also you have uh, brought issues like ecosystem services. So after attending your uh, this webinar, what I have felt is uh, the uh, concern of the environment, especially from the ecology and the zoology and botany, and also uh, the things from history and economics. These are not mutually exclusive. It should be inclusive. This is what I have learned. The science of ecology are not, not uh, uh, what is the sigh away from, from the science of politics, economics, and so on and so forth. One more cessation or one more, uh, one more issue that I always feel very strongly nowadays is many of the students, at least in the undergraduate, at least in the common institution where I'm in, the public institution, many of these particular students feel that they are like Gita Dharma. That they will go to uh, the parliament and they become and they become they become and they have this activist zeal. But what I am feeling very sorry is many of the students who are are so actively participating in all the activism, they like the theoretical foregrounding. So here lies the importance of the people like all of us here who are engaged in teaching the theoretical ideas and the, and, and the meanings of ecology. Because without a strong theoretical background, I think activism will not be uh, going uh, forward or will not be progressive. So that's uh, very, very important. Uh, that's what I feel. And last but not least, as far as the education and the syllabi making is concerned, I'm so sorry to tell you that when I joined Delhi University, there was a certain fund allocated for the field trip. So the student had to pay 50% of the total cost. So we used to take the student to Jim Corbett. We used to take the desert, grassland, uh, ecosystem. It was so, so good. I'm not talking about the private institutions. I'm not talking about the students who have the, uh, who, who, who do not have the problem of accessing all those things privately. I'm talking about the public institution where we always try to give equality of access and opportunity at uh, the college level, I think uh, our policy makers should, should be really looking into it that this college student should be given the power and the means to, uh, what I say, access those particular field trips. So that, that, that's something that I really want to, uh, what is it, include or from my own endeavor, I want to uh, tell to the high authority that this is something that we need to take into account because uh, uh, this is a subject which is very theoretical and in the four-sided walls, many of the things cannot be done and seen if you do not go to the field and uh, get to know about it. And uh, we already know that we learn more from the nature and the outside. And this particular student has to go tomorrow to the outside to the field and serve. So uh, my uh, simple the, uh, judgment is uh, those particular things should be revived, our policymakers and the people who are the stakeholders like us in the academic institution, we should be putting uh, all of our efforts forward that the higher authority also yeah. listens and give this opportunity that the students have an access. So there's an equitability and there's an equal, what to say, uh, uh, equitable uh, sharing of that particular opportunity. Last but not the least, I, I just want to uh, also clarify that uh, this particular subject, ecology, field work is not only for those particular person who are normally healthy and so on and so forth because this is our subject which is also mean for all these particular students who are physically challenged so they you already know that we already know about the uh, geo information systems and how 
example, a particular students who could not go to the field and study and chase the tiger, but can also work on the conservation of tigers sitting in the room. So I think this is a subject which is transcending all the boundaries. And if sustainable development goal is the agenda of the whole globe, and we are uh, right now sitting on that particular subject, which will really steer and guide us. Thank you so much again, and thank you. It's a really honor that uh, I get an advice, I get a suggestion from you to say a few words, on, uh, a few words which is very close to me. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Allah, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ujit. Uh, now, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Tara S. Nair from Kerala to kindly speak? Okay, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, share, giving me a chance to say something on this online platform regarding the role of institu educational institutions in conservation. I'm basically a botanist and now a teacher educator in one of the eight uh, training colleges in South Kerala. And uh, regarding the uh, the planning uh, caspers regarding the conservation issues in India, I'm very proud to hear uh, and know about the efforts of scientists in caspers doing a, for, uh, a great number of work regarding conservation. And uh, uh, regarding uh, teacher education curriculum, uh, it is very important to mold uh, the future or the prospective teachers regarding conservation issues all throughout the world and also some uh, local considerations also nationally both nationally and locally and uh, in uh, teacher education curriculum it is very important to highlight uh, the uh, specific role of environmental education and to promote environmental awareness among teachers and about uh, environmental conservation and also uh, with respect to their participation in all the efforts to conserve nature and uh, uh, it will be uh, worth uh, worthy to introduce courses uh, from uh, the side of caspers and other uh, environmental uh, national environmental organizations to enrich prospective teachers to uh, uh, stick on to conservation practices and most probably eco-friendly we have uh, under uh, the University of Kerala in uh, PG program MED course, we have a self-development which, uh, uh, which aims to promote practices promoting eco-friendliness. It helps tra teacher trainees, uh, uh, future teacher educators to identify the components of uh, ecosystems, resources, pollution and sustainability. And also there is a theoretical and practical chances for them to engage in resource management and conservation of resource. So uh, uh, often we find difficult to uh, give classes on conservation strategies because uh, we are not much trained in such strategies and it will be beneficial if uh, institutions like you would uh, teach us uh, to be trained in conservation strategies and resource management you have already given a course two-day course for this it is highly beneficial and also uh, i may request your, your uh, esteemed attention on training uh, school teachers uh, be, uh, from the pre-primary to the tertiary education sector that even though in evs evs Yes, environmental science is a part of a uh, school curriculum, uh, both in uh, ICSC, CBSC, and state level schools. I think students are not at all uh, interested in doing such activities. So I am very sad to point out this fact. Uh, students are usually engaged in technology. They are more uh, techno driven or techno savvy. They like to be more uh, technologically adherent than. Uh, doing something to nature or nature friendly practices and not. So we often ask our students to take up research. Uh, some small research activities or projects uh, uh, that links to the environment and make students participate in environment activities. Environment led activities or uh, uh, something like, like that. Small, small activities like uh, planting of trees, saplings and all rainwater harvesting, etc, etc. So uh, even 
even though we uh, ask them to do something, we have to model. That is what teachers are not doing. Teachers may te teach, but they uh, should practice it also. Uh, I request your kind attention on giving more training. Like that, you have uh, you're doing it now. I'm very happy that you are conducting a training course for teachers at all levels. And it should also uh, be uh, important to train students also. So I invite Apilash ji or uh, I request Apilash ji to turn your attention to uh, training teach much more at the basic or grassroots level and then reach the students. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity for sharing my thoughts. Thank you Abhilash. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Madam. Uh, your point of you know introducing environmental courses in the teachers' training that you are you were pointing out to uh, educate the educators. Uh, so the, definitely that is one of the best strategies that we can have. Uh, so thank you very much, ma'am, for your uh, for your uh, views. And uh, now may I request Dr. Swarnalata from Emerald, Assistant Professor from yeah. Emerald Heights College for Women, Tamil Nadu. Good evening uh, to all. A very uh, good evening to the panel experts and the fellow. Sir, I'm audible. Abdullah, sir. Yes, ma'am, you are audible, ma'am. Am I audible? Ah, yes, ma'am, you are okay, audible. Sir, okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, good evening to all the panel experts and the fellow participants of the two-day training program. I'm Dr. M. Swarnalata from Emirates College for Women, UT, in the Nilgiris. I thank the organizers for. Uh, arranging a very wonderful, informative and excellent um, training program by the eminent speakers. All these sessions were very interesting and informative and it was a very well program, was very well organized. It had all the aspects to be covered, which is required for the conservation issues. Uh, I just want to uh, 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 put two things here. Uh, just by having an eco club and just tree plantations are not the uh, main activities that we can do at uh, for conservations. My view is uh, instead of uh, uh, just planting trees, uh, we can give the importance should be given for the restoration of native species in that particular natural environment. And uh, that will be the better uh, conservation efforts that we can do for bringing back the natural ecosystems and uh, bringing back the fauna, flora, the micro level uh, animals and the plants which would have been uh, restored properly and the biodiversity will be complete uh, in its conservation method. And the take home message that I want for my students that I personally feel is uh, I would be stressed Seeing more on the microclimatic conditions, the wetland biodiversity that uh, Ritish sir was uh, taken, the ecosystem services that was a new topic for us, and the importance of sacred groove, and that would have uh, that uh, that will be very much uh, useful for uh, making or bringing back uh, conservation methods still more uh, closer with uh, some importance of. Uh, uh, having these in uh, their natural habitats and uh, one more thing is the field trips and hands-on training that uh, we as teachers uh, can have and also the students and the most uh, effective uh, way would be uh, both the student and the uh, teachers be brought into this activity of training and uh, that would be better in uh, better and an effective way where both of the student and the teachers will be contributing towards the conservation issues. And once again, I thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity and thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, definitely just planting and doing some eco club activities would not be sufficient. Uh, we do need uh, lots of uh, awareness and training and uh, orientation of the teaching as well as the student community. Uh, towards conservation. Uh, so thank you very much for your uh, observations. Uh, now, uh, uh, may I request our principal, sir, uh, or uh, may I request Biula, Madam Biula, who is my colleague, who is also one of the panelists today, 
to uh, speak about the role of uh, educational institutions in conservation. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I am Bula. I am presently as lecturer of Cash Force Dehradun here. Uh, so the role of educational institutions in conservation, we have been hearing for two days and the role is uh, very high. And uh, as teachers and lecturers, uh, you can uh, mold the future generations and, uh, and it can be uh, infused into the younger minds who are uh, going to be the future generations of India. So I feel the role of uh, educational institution is uh, massive and uh, um, it's huge and it can be done uh, through you teachers, lecturers and professors who are all here. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bula. Before I go to our principal, uh, uh, I would just uh, like to uh, share my views on how uh, education institutions can uh, contribute or play a part in conservation. I have a couple of points. Uh, the first point is uh, reviewing of syllabus. Uh, all of us are, are almost agree about uh, revision of syllabus. And whenever uh, syllabus is reviewed, be it for botany or zoology especially, uh, you might uh, consider including more uh, topics on uh, you know, wildlife, wetlands, restoration ecology, grasslands, you know, grasslands in our country, yeah. the common man calls it as a wasteland, but grasslands are ecologically very, very significant. Not only ecologically, it is socially as well as uh, economically very significant, but you know, it is classified as one of the wastelands. So it's somewhere we need to incorporate all this stuff into our uh, curriculum. Uh, even the uh, national education policy say, speaks about multidisciplinary approach. So these things can also be taught to the students of uh, be it physics or mathematics or any other uh, uh, science. Uh, the second thing that I would like to say is uh, research collaboration. The universities and the colleges can always collaborate with the government departments and agencies that are involved in uh, conservation. For example, I'll just cite a few of them uh, carrying out different kinds of uh, botanical and zoological explorations. You can do biodiversity profiling, be it in an urban area or be it in a forest area or some unique ecosystems or habitats. You know, it might lead to rediscovery of some species that has not been known for quite a long time, discovery of new species, and even checklist for a certain particular area can be uh, brought out by the universities and colleges by uh, through these explorations. The second one is uh, the universities can collaborate in research aspects on ecology like uh, st behavioral studies of animals, the study of their population structure, reproductive physiology, the habitat requirements, and even contribute in long-term monitoring of ecosystems, long-term monitoring of growth of ecosystems and how they develop. Uh, so that can be one of the fields of research. Then uh, the universities and faculty involved in technology like the BTEC in electronics or automation or mechanical or the technical or the computer or the IT sectors, they can think of, you know, uh, coming out with solutions like, uh, you know, some solutions, real time solutions for man and solving the man animal interface or the man animal conflict that we very often use and uh, devices and mechanisms and algorithms for uh, monitoring of ecosystem attributes, monitoring of population, you know, plantation technology and nursery. Uh, most of the tree species that we grow in the nurseries and the plantations, we have a standardized uh, technology which we have been using since quite a long time. So maybe the plant physiologists and botanists can work on it and provide the forest department with better solution of raising better and high performing nurseries and uh, afforestation activities with a huge success rate. Then uh, people in the chemistry uh, department, they can think about uh, phytochemistry studies like uh, bioprospecting or uh, ethnobotany and documentation of the active ingredients of various uh, plant-based uh, uh, drugs and uh, uh, recording of uh, all these uh, phytochemicals. Uh, it can do a huge uh, contribution to the mankind. Uh, then uh, most of the universities, now even the government of India is speaking about lots of innovations and incubation centers. And I am sure that many of the universities would be having their own incubation centers and innovation centers by whatever name you are calling it. So 
uh, finding solutions to forestry and wildlife problems can become one of the uh, mandates of these incubation centers or innovation centers where where, where the, your universities are uh, associated with uh, associated with and uh, you know always you can come up with alternative yeah. uses uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, in uh, change of climate uh, in in the scenario of climate change or something like that you can the many innovations can come from your universities because the young brains they have got lots of ideas you just need to channelize them and uh, in the field of education and awareness of course uh, in the higher education institutions especially the post graduate and the phd uh, the doctoral education you know the selection of thesis topics dissertation topics term papers etc can be based on something related to conservation and understanding our uh, ecosystem and its components uh, better it can be in any field it can be if it's a st physics student the physics students can always go and study the abiotic components and their relation with the biotic components it it can uh, go well very well with the ecosystem uh, thing uh, similarly uh, most of the uh, speakers just before this the five uh, participants who spoke they always spoke about certain kind of field interaction the students can be exposed to the field situation and uh, uh, what's happening in the field how things are done how a habitat is managed and uh, how they can study all these things so and the value of all this uh, ecosystem and uh, the biodiversity can be uh, exposed to the students by way of uh, uh, intensive field visits uh, you know learning uh, uh, you are better people to, to speak about uh, education but what i feel is that uh, people learn more when more from the field rather than sitting in the classrooms so you know outdoors are very important and for such outdoor visits you can always uh, uh, get in touch with the local forest departments and uh, we as an academy here we also uh, facilitate the college students uh, like in the past uh, last year we had uh, the students from uh, jawaharlal nehru university the jnu delhi uh, coming over here and uh, we facilitated a, a role of forestry in natural disaster uh, yeah. manage in disaster management and we also facilitated their field visit to wildlife areas so that was one and every year we get uh, students from across the country from tamil nadu agricultural university from kerala agricultural university uh, and uh, in february we are going to get uh, students from uh, uh, forest college and research institute uh, telangana so uh, we coordinate with them we take them for field visits we facilitate them so you should uh, uh, give a wider uh, exposure to the students by getting in touch with uh, the state forest departments or uh, agencies like us in the field so these were some of my uh, observations plus uh, if you go through the national education policy it also speaks about uh, you know uh, multidisciplinary approach and uh, it speaks about universities uh, that are uh, either uh, preferring too much of research or they concentrate more on education or they want to maintain a balance between the two so this is the right time when the new education policy has set in it provides lots of opportunities to uh inc incorporate uh, several aspects related to environment and forest in the curriculum and the way in which our universities are uh, imparting uh, conservation education to the students so that's what was my opinion now uh, sir may i request kunal sir to throw some reflections uh, upon the role of uh, conservation uh, education institutions on conservation sir kunal sir thank you avilash and uh, i welcome uh, the gps of the uh, valetry session uh, dr rakesh kumar sir uh, vice chancellor of the graphic era university and a very uh, distinguished uh, forest service officer uh, from the cadre of himachal pradesh and uh, uh, thank you sir for accepting our invitation and uh, um, uh, presiding over in the valetry session and the panel discussion uh, because there is no as i told in the inaugural session also it is difficult to find a combination of a, a forester who knows conservation issues and who also knows the educational institutions so the inaugural session uh, chief guest uh, had that uh, mix of experience of uh, academician and technical competence and administrative acumen and also a lot of uh, uh, teaching and heading uh, terry university and the fri deem university similarly uh, our chief guest for the valetry session dr rakesh kumar sir is uh, Uh, is a forester by heart because he was born into the forest service but uh, uh, i think uh, 
He has spent most of the time uh, in the educational sector, and sir has spent a pretty long time in Navodaya Vidyalaya and IIT Delhi and in the Technical University, and now as Secretary of Education in Government of Himachal Pradesh, and now uh, he is the Vice Chancellor of one of the largest uh, private uh, university, uh, private sector university in Uttarakhand, and also in North India. So welcome you, sir, and. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, the course director Abhilash Damodaran for uh, uh, stitching this course and uh, running it through uh, uh, for the last two days and planning for almost two months before that to arrange the best resource persons and to contact the uh, participants, the vice chancellors and all the, uh, so the outreach has been uh, uh, amazing and also all the participants because uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, academically charged group. I saw, as I told earlier also, if you look at the participant list, because which we can see only online, uh, it is all uh, half of it is uh, uh, doctor so and so, doctor so and so. It's, it's actually uh, professors and lecturers and associate professors and uh, deans of the colleges who are attending this training course. Uh, we started this training course with some all the nine courses that we are doing for all the various stakeholders that I told you in the inaugural session. Uh, we already done a training program for uh, the teachers, almost 800 eco club in charges training program and then we did for media personals and uh, then we have done for lawyers and defense counsels and um, thereafter for the police department and uh, now we are doing for the uh, uh, gurujis of the uh, country uh, uh, at the high level because the conduit from being a student of a school uh, to get into a job is through the college and the universities uh, where you uh, get into a particular skill and upgrade that skill and become worthy to get into the uh, job workforce and the jobs that uh, the students uh, desire to get into. Uh, so uh, thanks to, uh, and I have told that it would have been great to have these 91 participants attending the validity session offline, uh, present in this campus and uh, meeting you in person, exchanging ideas with you over a longish training program. But uh, time is the only limited factor on earth, apart from land that I was talking in, the, you know, uh, in my lecture uh, in the sovereignty concept. So. Uh, uh, um, uh, even if it is online, I see a lot of, uh, I heard all the uh, five panelists who spoke about this, uh, uh, the training program, and uh, I totally I agree with uh, uh, some of them uh, who have quoted about the strong disconnect there uh, between the uh, practitioners, so a very strong disconnect between uh, the foresters and the wildlifers and the environment uh, laws implementers on one side, and uh, the scientist community on the other side, working in the Wildlife Institute of India or the uh, or the various institutions that you represent, various universities and the uh, uh, Forest Research Institute and the Forest Survey of India and so on and so forth. And the disconnect uh, uh, between this second group and the third group. Uh, the third group is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, learner teachers and professors of the universities and colleges. And these three groups never meet each other. And that is a sense of worry and that is what... Uh, Dr. Geeta Mathur was flagging in a very elaborate and uh, nice presentation of uh, four slides. Very, very, very important. All the points were very important to note down. But uh, that disconnect is uh, so, uh, so, uh, so apparent in the, uh, particularly in the Indian scenario and maybe world over also. Uh, that disconnect is what we wanted to uh, sort out a bit and um, make that uh, bridge smaller. Uh, that uh, disconnect should be shorter. So this was a small attempt, a uh, very small attempt of two days. Uh, more of not a training program. Uh, it's difficult to train uh, professors and teachers who are the, basically the trainers of the country. Uh, I know I told that it is also difficult to sit through lectures when you are actually uh, used to lecturing. So all of you have sat through these two days of uh, almost seven or eight sessions on various various uh, topics, uh, including managerial topics and uh, um, getting into tiger conservation uh, and then going on to wetlands, uh, which a lot of foresters also don't uh, appreciate and understand. Uh, let me tell that because it is a very different world that Ritesh talks about. And then moving on to a very small creatures of reptiles and um, uh, amphibians, which uh, people love to hate. Uh, so there was a lecture on that and uh, Dr. Abhijit does that very well and sensitizes people of all levels on these uh, very important uh, faunal uh, group of uh, species. And then uh, a new concept of ecosystem. So that mix of the uh, topics was uh, very, very different. It moved from one topic to the next. It was not a very cohesive thing, but uh, that's the idea of the organizers, you know, to bring in as much as possible and make it as, as interesting as possible. So, uh, 
uh, having handled uh, before uh, this posting, I was working in Himachal Pradesh and I have seen the Eco Club program. I was implementing the uh, Science Congress and the Eco Club program and the uh, various schemes of DBT and DST in the uh, state of Himachal Pradesh. So, uh, just uh, a few of the uh, take home ideas as a panelist, I'd like to say that uh, there's a lot to do. And I totally agree with uh, all four of you who shared your idea that. Uh, uh, students have stopped going to the field anymore. And I remember my days as a student of Botany in Delhi University, uh, doing uh, graduation and post graduation from Delhi University. And, in, uh, and the teachers those days used to take us to these tours. And uh, I remember Professor H.Y. Mohan Ram and Professor C.R. Babu used to make sure that there's a lot of uh, off uh, on the field learning. And that was so important. If that has gone down in the universities and colleges, it's a matter of concern, but uh, that needs to be enhanced. And uh, it has to come from both sides. It has to come from the uh, academic uh, community. It also has to come from the foresters and the wildlifers wherever they are uh, working and are posted. So uh, uh, some of the activities that I was thinking about, uh, one, somebody was listing about uh, uh, like making of the people's biodiversity register in case there are a lot of botanists and uh, zoologists in this forum and uh, agriculture and um, uh, forestry background uh, teachers here. Uh, that is offering a lot of scope. Uh, uh, that should be uh, made somehow as a summer school internship program uh, or a semester-based uh, program with some credit points. But you need to take out these botany students and zoology students or agriculture students and uh, forestry students out of the uh, cozy classrooms of the uh, colleges and universities and take them out in the field. And the People's Biodiversity Register, as the chief guest was also uh, mentioning, uh, uh, is giving a lot of opportunity. Uh, sharing from my own exper experience, when I was encountered this problem of uh, making all the PBR uh, registers of uh, 3,322 uh, local bodies in the state of Himachal Pradesh. I could have done it uh, myself by hiring a lot of people or through the uh, non-governmental organizations and set up. But I resorted to giving uh, in, in a two or three districts to every university. <clears throat> and they were doing pretty well. And uh, like Himachal Pradesh University was making the uh, PBR registers for the districts of Shimla and Kinnor. And there, were, there are various other universities in the state like the uh, Palampur University or the non-university and forestry, school of forestry. So they were doing the PBRs and uh, they all actually resorted to uh, taking out the MSc forestry and MSc botany students uh, and took them to the field and uh, trained them how to make a, make a people's biodiversity register. And that would give you much better idea uh, from the conservation perspective uh, for both the uh, students and the teachers to go out in the field and actually identify a plant by seeing the plant. And, uh, believe me, with the NGT, uh, NGT National Green Tribunal uh, uh, coming after the uh, National Biodiversity Authority and the Ministry, um, that you have to make 100% uh, uh, biodiversity management committee in the country, in all the local bodies, at the panchayat level, at block level, at district level, even at the uh, city levels, municipal councils and municipal corporations also need to have a um, BMC committee uh, and also a people's biodiversity register. Uh, I remember Shimla has a People's Biodiversity Register. Shimla has a Biodiversity Management Committee. So that gives a lot of opportunity uh, to venture out into the real world of uh, uh, conservation, whether to a nearby uh, wildlife sanctuary or a national park uh, or a, a normal forest area or the agricultural fields of people. And look at species growing in the uh, agricultural field or look at cattle species uh, present or the fish species in the rivers. So that opportunity should be um, availed for and it should come from both the sides. And, uh, that gives a lot of opportunity to um, do hands-on uh, training on uh, uh, various conservation issues uh, in the uh, in the uh, country currently. So that is my first understanding. Second is uh, take your students and all the faculty members should go on uh, small walks or treks or um, Saturday walks maybe into the wilderness and uh, try to go out in the open. You can always rope in the local forest department. They would be more than uh, eager to help you, if not on long tours and camping and trekking. Uh, mandatory uh, weekly uh, walk to a forest area, uh, whether it is the Aravalis uh, in the Delhi region or any other uh, forested area or park or urban park uh, where you are, uh, where your university or college is located. That should be uh, very important and that should be um, uh, promoted in the colleges and universities. And that would actually uh, make uh, uh, the goal of conservation, uh, the uh, wildlife and forest conservation in this country uh, come into reality and make it more pragmatic and contemporary. So two things, uh, I think a lot of things people have already talked about. You can also uh, organize a lot of, uh, uh, I, I borrow from Geeta, Dr. Geeta Mathur's uh, slide, 
uh, we could share all the uh, list of resource persons that we bank upon. Uh, this is only two days. Uh, we run uh, two year courses. So there's a lot available. And only thing is that information is lacking. So there are subject matter specialists available. Uh, we could collaborate and uh, find it for you. And you could organize a popular lecture series. You know, when you're teaching uh, a subject of say algae for and uh, fungi and pteridophyte and angiosperm or embryology for a pretty long time in a college setup, it uh, starts getting um, uh, getting uh, monotonous for some time. And it's good good change. Uh, so maybe you have a Monday uh, uh, special lecture or a Friday special lecture. And we would be ready to help you uh, in getting those people, uh, if not in the in the academy, across the uh, country, if there are people available. We maintain a database of uh, people doing good practical work, uh, people having good scientific papers and doing academic work, both varieties. So you, you I think all the uh, all the participants should make sure that they um, utilize these resource persons and make it more, more, more and more challenging and also interesting for the uh, students. Uh, so that is my second uh, understanding. And the rest of the other stuff has already been talked about. And uh, that is standard eco club uh, programs like uh, observing uh, various days, you know, wetland day and forest day and uh, wildlife day and uh, so on and so forth. So holding rallies and uh, awareness workshops on uh, helping in plantations in the colleges or nearby. Uh, maybe you adopt a park, uh, you adopt a road, or adopt a nearby forest area if land is not available inside the education institution. But those are standard programs, you know, and standard awareness programs. They're very important. They, I'm not undermining their importance, but uh, uh, they do play an important role. But I'm just trying to uh, highlight some other issues. So we could also go for signage inside the uh, inside your institution, say this is a no plastic zone. And maybe start doing green auditing of your own institutions about water usage in your uh, institutions and uh, energy utilization in your institutions. So how to make it better? And uh, that is what the uh, students should be uh, trained to think about and find solutions and implement those solutions. Uh, I think money would not be a constraint to a large extent, uh, uh, but there should be uh, there should be a lot of demonstrative stuff uh, uh, lying in these colleges and uh, universities. Uh, all the departments concerned uh, preaching about recycling or reusing or um, uh, reducing uh, waste. So those are important things not only to do, but also to show uh, that the concerned college or university is serious about this and they uh, mean business and they want to train their uh, students into this uh, platform. So uh, these are some of my uh, ideas that I thought I'll share with you, uh, apart from the standard programs that the National Green Corps program of the MOEF talks about uh, uh, establishing eco clubs and um, um, uh, doing various activities. So these are some of the additional things that I thought I should share. And uh, that disconnect is so critical. And that disconnect uh, that has been highlighted by Sunil Pataji and, and Gita Mathur Madam also and Ojit uh, Saab and uh, Dr. Tara uh, Nair. So uh, that disconnect is what we're trying to bridge. We will, in the academy uh, and in the uh, MOEF, uh, try to do the best possible to bridge that gap and to uh, make uh, everybody come onto the same platform. Like in this training program, we had uh, uh, two, three IFS officers talking to you, or forest service officers, and three scientists talking to you. So it was a good mix and uh, inaugural by one forester uh, ha having a very strong academic background and the uh, valetry by, by, I'm looking forward to hearing from the uh, chief guest of the valetry session. But uh, uh, that is what we are trying to do and that is what my ideas are about uh, how to uh, make this uh, process yeah. going ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blash, and I think we can carry forward this if you... Uh, thank uh, you very much, sir. Uh, sir, there are, uh, before we listen to our lead panelist and chief guest, uh, there are many comments that are coming up in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Richa Sharma says that uh, she teaches biodiversity conservation and she does her best to, to impart knowledge for better understanding of conservation. But uh, uh, she says that it is not enough to bring out the required zest. So she feels that Eco Club and uh, tours for the students will be more helpful. Uh, definitely, that's what uh, we have also been highlighting. There has to be a connect, and uh, this, uh, the connection comes when you go to the field. Uh, we have a, a suggestion from Yas yeah, Rinja, who says that biodiversity walk can be one way to expose students to the rich biodiversity around them. O Ojit Kumar Singh again says that planting non-native species uh, should be uh, discouraged and... Uh, there are some other comments also. Yeah, Dr. Abdul Hamid, uh, he says about, you know, an institution can 
adopt a degraded ecosystem and uh, restore it back uh, that is a very good and this kind of places where which you you adopt and you restore it back can also act as a demonstration plot for scientific purposes research purposes and awareness purposes that's a very good idea uh, an institution can adopt any degraded ecosystem nearby it can be a small wetland or it can be a small patch of forest or a sacred grove or uh, any other kind of ecosystem uh dr krishna kumar choudhury says that he would like to suggest offline workshop for a week uh yeah uh, given the current circumstances it was not possible but definitely the moment uh, things are fine uh, we will be having this module in offline mode only yeah. and all of you would be always welcome to casfos so that we can sit across and talk more about these topics <clears throat> if anybody has got any more comments kindly you can before we listen to the lead panelist uh, you can just uh, speak in uh, maybe a couple of minutes hi sir very good evening to all is it audible ah uh, yes i think is dr kumara guru yeah, yeah. you are audible yes sir thank you thank you for a wonderful uh, organizers first of all i would like to thank for organizers this is the first ever uh, i never come across for uh, this kind of institutions can open minded talk in past uh, today and yesterday even uh, last day even uh, i was uh, amazing with uh, mr kunal satyarthi is uh, ifs officer is the presentations he gave a wonderful uh, answer to our discussion hours in whatever the questions we discussed and many of uh, after that all presenters even um, the, the uh, abilesh uh, damodaran uh, your presentation also we asked many questions this kind of uh, open minded discussions uh, for helpful for all the peoples as well as in the country because uh we can't say even any one of or maybe even uh, any kind of ifs officers or maybe any kind of scientists or any kind of researchers can preserve and protect in our ecosystem or any of our uh, forest yeah. so we need to unite together for all aspects even from honorary layman to even advanced institute whatever it may be in even remote sensing and jis whatever it may be because nature is uh, always with us because nature is having all the aspects even flora fauna insects butterflies even uh, tiger leopard even uh, such a big uh, elephant all those things likewise many people we have to all kind of irrespective of all communities whoever uh, studied whoever studied in india and abroad whatever it may be but we need to unite together for protect our uh, ecosystem and environment thank you for giving a opportunity and uh, thank you for you guys uh, rocking last two days so this kind of uh, rocking performance i am always expecting uh, because i am working more than two decades in the field of conservation i never ever come across this kind of uh, uh, webinars or like a conference so because you people need to open your mouth then only we come to know because even last uh, two days how our indian uh, forest office many people can criticize even uh, many of our journalists many of local people they can criticize what these people are doing just uh, simply lying that doesn't know anything like that but after come whoever maybe i don't know uh, many of our uh, journalists whether they come across in professional way of in uh, journalism or not but maybe this kind of person if they would attend yesterday and today in meeting means they won't write this kind of uh, activities and so this one i need to request all the people and whoever the presenters and organizers so at least monthly once you come to public then only we come to know what we are working why for because we won't say we don't want to take such a responsibility forest officers only can protect in forest or ecosystem our intention is we studied we know we can guide for others we don't want to take such responsibility we have to give responsibility for all the people this is the citizen you are uh, this is the country you are the citizen of this country you have rights to protect and your mother's earth so thank you for your wonderful presentations and organizers sir thank you so much uh, thank you for uh, once again thank you all Uh, thank you dr kumar guru uh, rightly said uh, we had already had a session with the media personnel of the country we had a similar kind of two days module for the media personnel and it was well received we had more than around 200 participants in that 
and it was very well received and it was a wonderful program they also appreciated that the role of forest department is uh, something totally different so thank you very much for your comments and uh, dr swarnalata uh, says that uh, to uh, inform them the future training for faculty and students i would like to rem remind them that uh, whatever trainings we plan it is first put on our uh, website so kindly stay connected with us on our website we are also there on twitter and facebook so whatever trainings we organize uh, we put there well in advance so whatever trainings are there you can just uh, keep it in a track and then join the appropriate uh, training module that we conduct over here uh, parminder kaur uh, madam parminder kaur says that uh, field visits for, should have been arranged uh, we agree to that uh, even uh, dr ojit kumar speaks about on hand training and field visits uh, definitely in an offline uh, yeah. mode uh, field visit is an integral part of our training we take the participants to the field we take them to the forest area we show them the habitat management activities the importance whatever we teach we explain it to them in the field but uh, you know the online platform has got certain restrictions but still we tried to mix our uh, lecture sessions with uh, videos uh, of uh, forestry aspects and biodiversity conservation from different parts of the country so we uh, with the limited uh, facilities of a webinar being a webinar we have tried that but uh, yeah on an offline mode we will be definitely doing it so thank you all uh, for your comments uh, uh, may i request our lead panelist and the chief guest uh, uh, dr rakesh kumar sir to kindly uh, share his thoughts sir uh, hi avilash can you hear me uh, yes sir can you can you can see me also yes sir loud bold and clear sir so my sir thank you dear uh, at the outset i will request kunal not to take cognizance of certain data quoted by abilash when he told his feedback is 95 and his direct is 94 march is approaching kindly don't don't take cognizance of this acr likhne so to start it on the light runs it was on the light run having said so it does raise some expectations from me because if it is the type of feedback the speakers have got uh, i i don't know if i'll be able to do justice to the role assigned to me as uh, to deliver the very big ideas in fact the moment i got this uh, uh, invite to deliver this validatory address uh, and i pondered over the issue initially i thought that it is just another validatory address but then when i started pondering over the issue and then when i saw the composition of the group i was really worried that whether i'll be able to do justice because i am supposed to teach well the credit is means preach if not teach i'm supposed to preach to those who are actually practicing all these things which i'll be preaching about so i knew that i may sound hollow so i decided uh, not to study but to share certain experiences i had as a forester and later as an education administrator having served navodaya as iits and education department of himachal center for the school administration i thought let me better restrict myself to sharing of experiences and then if it evokes certain discussions probably we can interact abilash how much time do i have because i'll have to uh, if you can see certain papers i'll just jotting down what's ever up to my mind so i have to try to organize it but still may like to uh, spill over time what is the time allotted to me or how much time do i have please please tell me uh, sir we can have sir uh, 20 minutes sir 20 minutes so the time it is now 5 i'll try to finish by 5:20 my dear friends i the, i i i saw the feedback i saw the response of your director kunal and i am observing the comments which are being offered and it makes me very confident the program has been delivered with the impact it desired to have many congratulations kunal many congratulations abilash for having conducted it so wonderfully well and obviously participants interest is more important is equally important Uh, for the program to be impactful and i am very happy to see that participants were very participative and very active thank you very much for organizing this because it is an area which belongs to me forestry i am very glad to see that my successors my younger brothers they are holding this flag so high and they have taken this flag to much higher levels than where i left it couple of years back sir because sabse pehle to let me see how relevant this issue is the relevance of issue i i will try to Uh, summarize it in small small uh, some sub topics relevance is you say 
if there is an accident on the road, if I go and help the victim of the, then I am doing some philanthropy. But if a police personnel does it, he takes the victim of the road accident to a hospital. He can't claim anything because it is a part of his duty. And that is where I like to underline the tone and tremor of my validity to address the issue, the environmental conservation, the promotion of environmental conservation through educational institutions, through teachers, to me is a part, is an essential part of my duties. So if I don't discharge these duties, I'm not failing to discharge something which was peripheral to my responsibilities. I'm failing to discharge something which was integral, which was core to my responsibilities, and that is going to set the tone and tremors. With this, I may on occasions sound a little uncomfortable to you when I'll uh, probably discuss as to what is the status today. I may kindly be excused because having spent more than 20 years in actually field educational administration, I have a couple of things to share. That also because probably it will have its own impact. Now, having discussed relevance, importance, I will not discuss the importance over the last two days. It must have been discussed the role of environmental conservation, biodiversity conservation, wildlife and forest and all those things. I don't need it. But let me discuss one thing. What has the community, the government given to us, my dear friends, teachers, I'm addressing you. We have been handed over. I A couple of days back on 26 January, while addressing my students on Republic Day, I also told the same thing. I'm again going to repeat it. What is with us? We are having that resource of the country, which is most important for its development. And it is so precious. If the society, if the government has faith in us while handing over this resource, the resources, human resource, with the pedagogic uh, edge I have, with the demographic dividend I have, the youngest population in the world and knowledge economy having now ruling the global economy. If the government decided to hand over these resources to me and to be imparted knowledge, which is another very important facet of economy today, uh, let us understand the type of responsibility or the faith the society, the government has imposed in us. In one mujhe wo resource diya hai, jo most precious hai. And the, not only the resources that have been handed over to me are very precious, but the job profile handed over to me or assigned to me is more precious. So I would stop by saying this, that I will be responsible if the country develops, but then I must not feel bad in accepting the failures if the country fails to develop in the desired direction and at the desired pace. I'm responsible for that, my dear friends. Come on, let us see. Not only resources, the size of the resources. I just Googled, I have more than 16 lakh schools, 250 million plus students only in the schools, maybe more than 350 million students, including university education, secondary education, this is the size of the resources. Can you imagine the size of the resources? The schools, the institutions, how many areas they have. For example, in Navodaya, we had 30 acres of area when I was heading that institution for some five, six years. We just decided that every Navodaya school must have two to three acres of forest area because I have 30 area, 30 acres of uh, area with proper boundary. And believe me, within three years, I'll request each one of you to visit the nearest Navodaya. You will find a, a Rajiv Vatika with no less than four, 5,000 trees. Every school has such lacks. So I have resources in the form of more than lakhs of students, more than, and then what my national education policy says, it says that growth enrollment ratio has to be taken to 100% for school education. These 250 million may multiply to more than 600 million in years to come. So the size of the resource is so important that I'm able to use this resource so that I can do that. And uh, I'll, I'll keep referring. Now, the coupled with this size, coupled with its spread and the potential, which I'll discuss later, you just can't imagine the magnitude, the magnitude of this resource. Now, let me see what is the nature of resource. It is not only the size. What is the nature? They are being handed over to me when their value systems are being framed. Five years, six years, four years, when sanskars are being given to them, it is the age, my dear friends, when I tell a joke, which is not a joke only, but it is being often narrated in Haryana as a joke, a student coming and telling his father, A, A for apple, and apple means gantha, gantha is pyaas. The father says, it is A, A for apple, apple means save. The child keeps repeating, it is A, A for apple, and apple means gantha, pyaas. The father goes to the teacher, complains, and the teacher says, it looks like gantha, I am a teacher of very old days. I, I don't know what is apple. I have never seen, say, 
I'll call it an onion only. I'll call it a piece only. And the father could not dissuade the son to tell to from believing that A for apple and apple means ganta. That is the type of confidence they have in me as a teacher. Having been in school administration, I know students at this age listen more to their teachers than to their parents. I'll quote a very famous judgment of Bill. Avinash Nagra versus Navodaya Vidyalaya Samiti and Central Government can we go through the judgment when the Honorable Supreme Court just defines the role of a teacher. He moves from teacher to acharya to guru and finally says that a teacher is much above being a guru. He is a loco parenti. He acquires the locus of a parenti the moment student is with him and he is with me for eight hours, eight long hours he is with me. I am loco parenti. So I am the one. He listens to me. He believes me. He has the ultimate faith, ultimate faith in me. He is with me when his value system is being groomed. When he is acquiring sanskars at this stage, if I fail to give them the sanskar for environmental conservation, the respect for environment, and despite knowing that I am loco parenti, I'll only be failing to discharge my responsibility. Not only this, it is the age when their minds are trainable, when their minds are most receptive. When we can impregnate their minds for lifelong attitudes towards environmental conservation, see all these things. It is not only the size; it is the reach, the spread. I'll discuss later the quality of mind, the age, the faith they have in me. So, may I? I probably can't have any reason to say that I can't do. I can't deliver through educational system to improve environmental conservation. You see, and how I can forget them, my dear friends? You know, you are not only having students. I am 60 years. I may be having another 10 years of stakes in this environment. Kunal is maybe 45. Another maybe 25 years. But they are at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of age. They are the biggest stakeholders of environmental conservation. How I can ignore them? I am getting the biggest stakeholders at a very young age when they are trainable minds. Then what is the spread and reach? Let me discuss. Uh, okay, I'll come back later. I'll tell you. In Navodaya Vidyalaya, I'll keep quoting from Navodaya Vidyalaya. I can simply say, Abhilash uh, told that I am looking after Dakshina Foundation. I am India advisor to a foundation known as Dakshina Foundation, which was constituted. This foundation took birth when I my flight got delayed at Mangalore Airport, and I met an American couple. Dakshina Foundation was born during a half an hour's discussion of Mangalore Airport. This foundation has already sent more than 1,800 students to IITs. And today we have 300 minimum 300 offices in all India services in Central Services Group A. And I have feedback about each one. Kindly visit me. Kindly come me. I can email you. I have all their mail IDs. They are in. They are at such wonderful positions across the world. But the type of contribution they have made to the society they belong to, because that is what we tell them in Dakshina, that we will give you everything. But what we need from you in Dakshina is. You will contribute to the to the environment to belong to, to the village, to the area you belong to. Please visit. I'll give you the name of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of villages where these young students have delivered. That is the type of power they have to rev revolutionize the community for environmental concerns. Their potential. Have you ever realized their potential at school level? You simply sensitize them. And uh, Abhilash probably or uh, Kunal was telling when the research collaborations were being discussed. At when you do B Tech and M Tech, the, you you are you are contributing. You are studying environment when you are studying alternate sources of energy disposal of e waste. And when you are in PhD, you are researching on developing electrical motors and uh, um, um, the engines which cause lesser pollution and alternate sources of energy. How they can be augmented? I remember one megawatt of power production from solar energy used to cost me 11 crore rupees when I was IIT Delhi and. A couple of days back, someone told me today it is four crores. That is the type of research we have done. So, at what level of education a student or an educational institution cannot con convert, cannot uh, uh, contribute to environmental conservation, just can't tell me. And you are 94, if I know. Let each one of you challenge me, and I accept your challenge. आप अपना subject बताइए. That this is the subject where I can't contribute to environmental conservation. Everywhere, let me tell you. Even if you are a commerce student, you can sensitize him about environmental audits and green audits who are contributing to environmental conservation. As an electrical engineer, developing electrically engineer-operated cars, in electronics and computer, probably e-waste. Anywhere and everywhere, 
in every walk of life in every field through every subject you can groom students the through and through educational institutions for environmental conservation they are the change agents my dear friends if we can use them if we can groom them as change agents probably they can contribute let us see their potential i'm i'm trying to hurry up because abhilash has given me only 20 minutes and i can't overstep because if i do so next time he will not invite me theek hai na abhilash but still kindly excuse uh, sir, me sir aisa nahi hai sir agar main 5 7 minute zyada ho jaun to please excuse me because i have done lot of work and probably time is little less potential their spread every hamlet has a school every hamlet has an education institution the students the teachers the duration they are with me for 20 years i just told you from 9 to 5 uh, daily and then from primary school to uh, doctorate then we i am not only contributing when i am in school i am interacting with alumni i am interacting with community through parent teacher associations i am interacting with panchayat raj institutions when i interact with the village panchayats where is the field when my presence does not innervate a school in a rural setup a college in a um, in, in a city it has innovations in every walk of life that adds to its spread they are the resources who are at this is bubbling with energy and who are capable if guided properly equipped properly empowered properly they can guide the destiny of the nation and the world and these concepts that you see you can't tell me biodiversity conservation and sustainable development at this is i'll never understand but at that is you can give them the concepts so uh, at the most at this is what i know about फॉरेस्ट्रीज के पेड़ में काटना पेड़ लगाना इसके पॉइंट मुझे एनवायरनमेंट का 60 साल की उम्र में नहीं समझा सकते बट द कांसेप्ट्स ऑफ वाइल्ड लाइफ कंजर्वेशन एंड सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट एंड बायोडायवर्सिटी कंजर्वेशन एंड इकोसिस्टम सर्विसेज आर द कांसेप्ट्स व्हिच कैन इंप्रेग्नेट देयर माइंड थ्रू माय एजुकेशनल सिस्टम एट दोस एजेस वी कांट फॉरगेट इट लास्ट थिंग माय डियर फ्रेंड्स ट्राई टू सी दैट आई कैन कीप स्पीकिंग फॉर आवर्स ऑन दिस बट दे आर द वंस हु विल लीड मल्टीनेशनल कंसर्न्स हु विल बी एंटरप्रेन्योर्स who will be senior government officers who will be in the positions of power who will be in the positions where policies are being framed and if you equip them if you sensitize them properly at this age through educational system the ripple effect will be tremendous you are not grooming a student you are grooming a universe you are not grooming a student you are grooming a prospective father and mother who will then pass on these sanskars to their wards you are grooming generations aur agar teachers apne is role ko appreciate nahi kar payenge kyunki main to school teachers ke sath kiya hai aur maine is role ko dekha hai if you are not able to appreciate this role and discharge your responsibilities having appreciated in the right earnest probably you only can be blamed and i told in the beginning that my tone and temper may sometimes offend you but please excuse me what is the nature of your role let us discuss what is the nature of your role they believe most in you as i told you even more than their parents you are their role models you can groom them so that it the environmental related conservations this become a part of their lifestyle it becomes a part of their attitudes and that is where the environmental conservation concerns can survive unless this become a part of my lifestyle unless this become a, unless this these get absorbed assimilated into my psyche things will not improve adsorption adsorption a surface absorption if i i am using the right word where i am studying environment only because i am to pass in environmental sciences course is not going to lead any any lead us to anywhere it is we have to ensure that we are able to integrate sir bolna mat mere sath bolunga sir hamara jo batiya hai any disturbance can i continue abhilash ha yes sir yes sir so we have to ensure that all these concepts these sanskars these get absorbed impregnated and assimilated in their psyche so that it becomes a part of their lifestyle and attitudes and that is i i tell you there is a national resource center for value education in engineering nrc vee at iit delhi i used to discuss with the professor in charge there were three four it is a resource center it is not a department they are supposed to they they, they, are, they are providing it on optional basis this value education to students and they told me ki sahab hamare ko computer padhana aasan lagta hai value education padhana mushkil lagta hai because it is not so easy 
it is not so easy you are not teaching a skill you are not teaching a concept you are changing their attitudes to hame ye teachers hi kar sakte hain hum planners ya jo planners hai wo to baith ke aapko bata sakte hain you are to sensitize them you are to create awareness let them assimilate the concept through your teachings you groom them you groom them into an army of environmental jawans that is how environment can survive because my population increasing it is bound to increase over next 30 40 50 years the forests are depleting already there are many issues there are issues related to carbon credit or pata nahi kya kya bolte hain carbon um, footprint is increasing so but all we need is an army who can combat these challenges in the times to come and you are the subedar majors of that military academy where these armies are to be trained let me expo tell you how what else can government do the government has a constitutional provision which relates to protection and improvement of the natural environment the government through national education policy as probably abhilash also said it ensured and it told you that the students the education has also to have inputs of holistic grooming of yeah. students and environment is one important topic included you can you go through national education policy so government constitutional provision based yeah. national yeah. education policy there are so many awards so many funds are available if you go and write a project to get a fund for your school college university in the concern of environment honorable supreme court has also directed you ki no environmental sciences has to be taught what else a government can do to convey its concern ki bhai logo aap educational institutions ke madhyam se kindly groom my youth kindly guide my youth kindly sensitize them for environmental concerns it could not have probably done much it has already done a lot let me see what is the status today here you will feel little uh concern but i am saying from my experience because i observe it day in and day out supreme court told you that environmental sciences has to be told yeah. mandatory yeah. as a subject mr kunal if you are hearing me let me tell you supreme court somewhere in 2003 directed that environmental sciences has to be taught as a mandatory subject irrespective of technology student ba bcom it is an important subject today no institution when i say no institution i am excluding 10% has a faculty in environmental sciences the way that environmental sciences course is being projected in more than 85% institutions is it does not evoke much confidence yeah, yeah. chemistry wala padha dega ji physics wala padha dega ji ye kar dega i have seen management and faculty discussing in their board of studies ki acha yaar ye environment ye ye topic important hai koi nahi environmental sciences ke do slot isko de do what type of damage i am doing my dear friends bhool jao i was supposed to groom them for environment i rather did exactly opposite of what i was supposed to do three is environmental conservation having told them ki chodo yaar ebs ki faculty ki bhi zarurat nahi hai ebs ke slot bhi apne aap kar lena i rather gave them a message that it is not important at all it is so counterproductive and i really feel very bad about it when i see environmental sciences being taught by students from chemistry ek hai hamare general sahab hai soni sahab hai he can teach environment chalo general sahab padha de uske baad main bhi ja ke padha dun aur koi nahi hai to aur chodo koi bhi nahi hai to let the slot be diverted by more important topic and the more important topic is computer algorithm database management system artificial intelligence internet of things i am telling my students through environmental sciences supreme court intended to sensitize students about maine balki usko counter productive kar diya wo boomerang kar gaya bachcho ko bola chhado yaar environment is not so important that is not acceptable very casual and unconcerned stance the faculty and the management and the educational institutions have towards this subject it it is not it is not good let me tell you mr kunal if you know you should know because you will be conducting many other programs for schools and abilash you also besides all the participants UGC and All India Council for Technical Education has made it mandatory that there has to be a three week orientation program yeah. if i join ba i will start my classes only after 21 days orientation program there are 94 teachers standing here let them post in their chat box or this box ko aap kya kehte ho i am not a computer savvy person how many of them are actually conducting this 21 days orientation program and if you see the structure of this orientation program it emphasizes only on yoga environment trees conservation i am not even conducting 
this properly. Couple of them, they will simply not do. Others, they will reduce its uh, duration to seven days. And others, they will go, they don't even see the structure the, and the intentions behind yeah. making this online orientation a compulsory program. My voice is breaking. Someone told me, I don't know. Abilas, is my voice breaking? Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, for us, it is clear. Maybe internet problem on their side, sir. Okay. So this mandatory EVS course, this mandatory online orientation before I join higher education, it has not been conducted with the sincerity, with the commitment, with the dedication, and fulfilling the intentions, uh, understanding the objective behind introducing these programs. That is not good, sir. How many students have, Kunal, let me ask you, how many students have registered for this program, my dear friend? Where are the students? I don't see many. So that is a concern. I have this concern. There are no students registered. You can always say, and that may be right also, but I would love if there are many, many, many such programs organized by students. How many webinars? Corona period was a phase of webinars. I remember having posted in one of my Facebook posts that the number of webinars have held during Corona on daily basis probably can make a Guinness book, Guinness world record. Millions of webinars have been held in this country. How many of webinars have been held addressing students on environmental concerns? I would like to know. And how many webinars are otherwise held on regular basis in our institutions? Casual orientation in these programs, how many of them? Dear, now it is important. How many of us? I was a divisional forest officer at a place known as Gohar, which probably your director, Mr. Kunal, also knows. It, it, there cannot be a wonderful example of explaining the zonation and vegetation in different zonations in, um, to, to the students. If you can simply make them drive from Sundarnagar to Janjali, you can understand from broad leaves to Chin, you can go up to Pine First Spruce. So this learning through nature experience is very important. There is no learning through nature experience and you want to learn nature. You want to fall in love with nature without seeing nature. Let me tell a, let me tell a person, I'll give her address also. She's a young girl staying in FRI. Her name is Sharisha. Let nobody react because I love that girl. She will go and visit her. She'll tell you what is the love for nature. And unless we are able to groom such youth, that girl probably knows a lot about environmental conservation than many forest officers. I have no hesitation. At least she knows 10 times more than me about forestry, environment, and birds, and wildlife, and biodiversity. She will go to um, um, tracks, and she will track through forest miles probably every week and every day whenever she gets an opportunity. And I'm confident that they are the girls, they are the people, and she is the type of the girl I'm targeting that we should have many such warriors, many such army personnel and you go and meet her and I will request Kunal don't without taking note of what who she is kindly arrange an interaction of people like her there will be many more it is very important then so these are the what is the challenge today I told you sir the challenge is that our concern is not as as, as focused as it should be for example then let me uh, we don't even take them once outside the classroom in environmental sciences course. We are merely going through the rituals. When I'm saying it, please, 15% who are doing it, they should not take an offense. I'm talking about those 85% where it is not being taught, 85% degree colleges, 85% institutions across rural areas and small towns. I'm doing it. But, but it is not being done in 85% colleges. We rather convey that the concern is ill-placed, damaging thereby the cause, as I told you earlier. Yeah. I have seen periods being deviated for more important subjects. Ye jada important hai. That is very detrimental. Uh, now, let me see. Now, last thing, what can be done? I cannot and should not teach you know much more than me. And in fact, many things, especially one Dr. Gita from Delhi University, she told many things, Kunal, while summarizing, added to that list. And there was one person from Kumara Guru. He also added a couple of things. But let me summarize. And I was sharing with General Sony sitting by my side. He said, kuch to bata diya. But let me tell you, pedagogic innovations have to be there. You have to adopt innovative pedagogies, learning through natural experience. Are sir, aap unse projects karauna environmental ke. Why don't you give them assignments based on environment? Why don't you give students project based on environmental concerns? We, we must do. And not only this, 
we are valuing every contribution of student. We are awarding some credits or marks. Let us make it a habit. Let us have a structured system through which I am saying that every contribution to the environment which will be awarded, which will be will be awarded, rewarded, and acknowledged in the mark sheet. Internal marks is something very important in higher education. Twenty five percent marks teachers they they are, they are awarded. इंटरनल विच नॉर्मली वी विल डू कि अच्छा दो इंटरनल एग्जाम्स कर लिए दस दस नंबर के क्विज कर लिया चलो पांच नंबर अटेंडेंस पे दे दिए दिस इंटरनल मार्क्स आर नॉट ओनली फॉर क्विजेस उसको तो हम नॉलेज को तो टेस्ट कर रहे हैं ना सेवेंटी फाइव मार्क्स में दिस ट्वेंटी फाइव मार्क्स इंटरनल मार्क्स कैन बी दे पार्ट ऑफ इट कैन बी इट फॉर एक्टिविटीज वट इज माई कंट्रीब्यूशन टू एनवायरमेंट एंड वट आई एम डूइंग इन माई कम्युनिटी इन माई स्कूल वी हैव टू वैल्यू देयर कंट्रीब्यूशन एंड एंड वी कैन एक्चुअली मेक दम डू सो मैं आप कैसे आपको एग्जाम्पल दू कुल प्लीज विजिट जे एन वी कन्नूर प्लीज विजिट जे जे एन वी मुजफ्फरपुर लेट मी स्टेट कोर्ट वन स्टेटमेंट ऑफ जे एन वी मुजफ्फरपुर इन बिहार द स्टेट यू बिलोंग टू आई स्टेट देर फॉर थ्री डेज आई वेंट फॉर सम अदर प्रॉब्लम बट देन सम एल्डरली पर्सन इट टोल्ड मी उसके बाद मेरी छाती चोड़ी होगी कि मैंने जे एन वी में काम किया नवोदय विद्यालय समिति में ही टोल्ड मी His statement, I'll try to repeat in the dialect, Bihari dialect. He told me, "Arey sahay, me jo bacha apne diya hai na, isne hamare gaon ka sabru bhi badal diya hai." The child you once, all these Navodian students, they have changed the institution. Maine kaha sab gaon kaise badal diya? He says that they go, they when they work, they wash their clothes, they take bath, they take care of trees, they take a tree from where they go and plant. It has changed my. rural psych it has changed my village that is the type of power this youth has jnv kanur there was a lady mrs yeah. nair i still remember the entire two villages which were barren in four years time she was there i will visit please go to kanur whenever you go to kanur it is on pondicherry boundary mahe mahe is a part of pondicherry on that boundary i'll give the name of four villages my people will take you see those four villages maybe more than 200 hectares or 200 acres of land has been planted by navodaya students so these are actual activities please motivate them to do it social media it has become so powerful a tool create a page on your facebook of your school or institution and post all these achievements of the students we post placements itne rupaye ki placement hogi we post this let us post these achievements also we post their contribution to blood donation he donated for 35 times it is his 36 time let us start posting their achievements related to the field of environment and environmental conservation let us institute awards let us don't stay let us not stay ornamental we are not duty bound sensitizing them for about environment is not a part of your duty only it is a part of your moral duty to the society and unless you escalate it this responsibility of your uh, job profile to the level of a moral duty probably you will not be doing justice and will not be able to achieve the desired results the webinars i say discussions may reh jayengi main aapse kewal ek nature experience ka batata hu if i take my students kunal we 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 we, we served Uh, himachal together and during that time you might also have traveled from chandigarh to shimla 10 times and i might have traveled 100 times because i was more frequent a traveler on shimla chandigarh road the road was being widened and there were so many slips everywhere slip 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 slips from especially from parwanu to shimla now can there be a better example of explaining the concept of development versus conservation and let me tell you kunal at least 200 colleges and schools might have been to picnic from chandigarh to shimla they started from chandigarh in the buses they closed their air condition buses they were singing they were chanting they were enjoying aur uske bus ke darwaze ja ke unhone shimla mein khole jab snow fall mil gaya did the teacher take care of acha okay let us stop the bus and i'll tell you we need this road because development is there but you see how yeah. it is affecting environment you tell them and then you tell them okay now you express your views in 500 words that is your assignment that is how you can make them learn through nature experience clubs ncc nss there can be so many eco club related activities all we discussed we are delivering wonders and students have really done good thing kindly send your probationers next time when they come to your physically i'll show you hamare bachcho ne or oh, there are only 10 of them maybe only 1% of my students they are sensitized to environment but they have changed the whole face of clement town jitne gandagi ke dher the haath se utha utha ke paint kar kar ke they have changed unka jise bolte hain swarup badal diya so kindly 
um, sensitize them kindly make them do something most important my dear friends 94 of you i am addressing to you specially structured curriculum unless you make the environmental studies as a part of your structured curriculum things will not improve environmental sciences has been imposed by supreme court which we are not implementing properly i am expecting you to do little more government has done kunal one thing avilash please understand government has now put in place a very strong accreditation and ranking system nac nba national institution yeah. ranking framework qs etc etc and all these rankings accreditation systems national or international they value the contribution of the institution towards environmental conservation i have i am i am i am given 40 marks out of 1000 as to what my students have done to improve environment or when my what what environmental improvement has been done by my students i may be little this side or that side but it is this these are some 10 marks 10 into 4 40 marks nac nba also does it nirf also does it nirf does it through how my students outreach and there are different ways qs also does it so accreditation ranking systems are also valuing the contribution of our students for the improvement of environment please establish clubs and do it part of structured curriculum tap funds there is huge availability of funds with government of india please tap those funds make these available to uh, your students through clubs and let them do something evs can innovate and i told you already that environment is an issue which can innovate any curriculum any curriculum any subject sir i told me parent teacher associations activate them use them to promote the cause of this you form committees school developmental committees are nowadays very important where a village pradhan is acting every school has a school development committee even kendriya vidyalayas they have a school development committee where there are people from community sensitize the community through your school development committees pri is also very active nowadays in managing schools they participate in schools they are also having some administrative control over school uh, improve the interface with the departments for example forest department rural development which handle environment related issues then there at least i am constructing a sewage treatment plant i can see it across the um, window on the other side of it sewage treatment plant let me my students should know what is the job of sewage treatment plant how it helps in recycling water what is water conservation how you know 2023 someone told me that delhi will not have even any water even a drop of water of its own it will become a zero year something like that so if those are the concerns i can sensitize them for water conservation ncc nss eco clubs i told you Uh, uh, school projects. Then someone told some someone made an interesting observation. Cash for Kunal Direct. Why you can't offer internships to the students? They come, they stay with you only for three hours, half a day. You offer them good lecture. You take them on a walk. You offer them food. Budget, you have to get as much as you can. You know, and you make it a target that at least five thousand students will intern with you. internship programs why only interns i'll send my students i have 20000 of them at least 4000 will be interested in having these internships so dear iske baad main summarize karte hue keh raha hu my dear friends you are blessed one you got an opportunity to groom and not an individual but generation you have been given a responsibility or your job profile involves healing of mother earth protecting mother earth you have got an opportunity to make substantial contribution let me read because i wrote it having um, you got an opportunity to make substantial contribution to the mother earth a contribution you will cherish all through your life it is a part of and you got it as a part of your duty for which you are being paid not for charity you are getting it as a part of your duty ye to hoga ki meri je paise bhi milenge aur philanthropy karne ka mauka bhi mil raha hai batao isse badhiya kya hoga please implant these concerns about environment among students as sanskars so that they can percolate down this can inherit from generation to generations please understand your role as subedar majors and majors of the 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 the, the um, probably subedars are very important in imparting training to ones you you, you 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 acquire the role of that type of subedars who are grooming training the young minds to be environmental army and please accept this challenge otherwise the future is very bleak and last thing you don't have any other option also if you feel that you have an option 
yes you have an option for another 20 years and that is your stay that is i was saying maine kya lena punjabi mein bolte mainu ki sanu ki how why should i bother because till the time i live environment is not going to be such a serious concern till the time so sanu ki attitude will not work you have no option you have to accept this challenge head on and deliver thank you very much abhilash i, I have overstepped by 10 15 minutes lekin kya karein ye issue hi aisa hai thank you very much kunal and i i i, I wish uh, i have been able to do justice please thank you very much uh, thank you thank you very much sir uh, the 10 15 minutes time we never came to know that you have exceeded the time sir uh, uh, because the content of your uh, talk was uh, uh it was uh, enlightening and at the same time lightning also sir uh, <laughs> uh, you you have hit the bulls eye in several statements and where we need to work upon and where we need to improve ourselves if we have to have a uh, effective and efficient environmental education in our education yeah. system sir uh, yeah. th- thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, uh, session sir Thank you. Thank you. And share and share the feedback with me only if it is more than Kunal's. It may be less than yours. <laughs> sure, sir. I had my own tea. Normally, when you dictate address, the chief guest is supposed to be over tea. I had my own tea. Kindly credit a tea of mine in your account. Done, sir. <laughs> sir, there is a there is one. Uh, I was seeing the chat box while you were ending your uh, talk, sir, and uh, there is only. lot of them came uh, very positive one of them is very nice it says hats off to you sir so i just endorse that uh, we will not render a formal word of thanks we can only say hats off to you sir thank you kunal uh, about the other stuff sir uh, since there is a limitation of <laughs> so the, if, uh, since there is a limitation of what uh, spread we can take sir this training program was only for college teachers and lecturers we have done uh, for eco club in charges of schools also sir and we will soon now reaching to the Uh, students also sir but uh, that is a commitment from our side and uh, all your words i think this sounded more like a inaugural address sir, uh, rather than a validity address it has actually made lot of points come out uh, had you given an inaugural address we could have rectified it in the session that we held so uh, i am happy i am happy that i have probably acquired a right of getting invite as a, uh, a <laughs> inaugural address always welcome sir and uh, i think uh, yeah. as ablash told i think there are only two words uh, bullseye has been hit and hats off to your uh, words of wisdom and we'll try to incorporate all the great ideas and thoughts that you shared sir in the next courses we run there's a commitment from our side and yeah. i think I, i'll be transgressing into uh, the course director's job but uh, uh, to all the participants uh, i can only say two things one that uh, please stay connected and ma- make this uh, um, large whatsapp group we have created grow larger so that we are able to outreach and we are uh, we are striving to we are I'm striving to intersecting but i can i place a request yes sir yes sir please my petra has joined if you can repeat those good words you said about me because abhi aa gayi hai well uh, they are on record in the chat box so chat box records are publishable records they are published documents in the scientific domain so i'll just reiterate that uh, all the points uh, i know Uh, i keep uh, telling abhilash also and uh, that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to learn from you uh, i have been learning that and uh, uh, the only word i could uh, i wanted to be crisp so i told hats off to you and uh, you actually know this sector very well and you have uh, and the kind of uh, uh, remarks that we are getting in the chat box it actually clearly shows that you does the right chord only thing as um, uh, it's a lot lot of journey to do a lot of uh, things to do sir and uh, a uh, lot of important things are required i know about the mc mehta case sir uh, this may environment education was made compulsory and your examples of navodaya vidyalaya and the parvanu um, road and how we are missing the uh, we are we someone making the education system more theoretical and not pragmatic yeah. and the feel reality and that is the core of the conservation issues sir uh, and i highlighted that the disconnect between the academic world and the scientific world and the practitioners is so huge in this country and that is what uh, we are making a small effort in the in a small team we have in the academy to bridge that gap sir and we'll keep on doing that we'll uh, keep on seeking your blessings as we go ahead and uh, thanks thanks sir from my side uh, over to vilash i'll not, not like to transgress any more and uh, about the feedback sir we have this positive competition we try to beat each uh, beat each other down and this is the only guy who's capable of beating me normally and i love to do get uh, beaten by vilash 
ಅಪ್ರಿಶಿಯೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಯೋರ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ your speech sir uh, dr v sai saraswati is there dr uh, monika ram is there uh, do, uh, dr saloni bari is there uh, priya joson is there anu pansare is there sir many many i, I just I just it's just keeping on increasing uh, lots of uh, comments appreciating uh, your words sir so uh, so uh, before i uh, enter into the formality of uh, delivering the vote of thanks uh, i would uh, request all the participants uh, to kindly add uh, more uh, uh, of your colleagues into the whatsapp group uh, so that we can have more like minded people uh, when you add more people just uh, take care that they are also like minded and they also are bothered about the common topic that we are discussing so uh, kindly add more uh, like minded people to the group uh, we will make everybody the uh, uh, group admin or even if you can just send me the mobile number on my whatsapp i will add them Uh, so let us uh, make it a good networking platform uh, yeah. and uh, we at casfos dehradun are uh, always open to uh, tie ups and collaborations and associations with the other organizations including uh, the universities and colleges yeah. Uh, yeah. we can enter into both formal yeah. as well as informal uh, uh, mous and agreements for exchanging faculty as well as uh, yeah. facilitating the students and officer yeah. trainees from our academy vice versa Uh, for field studies yeah. and other uh, specialized uh, studies that can be done so uh, please let us know my mail id is there our uh, official email id is also there our official phone number is also there we are there on uh, uh, website our website is very active and uh, whatever we uh, organize or plan is there on the website casfosddn.nic.in it's there in the brochure that has been given to you we are also very active on twitter we are active on uh, youtube in fact the present uh, uh, session is also being streamed live on youtube uh, we are also active on uh, facebook so please get in touch with uh, touch through any of these mediums uh, or even directly and we do look forward to have you in the academy uh, either in an official capacity or even you are welcome uh personally with your family if you want to tour around dehradun it's a beautiful place uh, so you are always uh, welcome and please let us know if we can facilitate some field visits or some other specialized modules for you in your uh, organization so we will be very much glad to do that uh, at any time please feel free to get in touch with us and uh, do stay connected now yeah. i would uh, enter into the formality of uh, Uh, express extending my vote of thanks um, i would uh, to begin with i would like to place on records my gratitude to uh, uh, pro- dr uh, rakesh kumar sir uh, the vice chancellor of uh, graphicera university um, sir has always been uh, a guide i would yeah. rather call a very friendly guide in uh, you know advising us and uh, advising us and uh, guiding us through Uh, various uh, organizational matters and in sir has always been a good support for the training activities in our academy so sir thank you very much sir for uh, having accepted our invitation sir uh, and uh, we contacted you a uh, f- uh, few weeks back sir but you kept on reminding me that uh, uh, there is a validatory session and uh, what you have to prepare and what you have to speak sir so that shows your commitment towards the assignment that you have you accept sir so thank you very much sir for uh, simply being what you are sir thank you very much sir uh, i would like to uh, place on record the uh, all the other resource persons who made this program a highly successful one right from the uh, chief guest of the inaugural session uh, dr padam prakash bhojwe uh, who set the tone for this uh, training i would like to thank uh, the first uh, technical session uh, uh being taken by uh, our principal sir kunal satyarthi sir uh, i would uh, also thank uh, hemant kamdi i would uh, ritesh kumar uh, dr abhijit das and uh, dr uh, ruchi badola i would like to thank all the participants who have made this program a very successful one because uh, even if the speakers are excellent the attention of participant is what is required the most and i am very happy that uh, 
uh, all of you were hooked on to your uh, screens i could see uh, the uh, or the system generated uh, attendance i could see and i i, I was very happy to note that uh, uh, at a given point of time we had you know 90 to 118 participants uh, constant so that's a very good uh, response from the participants thank you for making it a wonderful uh, experience for us and also you people shared a lot of experience and interacted with the resource persons like never before i have seen this so thank you very much to all the participants uh, i would like to express my gratitude to uh, my uh, fellow colleagues uh, uh, dr c ramesh he is not here he is on uh, tour uh, uh, miss sarita kumari uh, mr pradeep wahule and uh, dr bula uh, we all work in synchrony to plan and organize trainings in our academy and it is never a one man show we yeah. are always uh, working in a team and we are led by our principal shri kunal satyarthi sir so so thank you very much sir to you also for leading us through in conducting such kind of trainings and this year has been uh, quite busy for us even through the lockdown yeah. period we were quite busy conducting these kind of modules for the first time reaching out to the unusual uh, audience uh, during the lockdown so thank you very much sir for uh, guiding us through i would fail in my duty if i don't recognize the contribution and the hard work yeah. that my support team has uh, put in for this training i would fail to uh, I, i would fail in my duty if i don't mention the if i don't commend the works put by uh, mr uh, samir and uh, saurabh of our it support team uh, they have been in touch with you and they have been managing the it yeah. and uh, seamless uh, conduct of this online training uh neetu is my course assistant so neetu has also been very active and uh, we just completed one module last week and even before she could complete the paperwork and planning of the previous course uh, the next course came so she was uh, into multitasking and uh, i would also uh, like to express my gratitude to sri sundarlal who is the course clerk um, who has been dealing with the administrative part of this uh, training so uh, thank you uh, one and all before i wind up this session again i request all of you to stay connected and i uh, thank all of you right from the bottom of my heart uh, for making this uh, training program a success we will be posting the course report of this uh, training module on our website uh, in a few in a few days 3 4 days time so you may just access that course report you will get the contact details of all the resource persons the feedback and everything that you need to know about this course so thank you very much today's uh, um, presentations and reference materials i will be sharing it in whatsapp uh, uh, very soon uh, the moment i receive it from the concerned resource persons so thank you thank you very much thank you once again and all and uh, stay connected thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you Programs and we have learned so much. Thank you, Kunal sir. Thank you, Abhilash sir. Try to think over it now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. अभिलाष सर पहली बार मैंने इतना बढ़िया कोर्स है ज्वाइन किया है आपके इंस्टीट्यूट का आज तक इतने एक्सेलेंट लेक्चर्स एक से बढ़कर एक मतलब किसको कहें कि कौन अच्छा नहीं है बहुत ही बढ़िया हमारी अपनी आंखें खोल दी आपने बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मैम आपको पसंद आया हमें अच्छा लगा हम यही मेहनत करते हैं यही कोशिश करते हैं कि जितना लोगों तक तो पहुंच सके उतना पहुंचे और जितना टेक्निकली जितना प्रोफेशनली कर सके उतना करें और फिर भी कोई कमियां रह गई है तो आप लोगों के सजेशंस है वी विल ट्राई टू इंप्रूव अपॉन इट मैम यार इट वाज वंडरफुल थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू नमस्कार नमस्कार आपकी सारी टीम को और बहुत-बहुत धन्यवाद हमारा नमस्कार मैम Thank you sir thank you everyone
Thank you. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Uh, hope to see you when we visit Uti. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. sir. Welcome. Always welcome to Uti, yeah. sir. Thank you, Akilesh, sir. It was and wonderful. And I extend an invitation to all the participants also. Welcome yeah, to Uti. Yeah, welcome to nice. Uti. Greece. You can contact me anytime you are here at Uti and Tamil Nadu. Yes, ma'am. Best, ma'am. By the way, ma'am, I did yes, my sir. post graduation from Metupalem. Okay, sir. Forest is... College Metupalem. Okay, sir. Yeah, five, yes. five. So okay. this is P. Vijay, Assistant Professor of Zoology. All the presentations yes, were really good, really good and informative and interesting, sir. Even though as teachers, we give lectures and the students yeah. listen to this. For these two days, we are sitting for hours, but no one, no presentation is boring. Mm. Everything is good. Everything is good. Real Thank appreciation you, for all of you. I'm from where you are, ma'am? Uh, I'm from VHNSN College, Virudhanagar, Tamil Nadu, sir. Virudhanagar. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, sir. It's Great, two ma good, sir. Two good. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your appreciation. And uh, also do give us some critical uh, uh, feedbacks also so that we can improve further. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank the you feedback so much. forms have been circulated. Hmm. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Hope this class continues for another day also. We'll be happy, sir. <laughs> but anyway, thank you and bye to all. <laughs> Very well said. Very well said, ma'am. Very well said. Because <laughs> by yesterday we were okay, but today we were more interested in uh, all the things involved. So we yes. expect another day or two more days to go. We'll be happy for that. Okay, so anyway, design, next time design, we have a chance to. course for us, ma'am. We will attend that. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hi. May, may okay, I say something, sir? sir? Thank you and uh, thank you to everyone. Bye, sir. Bye, everybody. Bye, ma'am. All the Bye, best. Stay safe. Bye. Hello, Habila, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Yes, please. Sir. sir, myself, Subita Chaudhary from uh, Government College called Putli, sir, Rajasthan. Yeah. Right, right, ma'am. First of all, sir, uh, thank you so much for uh, organizing such an excellent training program. Uh, mm -hmm. I request you to request this program sir, of offline when mm -hmm. COVID-19 pass out. Ho jai, sir. Please uh, organize an offline training also. So, we can feel the environment ko, matlab, feel kar sake, aur, sir, bahut sara sake, so that we can learn from our children. Absolutely, ma'am. We will do it. When the situation is fine, we will do it. Offline on the campus training karenge and you are always welcome. Uh, please keep a watch on our website for the trainings. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, namaskar, Abla, sir. Uh, they said uh, Newton Mishra. Yes, Namaskar, um, Mishra ji. Uh, News 24. I have a lot of मैं जूलोजी बोटनी या फॉरेस्ट से नहीं हूं बट uh, मेरा एक इंटरेस्ट है पैशन है ट्रैवलिंग का फॉरेस्ट का वाइल्ड लाइफ का तो मैंने कुछ एक मेरे रेंजर्स एंड फॉरेस्ट आईएफएस हैं फ्रेंड्स तो उनके थ्रू ये कोर्स मुझे मालूम चला अच्छा अच्छा देन आफ्टर देन आफ्टर मैं ज्वाइन किया और ज्वाइन करने के बाद से लास्ट 2 डेज में जो नॉलेज या जो इंफॉर्मेशंस और वो भी एक छोटे-छोटे टेक्निकल टर्म्स में जो गेन किया और सच अ वंडरफुल मैं उस कह नहीं सकता लेकिन मुझे बहुत जाते हैं और मुझे लगता है कि मैं इस पे कुछ एक प्रोग्राम जो है प्रोड्यूस कर सकता हूं अपने यहां और मैं अपने टीम को भी कल ही बोला कि इस चीज पे आप लोग कुछ एक प्रोग्राम जो है प्रोड्यूस कीजिए और मैं डेफिनेटली जब इस प्रोग्राम को प्रोड्यूस करूंगा तो आप लोगों के साथ शेयर करूंगा व्हाट्सएप में भी और आपको भी और जैसा सभी का एक था सुविता जी ने भी कहा या बहुत सारे लोग चैट बॉक्स में भी कि ऑफलाइन कोर्सेज पे एक ऑफलाइन वर्कशॉप ऑर्गेनाइज होना चाहिए तो ये मेरा भी एक रिक्वेस्ट है बिल्कुल 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 मिश्रा जी हम जरूर करेंगे इसको और आप वही है जिसको मैं अदर्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स बोल रहा था <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, 
यू नो यू हैव वॉच थ्री इडियट्स तो देखा ही होगा आपने उसमें ये बोला जाता है कि ज्ञान जहां बटराओ वहां जाके बैठ जाओ सर यू हैव अ रियल गुड सेंस ऑफ ह्यूमर आई लाइक सर रियली गुड थैंक थैंक यू थैंक यू आप लोगों ने मुझे अटेंड अटेंड कर दिया आपके फील्ड से ना होते हुए मुझे अटेंड करने दिया नहीं नहीं यू आर ऑलवेज <laughs> we just got into it and we nobody is even clicking on the red button so we said okay you have got hooked hook to it hook. you are and very right <laughs> how well this program has been taken by your participants and really not just hats off to that sir i think a bigger hat needs to be put up for you because you have conducted the whole thing so well and we are all very very happy with what we have received from this program thank you thank you very much ma'am your words uh, are very i second what ma'am said i just second what geeta ma'am has just said <laughs> your words are very much encouraging ma'am uh, we will definitely try to keep up the standards and even improve uh, further and we will uh, definitely meet ma'am we will have a tie up yes, uh, you can bring your students here and uh, we can coordinate their field visits and we can have a a uh, focused module for them ma'am that will be wonderful thank you thank you ma'am thank you very much ma'am so are we supposed to leave <laughs> we don't know what to do <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> <laughs> what next <I'm> sir <laughs> it might be consuming uh, your data <laughs> no no that's fine uh, i think Okay, I'm last tea. Let's leave. Tea break and the tea. Okay, sir. Oh, so we are still waiting for some some direction yeah, from yeah. you. I think we have got used to this. So, uh, so, so <laughs> I, I, I think, sir, rather than consuming your getting your data consumed, I must just yeah. announce the training is over. And now yeah. we meet uh, each other on the campus, either in your place or in our place, and okay. uh, in uh, future uh, courses and future interactive sessions. So, thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. thank you thank see you, as sir. teachers you, as teachers we are so obedient zamana badal gaya zamana badal gaya uta ho gaya thank you so much thank namaste you. thank you so much all of you namaste all of you so so the guy